This single virgin loser is Ryu, our protagonist. His life is a total disaster. First, he gets bullied and beaten up daily. And if that's not enough, his little brother one day got bullied so badly that they made his little brother blind with multiple fractures. And if this was not enough, their parents also died in a car accident. But wait, there is more. One day on Christmas Eve, a hot damn angel kidnapped 9 billion people from Earth and teleported them into a dungeon, giving them unique abilities. While others get abilities like super strength or mind control, Ryu ends up with a skill so trashy, it's almost laughable. Well, all his stats are below average, every single one of them. And his unique gift, when he dies, he goes back to the day of New Year's Eve to start all over again. Then, without any unique abilities and with trashy stats, he died countless times, got tortured, betrayed, you name it. Yet, Ryu grits his teeth and drags himself through the hellish floors, one after another, for years, alone, and finally, after what feels like a lifetime of suffering, he reaches the top floor. However, the journey takes a cruel turn. To proceed to the final level, one must be part of a team of five. Ryu, ever the loner and still a virgin, doesn't meet the criteria. So once more he dies, this time on his 99th attempt. Yet as fate would have it, the clock resets. It's New Year's Eve and Ryu finds himself back at the starting point with one last chance to change his destiny. Seeing his hand still trembling, Ryu can't shake off the memory of the unimaginable pain he just went through. He can't believe that he died because he was alone on the last floor. It was almost too much to bear. Frustration kicks in, clenching his fist and stealing his eyes. He gets ready to give it one more go, one final try. Ryu then yanks off his hoodie, throws it aside, and looks down at the ground. He's deep in thought, thinking about who he could possibly team up with this time around. So guys, today's like goal is 2,000 likes. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. Now let's continue. The scene suddenly shifts. Now the spotlight is on this piece of shit. Youngman, the guy responsible for turning Ryu's life into a complete, living hell. Youngman and his underlings are all smiles, giddy about the fact that they're about to turn into adults. No more sneaking around with fake IDs to buy alcohol. They're in a chatty mood, talking about the jobs they want in the future. When it's Youngman's turn, his smile turns darker, more dominating. His buddies ask him what's on his mind for the future. Without missing a beat, Youngman says he's going to be a gangster. Hearing this, his friends pause. They look concerned, almost freaked out. They tell Youngman he must be nuts. One bad move in that world, and it's curtains for him. But Youngman, always the unapologetic jerk, brushes it off. In his view, he's got just this one life to live. So why not live it doing what he enjoys, beating people up? His friends manage a weak laugh, but on the inside, they're pissed off. They're silently labeling him a full-blown psycho. They're also thinking about ditching him for good once they're out of school. Then, to divert the conversation, one of Youngman's friends asked about what he plans to do with Ryu referring to him as his errand boy. Youngman remembered Ryu as a gloomy loser and with a sinister grin, said he obviously wouldn't let Ryu go. Even after graduating, he would continue to mess with Ryu until he got his fill of enjoyment. Then, one of his friends noticed someone and turned to call Youngman's attention. He pointed out that he had found Ryu, Youngman's errand boy. Seeing Ryu, Youngman became excited, and the countdown for the New Year's Eve began with only five seconds remaining. But something unusual happened. A dark aura surrounded Ryu as he removed his hoodie and turned towards Youngman with a cold, determined look, leaving Youngman perplexed as he sensed that something was different about Ryu. Youngman's confusion turned into seething anger as Ryu glared at him. He clenched his fists, ready to beat the crap out of Ryu. However, his friend intervened, suggesting that they let it slide since it was the new year. Just as the bell rang to signal the arrival of the new year, a chilling voice echoed through the area, addressing all the humans as if they were insignificant creatures. This unexpected voice left Youngman and his friends stunned, wondering where it had come from. From above the sky, the angel descended ever so slowly, dressed in a pristine white gown with enormous wings to match, one eye obscured by a piece of cloth, the angel looked down at the crowd with an amused smile. She commented that watching humans always felt like observing monkeys in a cage. Meanwhile, the crowd below was losing control, some thinking it was an event organized for the new year, while others were taken aback, finding it all too real, and some were already enamored by the angel's beauty, calling her hot and pretty. Ryu, on the other hand, glared up at her, even though she looked hot, after seeing her for the 99th time, his anger still boiled within him. 
The angel let out a slight laugh, calling all the humans trash for falling for her beauty. She warned them not to have any naughty thoughts as she had no intention of mingling with trash like them, and the people just listened to her in utter silence. Shock, with her hand resting on her chin and a look that seemed like she was contemplating something delicious, the angel said that since they all appeared stunned, it must mean they can see and hear her, and so her game should begin. At that moment, a drunken man yelled at the angel, cursing her, questioning her cosplay, and even calling her a bitch. Ryu, upon hearing, felt a sense of pity for the man. In the next instant, the angel's warm, inviting smile twisted into a horrifying, deathly glare. Her eyes glowed a menacing red, her expression became scary, and with just a simple flick of her finger, the man's head popped like a bubble, splattering blood all around. The crowd, now truly horrified, erupted into chaos, scattering in every direction. Continuing with her terrifying aura, the angel pointed her finger at the crowd. She spoke in a chilling tone. How dare a lowly human speak informally with my mighty self? Then, as if switching a button, her aura returned to its previous kind state. She spoke politely but firmly, warning the crowd that they had no right to question her if they didn't want their heads to explode like that unfortunate man. Panic began to wash over the crowd like a tidal wave. She began to explain what they had to do and what this game was all about. Ryu, on the other hand, remained frustrated as he had to listen to her once again. With a warm smile and a kind aura, she extended her hand forward and stated that they would have to play a simple game. This game would consist of 20 rounds and would start on the first of every month. Their souls would be transported to another world, and after clearing each round, they could return to Earth. It sounded simple enough. Hearing this, the crowd was confused, thinking they could live just by playing a simple game. Even Youngman was a bit panicked. Then, the angel dropped another bombshell, saying, Who said all humans will live? Even if they complete the quests, only half of the participants will survive. She then proudly declared how kind she was for sparing half of them, and Ryu just stared at her, not uttering a single word. Then, the angel let slip another piece of shocking information, that she wouldn't be taking all the humans. With a naughty smile, she explained that she would only take humans between the ages of 15 to 29. Upon hearing this, one man got incredibly happy, making strange faces and shouting that he was saved and wouldn't have to die. Another young man grabbed the old man's collar in frustration, and they began to fight. Panicked, young men stepped in to stop them, warning them to remember what happened to the guy who had shouted, his head popping like a bubble. The angel turned around and began counting. After some time, she declared that a total of 1.8 billion humans were present. With a warm smile, she flicked her fingers, and in the next moment, Ryu found himself in a room surrounded by nothing but whiteness. The angel started to explain that in this place, the participants could create a physical body exactly as they wanted, and their souls would be transferred into that body. Standing in front of a mirror, Ryu instantly created a character without much thought, using the body from his previous regression. He chose the nickname Black Scythe. A bright light covered his eyes, and in the next moment a beautiful field appeared, filled with lush greenery, forests, and mountains. Ryu, with his badass character, magically appeared here with jet black hair and piercing red eyes. Clenching his fist, he mused how using this body so many times had made it feel almost like his real one. Slowly, other participants began to appear in the landscape. Their faces showed fear, panic, and in some cases, awe at their own transformation. Some had chosen appearances resembling famous movie stars or strikingly good-looking personas. Ryu looked at them and thought back to his own initial choices. He remembered that he too had first opted for a flashy, handsome appearance, but that had drawn too much attention, and because of that, he died pathetically. So now, he chose to keep it as simple as possible, avoiding unnecessary attention. Then Ryu's eyes shifted toward Youngman, that piece of work who always made life miserable for him. In this new world, Youngman looked pretty much like his real-world self, just taller and more muscular. He walked with a proud smile and eyes that sparkled. Ryu couldn't help but flash a grin mixed with sweat, noting that Youngman, true to form, had buffed up his character again. Then, the angel congratulated everyone on crafting their desired bodies, mentioning how their fearful expressions delighted her. One man dared to ask, saying, it doesn't seem like 1.8 billion people are here. Is there an error? Hearing this laughingly, the angel replied, addressing humans as inferior, and she shouted, saying, 
Did she give them permission to speak? She stated that there were many angels taking care of small groups, and it was none of their business. She warned that if anyone spoke without her permission, she would pop their head like a bubble. Saying this, she started the quest. Then she commanded all the humans to say, status window. And as they did, a status window appeared in front of them. Just like always, Ryu's stats were trash with his strength, intelligence, agility, and luck all at three, without any normal or skill. The angel continued, saying, Now that everyone has opened their status window and got familiar with this system, specially designed like a game for trash humans to understand easily, she gave an evil smile and extended her hand forward. She announced that if they increased their levels and cleared the 20 rounds, they would be granted a wish, and they could wish for anything they wanted. Hearing this, everyone, including young men, got stunned. Then, with an amused smile, she announced that now she would give everyone their unique skill. In front of them, a crystal appeared, and when they broke the crystal, they got their unique skill. As young men broke his crystal, he was shocked. And then the angel said, since all of them received their unique skill, let the game begin. With a flick of her finger, a notification appeared in front of everyone, instructing them to kill 100 goblins to survive this round. And just like that, a goblin appeared in front of them. The sight of the goblin approaching them with a dagger sent shivers down the participants' spines. Just when they thought things couldn't get worse, the angel had another surprise. Spreading her legs, spreading her hands wide, she summoned a whole army of goblins, amplifying the panic among the participants. The angel couldn't be happier, her mischievous smile reflecting her delight at the prospect of a life-or-death battle between 10,000 humans and 50,000 goblins. Suddenly, a goblin charged at the crowd. The tension was palpable. But then, to everyone's surprise, Ryu stepped forward, unarmed. As he advanced towards the charging goblin, murmurs rippled through the crowd. Everyone tried to warn him, claiming it was too dangerous. However, Ryu seemed to have a different plan in mind. With remarkable force, he delivered a powerful kick, sending the goblin flying backward and shocking the entire crowd. He changed his plans and decided to show his full power to the crowd, as it was part of his future plans. Picking up the goblin's dagger, Ryu fixed his gaze upon the angel, determined to capture her attention. Then, as two more goblins charged at him, Ryu got ready with his dagger. In a flash, both were slain. Again, all the people were shocked, saying how cool Ryu was. Then one person started to say that these goblins might be weak, and they too could easily kill them, believing it was not a big deal. But before he could finish their sentence, a goblin jumped at them, grinning, and stabbed them to death. Witnessing this, everyone panicked and started to run. Meanwhile, Ryu effortlessly continued to eliminate the goblins. As they witnessed the horrifying scene of goblins mercilessly killing humans, Ryu knew that now there would be only one thing on the minds of these people, survival. Some might try to run, but the area was protected by a barrier so escape was impossible. Others might hesitate to kill a living being, but in order to survive, they had no choice but to fight or be killed. Ryu explained how he had once been like them, but after going through this round 99 times despite being weak, he knew all the movements and weaknesses of the goblins like the back of his hand, making it easy for him to kill them. Watching the scene unfold from above, the angel was having a ball. She was genuinely enjoying the chaos of goblins and humans fighting each other. With a smirk, she commented on how the humans, who she referred to as monkeys, were struggling against the goblin, even though the goblins goblins had smaller, weaker bodies, when they were armed with daggers, they seemed to have the upper hand. However, her gaze eventually landed on Ryu, who was tearing through the goblins like a whirlwind. She took note of his nickname, Black Scythe, and realized he had already taken down 70 goblins in a short span. A hint of annoyance crossed her face. Ryu's dominance was ruining her entertainment. But, shrugging it off, she said to herself, eh, it can't be helped, and shifted her focus to watch other humans fight for their lives. Ryu, on the other hand, continued his onslaught, becoming a one-man killing machine. The goblins started to fear him. Seizing the moment, Ryu checked his status window. He had leveled up to four and had six stat points to allocate. Without hesitation, he dumped all his points into agility, explaining that agility not only boosts dodging ability, but also impacts attack and movement speed. At the start, agility's the real MVP, Ryu thought. Looking at his dagger, Ryu said out loud, this should get that pesky angel's attention. With a swift throw, his dagger found its mark, embedding itself in a goblin's head. With his arm still outstretched from the throw, he confidently declared his intent to wipe out all the goblins that day. The goblins shivered in fear, sensing the resolve in his voice. Ryu, not missing a beat, got back to work, and in no time, he had reached his goal. 100 goblins defeated. 
After successfully completing the quest, a bright yellow light enveloped Ryu, creating a protective shield that kept the goblins at bay. Standing there with a cool, collected expression, he remarked that the first round was a piece of cake. He'd gone all out, slicing through goblins like a maniac, just to grab that angel's attention. But truth be told, there was another reason too. Then, with a sly grin, Ryu shared that he was also aiming for a secret reward, the system. Impressed by his lightning-fast completion time of 10 minutes and 21 seconds, congratulated Ryu for achieving rank 1 in all the zones, setting a new historical record. Feeling pretty pleased with himself, Ryu explained that he had an ace up his sleeve. As a reward, the system granted Ryu a coupon, a real game-changer. With it, he could choose any low-rank rare weapon he wanted, absolutely free. Ryu, still sporting a hand stained with goblin blood, eagerly clicked the coupon, and before him materialized an array of weapons. However, there was a tinge of disappointment in his eyes. You see, his trusty main weapon was a scythe, a rare find indeed. So, begrudgingly, he settled for a dagger, tossing aside the measly goblin dagger like it was trash. Meanwhile, the other players were still caught up in a life-and-death struggle. Ryu, though, was in a league of his own. He casually checked his status window, and there was a title that caught his eye, one he'd never encountered in his previous 99 lives, the last time regressor. This was new to him, and he couldn't help but wonder what it meant. The scene shifted to a flashback, giving us a glimpse of how Ryu earned this new title. Ryu, maintaining his poker face, had utilized the Ryun Stone, causing it to slowly fade away as he revived his unique skill, regression. However, the system promptly notified him that this marked the 100th time he'd used this skill, and it was now time to bid farewell to it. Now, this wasn't much of a shock to Ryu, who had anticipated that his skill would be removed after the 100th use. Otherwise, he might have regressed infinitely. However, there was a twist in the tale. Another system notification popped up, catching Ryu off guard. It informed him that this 100th regression had earned him a special title, the last time regressor. This news left Ryu genuinely stunned. You see, in this world, titles were exceedingly rare, and each one came with its own set of skills and stat boosts. Intrigued, Ryu examined his new title and what it offered. Upon death, he would be resurrected with full health, and what's more, he could choose the exact location where he'd return to the land of the living. This, however, was a one-time use ability. At this revelation, Ryu broke into a smile, a genuine one. He rested his chin on his hand, realizing he'd just laid his hands on something truly extraordinary. After that, Ryu, feeling a bit restless, stretched out his arms. He was honestly getting bored and wondered how Youngman was faring. After a quick look around, he spotted Youngman. The dude was still kicking. Ryu smirked a bit, thinking, guess he's gonna make it through this mess like before. As time went on, more participants were finishing their quests. But the angel. She looked like she was about to doze off. She even said it was getting boring since there were now as many humans as there were goblins. Down on the ground, it was a completely different story. Humans were in a real mess. Some looked like they were on their last breath, while others were sobbing, holding their loved ones close. Then, out of the blue, that mischievous angel got a wicked idea. She decided to spice things up. As if things weren't bad enough, the terrified black-haired girl watched in horror as her injured hubby started to fade away, like he was just disappearing. And it wasn't just him. All the dead bodies began to vanish. Just as everyone was trying to wrap their heads around what was happening, a massive group of goblins appeared and rushed towards the humans, causing complete mayhem. From a distance, all you could see was a messy, brutal fight. Goblins and humans were going at it like there was no tomorrow. And up above, that angel was having the time of her life, laughing like a total maniac, and even had the nerve to say she was being generous by giving them 50,000 goblins for free. Ryu, on the other hand, was just chilling, sitting protected under his barrier. He didn't even flinch or show any emotion, even though things were getting pretty wild out there. After what felt like forever, a system message popped up. It announced that 5,134 folks managed to finish their quests, marking the end of the round. Then, just as suddenly as they appeared, all the goblins vanished. This left the remaining participants totally baffled. The angel then dropped the bombshell. Since half of the folks who first showed up had passed the quest, the rest weren't so lucky. And as she broke the news, the unlucky ones began to fade away. Their cries and pleas filled the air, but the angel? She didn't bat an eye. She just sat there, soaking in the drama like it was some top-notch entertainment. Then, the system notification popped up, displaying everyone's rankings, and Ryu was at number one. 
he received another reward for being in the top spot, which was 1,000 gold. Meanwhile, everyone stared at Ryu with shocked expressions as they also realized he was ranked number one. The awaited moment had arrived. The angel took an interest in Ryu, just as he had hoped. Smiling, she praised Ryu, acknowledging that someone being ranked number one in the entire world, region, and under her group was an accomplishment to be proud of. The angel called out to Ryu, using his nickname Black Scythe, and asked him how he became so strong. She began to inquire if he had received a special, unique skill, but stopped herself mid-sentence, cursing herself. Ryu replied, asking if she couldn't already tell what unique skill he had since she was an angel. The angel panickedly responded that of course she could, as she was a mighty angel, and she was merely asking. Ryu smiled inwardly, knowing that she couldn't actually discern his unique skill. Then Ryu dropped a bombshell, asking the angel for a favor. That wiped the smile off her face. You could hear a pin drop as everyone's jaws hit the floor. Ryu, bold as brass, said the rewards were a bit naff and he wanted something more. The crowd couldn't believe their ears. How could he talk to an angel like that? The angel, though, she was fit to burst. Rage was bubbling up inside her like a volcano ready to blow. In a voice that could curdle milk, she asked Ryu to spit it out. What did he want? Ryu, never losing his cool, said he wanted a better prize. The angel was seething, her eyes turning as dark as the abyss, a terrifying aura swirling around her, veins popping out like she was about to go supernova. Slowly, her hand reached out like she was going to squash Ryu's head like a grape, but she stopped herself mid-reach. She remembered she couldn't use her head-popping power again. Not yet. She had a one-per-day limit, and she had already used one before. In a sudden twist, the angel had an idea pop into her mind. With a cheeky smile, she told Ryu that she's got a reward Ryu will definitely like, and then she slowly came down on ground, saying normally she'd ignore such a bold request. But she's taken a liking towards Ryu, and she wanted to chat one-on-one -on -one in private, telling the rest of the humans stay for a moment as they will return soon. The angel and Ryu headed off toward the jungle, leaving the crowd with envy. They all thought, man, maybe we should have asked for better prize, too. But they quickly realized that only a top dog like Ryu could make a big ask without, you know, getting his head blown up. As they dipped, Ryu shot a look back at Youngman, leaving the guy scratching his head. Ryu just gave a sly grin and continued on. As they ventured deeper into the jungle, the angel was like, why you hanging back? I ain't gonna bite. Walk up with me. And Ryu just nodded. Internally, the angel was losing it. She thought humans were mad greedy and she had some, let's say, special plans for Ryu. Her face turned all kinds of sinister and she let out a low, eerie laugh. She thought once they passed a certain rock, they'd be out of the surveillance zone. And then she'd get her revenge, giving Ryu a slow, painful end. As she reached the magic spot, she tried to put on her best smiley face, telling Ryu he was about to get his special reward. But out of nowhere, a fist zoomed toward her. Before she could even dodge, bam! Ryu's punch sent her flying and made this holy being a holy shit. The angel was in shock as golden blood spilled from her mouth. She couldn't wrap her head around the fact that she'd been punched by a mere human. Pissed off, she pulled herself together and tried to locate Ryu, but the dude had vanished. Just when she thought she'd caught a break, out of nowhere, Ryu popped up right behind her, ready to throw down. In a slick move, Ryu got one hand on her wing and the other wrapped around her neck. The angel, usually so in control, was freaking out big time. She screamed at him to back off, but Ryu, he just calmly ripped off one of her wings. The pain hit her hard, and she blacked out for a sec, and when she came back to sense, Ryu was already tearing off her other wing, and golden blood was going everywhere, and she couldn't help but scream out in agony. Ryu, cool as ice, told her to quit with the dramatic act. Then he forced her down to the ground, stepping on her back and grabbing her last wing. She begged and cried, but Ryu didn't show a lick of mercy. With one last yank, he ripped off her final wing while saying now she will not be able to run and they can talk in peace. Now the angel trembling slowly turned back, and Ryu asked her if she was in pain, but she didn't say anything, just ground her teeth. Then Ryu smiled and asked her if he hadn't acted like that. It would be him in her place crying in pain, and the angel would be the one smiling maniacally. Hearing this, the angel stood up, panicked, shouting, What the hell is Ryu saying, this nonsense? She called Ryu insane for hurting an innocent angel. But then, with cold eyes, Ryu picked up the angel's torn wing and showed her the hidden dagger hidden behind her wing. He asked her if she was not planning to kill him with this hidden dagger. 
Then what was it for? Putting it into her pussy. Hearing this, the angel was speechless. Ryu stood up, throwing the wing aside, saying he had done this for the 88th time, and it was still satisfying to do it, while the angel was confused, not understanding what Ryu was saying. Then Ryu dropped yet another bomb. He called the angel by her name, Burial, and told her he knew all about her and it was time for her to die. Now, scared, anger and shock mixed on the angel's pale face as she wondered how Ryu knew her name thinking it was impossible. Ryu replied that there was no point in telling someone who was going to die and took out his dagger from his inventory, staring at it. The angel grew more and more panicked and started shouting that if Ryu killed her, the consequences would be heavy. Then, with an angry and loud voice, pointing her finger toward Ryu, she threatened him that if he didn't stop, she would use her skill and pop Ryu's head like a bubble. But Ryu calmly smiled and replied that she could do whatever she wanted, but she would not be able to use that skill, as it could only be used once per day. Now the angel was gritting her teeth in frustration, and then in panic, she warned Ryu that if he killed her, her comrades would not let him go unscathed. But Ryu, with a calm and calculating expression, simply said, Comrades, my ass. He knew she was a virgin loser with no friends, and no one was going to come to her aid. The other angels didn't care about what happened to their fellow angel. Ryu slowly advanced toward the angel, and she began to utter threats about how he would regret killing her. But before she could finish her sentence, Ryu raised his dagger and thrust it into her chest with great force, ripping her apart. Golden blood splattered all around her, and she screamed in agony. However, Ryu's expression remained cold and calm as he stood over her lifeless form. The system then notified Ryu that he had achieved an unbelievable feat. He had become the first in history to kill an angel. As a reward for this act, he received two rewards. First, he obtained the angel's special essence, her juice, and second, he acquired an ability Ruin Crystal. This was the entire reason he had killed the angel and he had succeeded in his goal. The Ruin was known as the Ruin of Slaughter, and Ryu wasted no time in utilizing it. As he activated the Ruin, it began merging with him, and the system promptly notified him that he had gained a unique skill known as the Butcherer. With this skill, every time he killed his target, all of his stats would increase by 1%, making him even more formidable. The system didn't stop there. It informed Ryu that he had earned the title of the First Angel Slayer. This title bestowed a tremendous advantage upon him, as when facing an angel in battle, all of his stats would double turning him into a formidable adversary. Now, the most significant reward awaited Ryu as he held the angel's special juice in his hand. He explained that it was solely for this reason that he had taken the risk of killing the angel. This special juice, after consumption, would allow him to change his class to Grim Reaper. The Grim Reaper class was considered the natural enemy of angels, making Ryu a formidable opponent against them, as angels will be a pain in the ass in future. Ryu went on to clarify that in this world, anyone could obtain a class, but the process for achieving one was shrouded in mystery. People gradually discovered the criteria through trial and error. For example, one could acquire a warrior class by defeating a certain number of goblins within a specific time frame. There were a total of 30 classes available, but some were unique and could only be obtained by fulfilling special conditions, such as drinking an angel's special essence. These unique classes were significantly more powerful than the standard ones. Ryu had explored all the classes in his previous 99 lives and found that the Grim Reaper class was the best choice, enabling him to fight angels on equal footing in future. Ryu wasted no time in claiming his rewards for coming in first place in the entire region. He carefully selected a 3x experience buff for two rounds, fully aware of its importance. He already possessed valuable information and a good amount of gold, but he needed to level up quickly for his future plans. As Ryu made his choices, the angel's presence began to fade, and a soothing white light enveloped the entire area. The scene then shifted and we found ourselves back on Earth with Youngman. He was panting and bewildered, slowly raising his head as he wondered if everything that had transpired was merely a bad dream. However, Youngman noticed something odd. He checked his phone and discovered that exactly 5 hours and 20 minutes had passed precisely the same amount of time as in his dream. Gradually, others around him began to wake up with headaches. Youngman's friend also woke up, confused, and shared that he had experienced a strange dream. But Youngman observed something even more alarming. As he pushed his friend's foot gently, there was no response. 
Another friend tried to rouse the motionless man, only to discover that he was dead, his face pallid. Panic began to grip them as they realized that everything that had occurred in the dream was not a mere fantasy. It was a grim reality. Anyone who had died in that dream had met the same fate in real life. This shocking revelation was too much to bear, and fear overcame them. Youngman and his friends frantically assessed their surroundings, trying to determine what to do next and how they would face the challenges of the upcoming month. Amidst the fear and confusion, Youngman was trembling, but his tremors were not born of fear. Instead, he was shaking with excitement, a strange anticipation stirring within him. He was getting excited, thinking that in that world, everyone was equal. And it didn't matter whether they were a president or a celebrity. In that world, strength was king, and he could do whatever he wanted. He could kill whoever he pleased. Meanwhile, his friends were crying in panic, scared that next month he would die as a virgin if he failed to complete the quest. But Youngman scolded them, telling them he wasn't the only one facing this problem. He urged them to stay calm and explained that all they had to do was kill some monsters to survive the next round. It was as easy as spreading butter on bread. Hearing this, his friends couldn't believe what they were hearing and thought Youngman was crazy to begin with. But now he seemed even crazy. One of them sighed and called him a bastard, saying that with his miserable life, he wouldn't be missed if he died right now. After all, he had tons of things he wanted to do. Young men paid little attention to their words. He was scanning the crowd. His friends asked him what he was looking for, and it turned out he was searching for his personal punching bag, Ryu. He wondered where that little rascal had gone. He had definitely seen him heading in that direction before he passed out. Could it be that he couldn't even make it past the first round and died there? But still not finding him, he calmly shrugged his shoulders. It made sense to him that a loser like him didn't survive and most likely had died. Suddenly, something in the crowd caught his attention. He saw a man in medieval armor. Young men couldn't understand who this guy was and where he managed to dig up this outdated armor. But then he realized it could only mean one thing. The status windows were working here as well. As soon as he gave the right command, his status window with his characteristics appeared in front of him. He couldn't believe that it had worked. Young men immediately shouted to his friends to all try to turn on their status windows because it worked here too. They were once again shocked that it worked. Seeing their actions, the others also followed suit. But everyone was curious if this meant that they could use all of their stats and items here. A few hours late, to test this, young Min picked up a small pebble from the ground and squeezed it in his hand. It shattered into small pieces and the remnants of the stone turned into a saw blade that spilled out through his fingers. Seeing this, he let out an evil smile. A few hours later, the next breaking news was announced on Morning News Nationwide. Multiple angels were seen worldwide, and nine billion people died overnight, while another nine billion people gained mysterious powers, turning the whole world upside down. Ryu Min walked down the street with a serious face, reading the news on his smartphone. He thought to himself, it's just the beginning. The real chaos is about to come. The real problem was now on round one. People didn't become that strong. They reached just the level of a pro athlete. The real chaos would begin from round two, when they would get magical powers, giving rise to numerous criminal activities as modern weapons wouldn't work on them. Ryu wasn't going to sit back and watch the world descend into chaos. If he had left things as they were, the Earth would likely have fallen into ruins before the 20th round arrived. There was only one solution. He would have to control the other players by overpowering them, making them his slaves. With a serious expression, he realized that he needed to gather his five teammates as soon as possible, and he had some of them in mind. But then he said to himself, that's not important now. There's something even more important to do. He left with determination. He reached his house and knocked on the door of the apartment building in one of Seoul's neighborhood. No one answered or opened the door, so he retrieved the key from its hiding place and let himself in. It was dark inside, and he noticed an uneaten instant cup noodle. Slowly, he approached his bedroom. There, his little brother, Wani, slept peacefully and carefree on the floor. Seeing him, Ryu couldn't help but let out a warm smile. He was glad that his younger brother was safe and sleeping peacefully. He continued to watch over his sleeping brother with affection for a while. Ryu explained that his younger brother's name was Wani, and he was in his third year of middle school. With a sad tone, he continued, saying their family had once been quite ordinary and happy. 
But after their parents died in a car accident, a lot of things changed quickly for them. One of the most drastic changes that happened was that Ryu became his little brother's only family and guardian. As Ryu examined his little brother, he noticed a band-aid coming off his hand and some bruises on his shoulders, as if someone had beaten him up. Gently, Ryu glued the band-aid back on and just stared at his brother, lost in thought. Morning came, and Ryu woke his little brother up, informing him that it was morning and time to wake up. Wani, still sleepy, slowly woke up and questioned why he was being awakened so early, especially when he had no classes today. Ryu, seeing how lazy his little brother was, pulled the blanket off him, startling him and waking him up in shock. Ryu explained that they didn't have time to sleep and that he would explain everything later. For now, Ryu instructed him to hurry and dress up as they had to go somewhere urgently, his face still serious. Wani took his time, not fully understanding what was happening. He yawned and asked where they were going, but Ryu, with a serious expression, told him that they didn't have time to relax and the whole world was in chaos. Wani asked if something was wrong with the New Year ceremony he was going to attend, but Ryu urged him to get out of the house first, promising to explain everything later. As they left the house and strolled down the narrow street, Wani couldn't help but notice a significant shift in his brother's demeanor. Ryu, typically carefree and easygoing, appeared unusually serious. Wani sensed that something out of the ordinary had occurred, but he hesitated to inquire, thinking that Ryu would eventually share what was on his mind. Then Ryu turned toward his little brother and inquired if he was aware of what was happening in the world. Hearing this, Wani got confused, thinking about what could have happened while he was asleep in his state of panic. Ryu urged his little brother to check the latest news on his smartphone search feed. Wani quickly scrolled through the updates, trying to comprehend the gravity of the situation. What he read left him in disbelief. Stories of angels kidnapping people's souls and transporting them to another world, where half of them had died with a heart attack mysteriously. Panic surged through Wani as he absorbed the shocking news. In his state of anxiety, he bombarded Ryu with questions, asking, did Ryu also get transported to that world? His brother told him that he had been taken too, and he could only get out after killing a hundred monsters called goblins. Hearing this, Wani immediately began to worry about his brother's health and asked if he was hurt. He bombarded Ryu with questions, but Ryu reassured him not to worry about himself. However, upon hearing this, Wani became even more concerned, after all, Ryu was his only family, his only sibling, and dearest person. Ryu was his entire world, and the thought of something happening to his brother was unbearable. To fulfill both the mother's and father's duty, Ryu became the most mentally strong individual from a very young age. But having a strong mind and killing a hundred monsters are completely different things. Seeing his worried little brother, Ryu smiled and told him not to worry too much. He reassured Wani that he would explain everything later, but for now, they didn't have much time, and they needed to take action. Then Wani stopped and asked Ryu to tell him where they were going. He was willing to follow Ryu, but all the information was too much for him to handle, and he would only follow Ryu when he told him where they were going. Seeing his little brother's wounded hand, Ryu turned to Wani and told him in a cold voice that they were going to attack the hideout of Tegyu, who was the leader of the bullies in his class, shocking his little brother. Still not believing that his brother had found out, Wani asked his brother if he really knew about it. Ryu asked back, did you really think I wouldn't find out? Now, Wani bit his lip, realizing that he thought he had hidden his secret well, but it turned out that his brother had known about the bullying all along. Now worried, Wani sat there thinking how he didn't want to get his brother involved in his life when Ryu was himself getting bullied and having a hard time. Ryu, on the other hand, seeing his little brother sad, apologized to him in his thoughts and said to himself that he shouldn't have known this in the first place, but he found this out during the first regression. After returning from the first round, Ryu Min just slept the entire day in depression and his little brother went somewhere in the morning. After a while, Ryu was awakened by the ringing of the phone. Annoyed at who might be calling him, he reached for the phone, still sleepy. He asked who was calling, to which the voice immediately asked if he was the guardian of someone named Wani. Then it immediately added that he should come to the hospital immediately. After saying that, Ryu's pupils dilated in horror. The next second, he quickly got dressed and ran out of the apartment. And that day, his little brother got bullied so badly by Tegyu that Wani became blind with multiple fractures. Looking at his younger brother, who was sitting in the corner of his room with his arms wrapped around his knees, depressed, Ryu was shocked and angry with himself because he was so weak and pathetic that he couldn't even protect his little brother. And now that he is no longer that weak, pathetic loser, he will do anything to protect his little brother. And his first mission is to beat the crap out of that son of a bully. Then the scene shifts, 
and we see an old factory, and inside that, Tegu was beating someone furiously, asking why they hadn't brought him 200,001 each as he had ordered them to. Shivering in pain and agony, the man tried to say something, but only managed to squeeze out another painful groan. Tegu took that as ignoring him, which made him even angrier. He lifted his foot and swung it at the poor guy with anger in his eyes. Then he began to beat the poor guy again with anger, who had no chance to resist, and it would have made things worse because his assailant was not alone. Tegu's friends stood aside watching this one-sided beating with a chuckle, but they were actually tense and afraid of Tegu's ruthless attitude since he was very unpredictable and very cruel. Even the other high school students were afraid of him. Tegu was 185 centimeters tall, and he had a rather large physique for a sophomore high school student. Undoubtedly, he was an overwhelming dominant among his peers and was famous even among gangsters for his fighting skill. After a while, the man was finally done with the beating, screaming harshly. He scratched his neck and headed towards his buddies, complaining irritably that he couldn't buy a motorcycle today, as he couldn't get the money he was going to get today. Seeing the angry guy approaching them, the group of his buddies immediately tensed up. Unfortunately for them, their fears were realized as Tegu approached his gang and asked if any of them knew anyone from whom he could get the money to buy the motorcycle. The gang was caught off guard, and each of them scratched the back of their heads nervously. Then one of his members suddenly remembered a name, and he turned to Tegu and asked why they shouldn't call that tall guy with curly hair who was from their class. Tegu's lips curled into an evil grin when he realized who he was talking about. Then he added that he planned to call him today anyway since he thought he deserved a good beating as a New Year's present. They were thinking about how they would beat Ryu Won. Tegu, with an annoyed face, said that Ryu Won is basically homeless and they will not get anything from him. Then he decided that once he comes, he will beat the crap out of him and make him blind for being so poor. Then suddenly, a footstep echoed in the empty factory and in the entrance, Ryu confidently entered the building, while Wani hesitantly followed behind him. Seeing Wani, the hooligans started laughing, saying they were just going to call him, and here he is. He came on his own. Then, noticing another person beside Wani, standing confidently, Tegu got annoyed, thinking who he is. Then he shouted loudly, cursing Wani, saying how dare he bring someone without his permission. But Ryu just stood there silently, glaring at them, and Wani started to shiver in fear. Seeing this silent treatment, Tegu got even more annoyed. Then he angrily, slowly came toward Wani and asked him if he brought another errand boy. But before he could say anything, Ryu stepped forward with a smile on his face and confidently stated that he was his older brother. Tegu laughed, then turned to Wani, who was standing behind his older brother, and reminded him that he had already told him to watch his language if he didn't want to get beaten up. And now he had come with his older brother to his hideout to get revenge with a mocking smirk on his face. Tegu clenched his fists and told Wani that he and his brother would die today. Then, turning to one of his minions, he nodded and ordered them to act. The latter, not realizing what he was getting into, nodded in agreement with a happy smile. While Tegu was standing behind with his arms crossed, his underling slowly walked toward Ryu and started taunting Wani, asking if his brother had ever even killed an ant before. Now, standing face to face with Ryu Min, he compared his height with Ryu, saying how small he was, and how Ryu Min was even smaller than Ryu Wan. But before he could finish his sentence, a heavy fist came flying toward him, and the next thing he knew, he was lying on the ground, blood coming from his face and mouth. Seeing his friend's defeat, the other guy immediately rushed at Ryu, intending to strike him with his fist. However, Ryu Min dodged his attack and struck him in the jaw with his fist. The blow was so strong that the guy let out a painful scream and flew a few meters away, hitting some debris behind him. At the same time, the first guy, who had already recovered from the blow, as well as the remaining bald guy who was shouting angrily for him to die, rushed at Ryu again. However, this joint attack was of no use at all, as all they got was two blows to their faces and started crying in pain. At the same time, Tegu was watching his buddies being beaten up and crawling on the floor with painful groans. Then he walked past the fallen members, came close to Ryu, and with a smirking smile asked Ryu that he must have been acting this confident because he must have some boxing training from somewhere. But it's not enough to defeat him as, however skilled Ryu is, he will not be able to overcome the difference in weight class. Tegu was 185 centimeters tall and had a sturdy build, while Ryu Min was 165 centimeters tall and looked frail. The difference in weight classes was obvious, 
and one could easily predict the outcome of the fight between the two without even watching it. However, to Tegu's surprise, Ryu didn't look scared at all. With a smile on his face, he turned to the big man and asked him if he was not watching the news. Hearing this nonsense, Tegu charged toward Ryu with his punch, but to his surprise, Ryu dodged it effortlessly. Then Tegu threw punches and kicks after kicks, but Ryu dodged all of them effortlessly. Now his vision was getting blurry and he was breathing heavily, wondering in anger why he couldn't land a single hit on Ryu while grinding his teeth. At the same time, Ryu's fist lit up with a blue aura. Then he turned to Tegu and said that if he had been watching the news, he would have known that attacking a player like him so easily was tantamount to suicide. The next moment, he threw a lightning-fast punch that hit Tegu's jaw, sending him backward, but it wasn't enough to defeat him. Tegu once again rushed to attack Ryu with a fierce shout of curses. However, to his surprise and confusion, his blow did not hit the target as Ryu suddenly vanished. Unable to believe what was happening, he tried to turn around with horror on his face. Before he could react, Ryu threw another punch at Tegu's face. With a painful groan, Tegu rubbed his nose and then blood started to come from his mouth and nose with a broken tooth. Seeing his broken teeth, he screamed loudly in anger, declaring that today he would kill Ryu. It would not be a peaceful death. He intended to torture him before delivering the final blow. With determination, he once again threw a punch toward Ryu Min. But this time, Ryu didn't dodge the attack. Instead, he grabbed Tegu's hand, leaving Tegu in shock. Ryu Min started throwing a barrage of punches toward Tegu, and from behind, Tegu's underlings were left surprised. Tegu noticed that Ryu was only punching his face, trying to humiliate him in front of his gang. This realization fueled his anger, and he charged toward Ryu again. But this time, Ryu kicked Tegu with great force. Tegu went flying and crashed onto the wall. The kick was so strong that Tegu was holding his neck, struggling to breathe. With broken teeth, shivering from pain, and saliva coming from his mouth, Ryu slowly walked toward Tegu, and with a cold stare asked, Does it hurt a lot? Ryu was consumed by anger because during his earlier regressions when he was weak, he had seen his little brother getting bullied and brutally beaten numerous times. Those memories haunted him, and he couldn't forget them. As Ryu slowly approached Tegu, he was terrified, fumbling to say not to come close. Tegu was still holding his neck and begged Ryu not to beat him more, saying he was sorry. However, Ryu didn't continue the physical assault. Instead, with a warm smile on his face, he gently held Tegu's hands and asked, Will you marry me? He continued, stating that Tegu shouldn't have messed with his brother. With a snap, a crackling sound echoed in the factory, and Tegu started screaming in agony. Ryu had broken all of his fingers, and Tegu was in excruciating pain, clutching his hand. But the torment didn't end there. Ryu grabbed Tegu's other hand, leaving Tegu in terror. With another snap, he broke Tegu's other five fingers, and Tegu started to scream maniacally. Witnessing this merciless scene, all of Tegu's underlings ran away in terror, and even Wani, who had been watching, found it too horrifying to bear. With a serious expression, Ryu warned Tegu not to touch a single hair on Wani's head. Tegu, crying, promised that he would never do that, but then Ryu began to smile with a very happy expression. He grabbed Tegu again, stating that Tegu might change his mind in the future, so he had to ensure Tegu would never mess with them. With that, he broke Tegu's wrists as well, and Tegu screamed in agony for hours. The scene shifted, and we see Ryu walking, his little brother hesitantly calling his name. Ryu stopped, and Wani asked in surprise how Ryu did that, and if he had learned some kind of martial art in another world. Hearing this, Ryu smiled slightly and replied that just like the news said, players could use their abilities in the real world. As an example, he pointed to his hand, which shone with a bright golden light. In the next moment, a black dagger appeared in his hand, causing Wani to gasp in surprise. Seeing the dagger magically appear in Ryu's hand, Wani got very excited and curiously, with sparkling eyes, asked how Ryu did that. Ryu, with a kind smile, replied that this is one of the skills he got from the other world, and all the other players can use it. Then, as Ryu was putting the dagger back into his inventory, Wani remembered what had happened at the factory and asked in the same surprised voice if Ryu had learned all his new fighting techniques from that other world as well. Ryu replied that he didn't learn any fighting techniques, and he was able to do that because he was faster than them. His dexterity stat had reached level 11, adding that normal people's agility stats were around 3 points, while professional athletes could reach 10 points, and his was 11. So now he was as fast as Usain Bolt. Wani followed his brother and asked what would happen if he level up. 
and Ryu replied that he didn't know, as he hadn't reached that level, and only by leveling up would he be able to find that answer. But from inside, he knew the answer. You see, in his 13th life, he told everything about him to his little brother that would happen in the future, and that he was a regressor. Because of that, Wani became the target of the other players and had been kidnapped by a player. Even though he was able to get revenge, he didn't want to feel those emotions again, much less have his younger brother suffer for it. Turning to look at his little brother who was following him, he told himself that he had to prepare himself to protect him in the upcoming fight between the players. Then Wani's stomach growled, and Ryu asked if he was hungry and suggested they go eat a good breakfast together. Hearing this, Wani happily nodded with shining eyes. Then the two brothers entered the nearest store. Ryu immediately headed towards the ATM. When Wani saw this, he asked where he was going, saying that the noodles were in a different place. But Ryu turned around and told him to wait for a few minutes. He went to the ATM and inserted his card. He looked at the screen and thought to himself that this was all he could save up to that point. His balance was 133,134,1, which was about $100. After selecting a transaction amount of 100,001, he pressed the button to confirm the transaction. Seeing the huge bills in his older brother's hands, Wani was surprised and asked why he needed so much money, to which Ryu replied that he needed it for something. Then the two reached an area selling premium foods, and Ryu asked Wani why he didn't choose something from here. Hearing this, Wani got startled, saying everything here is very expensive. Even the cheapest food here is for $20. But Ryu reassured his little brother that it's okay as it's New Year, and they should eat good food to enjoy the day. Hesitantly, Wani asked if they spend money on expensive food. Will they have enough money for living expenses? Ryu replied with a smile not to worry about money, and just to buy as he has a way to earn a lot of money. Then, Wani excitedly picked up a packet of pork belly meat, saying he always wanted to taste this, and today finally he will be able to. Ryu from afar was watching his little happy brother with a warm smile. Then, Ryu approached Wani, who was shining with happiness, and suggested that they go to a restaurant together sometime and order some roast beef. But Wani smiled the happiest smile Ryu had ever seen, and replied that there was no need, as he had more than enough of what they had bought today. Seeing how happy his brother was, Ryu told himself to wait for only five days, after which he could give his little adorable brother as much food as he wanted. He will give his little brother so much meat that he will get tired of eating it. Then the scene shifts, and we see Wani took a piece of meat with his chopsticks and put it on a spoonful of rice. As he took a bite and chewed it, he happily said with a happy face that it was delicious, really delicious. Ryu was really happy seeing his little brother happy. Then suddenly, Ryu stood up from his seat and told Wani to wait here as he had a very important thing to do. Wani asked him where he was going, but Ryu told Wani that he will know in a second. Then Ryu returned after a while, and he loudly slammed his hand on the table, placing his pen on it. Confused, Wani then noticed many lottery tickets and asked Ryu in an uncertain voice if all these are lottery tickets. Ryu replied, yes, they are. As he was opening his pen's cap, Wani, with a worried voice, asked how many tickets Ryu bought, and Ryu replied, 20. Hearing this, Wani got panicked, realizing his big bro just spent his entire savings on some lottery tickets, and he asked Ryu in concern how he could do that, and if this was the way of earning money Ryu was talking about, as he should know that it was almost impossible to win them. However, his older brother calmly told him to trust him and just watch. Then he took a pen and began to circle the numbers on the lottery tickets. Wani was puzzled when he saw Ryu circling numbers on all the lottery tickets. Worried, Wani asked Ryu why did he circle the numbers on each ticket, and Ryu replied with a smile on his face that he did it because those numbers were the winning ones. Then the scene shifts, and we see the brothers sitting in their house with lottery tickets on the table. Ryu was calmly flipping through his phone, while his brother nervously held the phone in one hand and propped his head up with the other. The announcement of the lottery draw was made from his phone. Wani was biting his fingernails with worry, staring at the screen of his phone with the live broadcast. He thought they were in trouble if they didn't win a single lottery because they had wasted all their money. As the live broadcast began, Wani became more nervous and Ryu scolded him not to be so nervous and to stop biting his nails. Wani said that they would have been better off buying better food with that much money. Then the hosts announced that the first lucky number was 3, and Wani stopped biting his nails. The second number was 18, and the third was 9. Wani was shocked as he saw the numbers matching the numbers on the lottery ticket that Ryu had bought. 
As all the numbers got revealed, Ryu matched the numbers on the lottery ticket with the phone screen. He was overwhelmed with emotion, looking from the phone to the ticket and back again. With happiness, he asked Ryu if this was all a dream. Ryu replied it's not a dream and told Wani that he told him he had a way to earn money. Realizing it's not a dream, Wani raised his hand high, holding the lottery ticket, and happily shouted that they won the first prize. Ryu then told Wani to stop shouting, as if the neighbors heard them, they might get into trouble, and Wani stopped shouting midway. Then Ryu warmly asked Wani if he's happy, and Wani replied, of course he is happy, and asked Ryu if he's not happy. Ryu with a smile replied that he is, but he was not looking excited at all. He explained that he was also like Wani when he first won the lottery in his 15th regression, but after repeating it for multiple times, it became more like a mandatory process or an annual event. Then Ryu said to himself that he has to earn money quickly, as after the death of 9 billion people, and the item trading among the players will crash the economy like crazy. But it was not the end of the surprise. Ryu won first prize for all the 20 tickets. Now holding all 20 winning tickets, Wani was in shock, asking Ryu that this still doesn't feel real, and how much is the total amount will be. Ryu replied he doesn't know, but then with a smile, he said the amount is so large that it will shake the entire world. Ryu got off the bus and walked down the street. He soon saw a tall building in front of him. It was the main branch of Nan Hyeop Bank where he was to receive his prize. Normally, he would have been nervous before entering, but maybe it's because this is the 85th time he is receiving the grand prize. He is not nervous at all. The bank was crowded with customers, but none of them were lottery winners. Ryu went to the front desk in the lobby of the new building, and then he approached the employee on duty, telling him he is here to collect his lottery winning amount for the first place. Hearing this, the employee smiled and congratulated him on his winnings. At the same time, he wondered to himself how the guy standing in front of him, who looked like a student, was able to get the prize for the first place. Pushing his thoughts away and searching for something on the computer, then the employee asked Ryu where he had purchased his ticket, to which he replied that it was at the Yonwi branch. Hearing the guy's words, the employee exclaimed in shock, unable to believe what he had said. His mind immediately went back to a conversation with his colleague who told him that this time, someone won the first prize for 115 games and all first prize. However, and his senior strictly commanded him whenever that customer will come, he has to treat him like a VIP guest. The employee's thoughts were interrupted by the voice of Ryu, asking him if he is okay, and the employee panickedly replied he is, and told Ryu to just wait for a minute. A few minutes later, a middle-aged man appeared in front of Ryu, who smiled and thanked him for waiting. After shaking hands with Ryu, he introduced himself as Guan Juno, saying that he was the president of the bank. Ryu simply replied that his name was Ryu. The president said that since he had won the first place prize, he had to congratulate him personally. Ryu smilingly thanked the man for congratulating him. Afterwards, the man offered to escort him to the place where he could collect his winnings, telling him to follow him. As they approached the door with a sign that read, Lottery Ticket Sales Team, the president announced that they had arrived at the place. As soon as they stepped inside, they were immediately greeted by one of the female employees who stood up and bowed to greet the president. Noticing some young man next to the president, she couldn't help but wonder who it could be. But she didn't have to speculate because the next moment, the president himself introduced the guy, saying that he was the first place winner and that he had come to collect his prize. Then he told them to make sure that their guest felt comfortable. Surprised to see the guy who was talking casually with the president, the woman could hardly believe that in front of her was a man who had won first place for 115 games. Having recovered from her excitement and doubts, she told herself that she should calm down and do her best to satisfy the customer. After greeting him, she invited Ryu to sit down with a smile on her face. He did so, sitting comfortably on the chair right in front of her. She then asked him if he would like a drink, but Ryu simply replied that he would not, adding that he would like to get right down to business and take his prize. After hearing Ryu's answer, the employee didn't take any more time and asked him to provide her with the tickets so she could confirm that he was the winner. Ryu immediately handed her a stack of winning tickets that he had brought with him. Looking through the tickets, the woman couldn't believe that he had bet everything on one combination. It could only mean one thing. Either the guy had decided to risk everything, or he could see the future. Having finished with the confirmation, the employee said that everything was in order, 
and that he could take the prize for the first place. However, Ryu's next question about how much he would receive made the girl freeze, as even just naming such numbers was absurd. After a second of silence, she replied in a trembling voice that his prize is 22.5 billion won, which is equal to $16 million. After he received his prize, everything went pretty quickly. The first thing he did was start looking for a place to move to. That same night, he opened a stocks account because he had information from the future. He knew that the price of Bitcoin would increase by 500% next month, so he also planned to invest his money in it. After returning home, Ryu showed his younger brother pictures of their new house and asked him if he liked it. Wani happily replied that it was amazing, adding that he had never seen such a huge and beautiful house in person. But Wani was confused about one thing. He asked Ryu why he signed a rental agreement when they had enough money to buy a house. Ryu replied that he didn't have any more money, as he had spent it all. His phrase made Wani freeze in place, and Ryu casually added that he had invested all the money into Bitcoin. When his younger brother heard this, he froze in place again, unable to understand how his brother could so easily say that he had invested $15 billion into Bitcoin. Ryu Min approached his younger brother, who had turned into a statue, and patted him on the shoulder, assuring him that he hadn't done it without thinking, and he knew the price of Bitcoin was going to rise. He told Wani not to worry. Then, hugging Wani, he added that not to worry, as he had seen a dream, and in that dream, he saw new numbers of lottery tickets, and they could always earn money through the lottery. After his older brother's words, the eyes of the naive Wani shone with admiration, believing everything Ryu said. Realizing this, he immediately grabbed Ryu by the shoulders and began to shake him excitedly, asking him never to forget them. Ryu somehow broke free from his little brother's grip, thinking to himself that he couldn't forget them, even if he wanted to, after repeating it countless times. Then Ryu turned to his brother and suggested that they eat outside before heading out. Wani asked in confusion where they were going, and Ryu replied with a smile on his face that they were moving to their new house today. At the same time, at some unknown location, Young Min was punching and made a big hole in the wall, and then with a villainous smile. He said to himself that pumping all the points into strength was the right decision. Swinging his fist at the end wall again, he added to himself that he was even able to get a power rune that doubled his strength. As he continued to strike the wall, he started to laugh maniacally, saying that now with this powerful fist, no one will be able to stop him, and veins started to foam in his hand as he clenched his fist, ready to go another round of punching the wall. Then the scene shifted, and we see Youngman now in front of Ryu's door, slamming the door and shouting Ryu's name. When he didn't get an answer, he said first he thought Ryu died in the first round, but later he found his name was not in the list of the dead people, and Ryu was even ignoring all his calls. Then Youngman's face became furious, thinking the way Ryu glared at him before the angel kidnapped him, he can never forget them, and he will only get satisfaction when he will beat him to death with his own hands. Then Youngman started to slam Ryu's door continuously, saying if he is hiding inside, he will now come inside after breaking the door. However, a voice stopped Youngman, and it was an old man standing on the stairs who turned to him and asked him what he was doing at that door. Youngman asked the old man if he should mind his own business, since Youngman is not slamming the old man's door. Hearing this, the old man, adjusting his glasses, replied that he was indeed the owner of the house, startling Youngman. Then he asked Youngman again if he had come to meet a friend. For a second he froze, not knowing what to say. He quickly adjusted himself to the situation, smiled, and said that he had indeed come to see his friend. Then he asked the old man if he could open the door for him. Youngman added that he had suddenly lost contact with his friend, and now he didn't know how to get in touch with him. Hearing this, the old man was shocked. Then he told Youngman that it was now an empty apartment as the student who lived there had moved out. Hearing this, Youngman immediately asked the owner of the house if he knew when and where the student had moved to. But the old man replied that he had moved today, but he didn't know where he had moved to. Hearing the old man's answer, Youngman was furious and he clenched his fists in anger, wondering how he could have left without telling anyone. Then the scene shifts and we see the duo arriving at the huge glass building, which was the size of a skyscraper. Wani exclaimed in surprise and admiration. Covering his eyes with his hand to keep the sun from shining, he said with shining eyes and amazement that the building was very tall. He was so innocent that he was even surprised that the door at the entrance was revolving. He didn't stop being amazed even when the female employee simply handed them entrance cards while his older brother confirmed their identities. Wani continued to be surprised that there was even a security guard here, 
Pushing himself up in the elevator to his room, he turned to Ryu and said admiringly that this place was really amazing. Stepping out of the elevator, they headed to their room. When they got to their room, Wani exclaimed again in surprise, wondering how big it was. His brother replied with a nonchalant face that it was about 330 square meters. Such a figure shocked his younger brother, as their previous apartment was dozens of times smaller. Looking at the apartment, Wani, still in disbelief that they were going to live here, asked, Isn't it too big just for the two of them? Ryu replied that they have a lot of money and that they should enjoy their life. Then Wani asked Ryu how much the rent had cost him, and Ryu said that it had cost about $22 million one a month, which is about $17,000 a month. The rent alone made his younger brother's head spin. He thought to himself that not so long ago, he was still concerned about the price of meat, which at that time seemed very expensive to him, and now they are spending so much just for rent. Following his older brother, who was still looking at the apartment they would be living in, Wani asked him if they could have chosen something cheaper. Hearing this, Ryu shook his head negatively and replied that the more expensive the services were, the higher the security, which was their priority after all. On the first of every month, all players will fall unconscious as their souls will get transported to another world, leaving their real bodies unprotected, and it was the period that was the most vulnerable for all players. During this time, they became vulnerable to disasters such as fire or earthquakes. But the biggest danger was not the cataclysms, but the assassins hired by other players. And so, when the time came, players would need to prepare to have their bodies in as protected a place as possible. After finishing his thoughts, Ryu turned to his brother, who had already settled in a bit, and asked if he liked the house. Wani enthusiastically replied that it was beautiful, and it still felt like he was dreaming. Then Ryu kindly said he is glad Wani is happy and that he liked it. Suddenly, Wani's face became a little sad. He then apologized to his older brother in an uncertain and worried voice. Ryu looked at him in confusion, not understanding what he was apologizing for. Wani continued in an upset voice, saying that Ryu would be transferred to another world next month and he'd have to fight for his life. Knowing this, how could Wani enjoy and be happy? But this sad atmosphere was broken by Ryu, who patted his brother on the shoulder, asking him why he was so sad. He added, Do you think I won't be able to come back from the next round? But Wani didn't say anything, and Ryu jokingly told him to stop thinking about nonsense and follow him. He had heard that the shopping hall on the second floor sells really delicious food, so they should go and enjoy. Wani agreed, still worried. Then suddenly a message arrived on Ryu's phone. After reading the message, he realized it was from Youngman, and Ryu continued to ignore him. Putting his phone in his coat pocket, he thought of giving Youngman a visit. The next day, a sleepy Ryu came out of the bedroom and was surprised to see Wani fully dressed, preparing to go somewhere. When he asked him where he was going, Wani happily replied that he had ordered some rice cakes and was going to pick them up. Still sleepy, Ryu didn't immediately realize what he was talking about. As far as he could remember, this had never happened before. Although regression did not guarantee that everything would happen exactly the same way as in the past, it was a significant change. Turning to his younger brother, who had already packed up and intended to go, Ryu asked him why he had decided to buy them, to which Wani replied that he was going to give them away to the neighbors as a gift to celebrate their moving in, as he thought it would be good manners. Ryu thoughtfully replied that being on good terms with the neighbors was a great idea. Pleased at his older brother's praise, Wani said that he could distribute them himself, adding that Ryu could stay here and rest. However, Ryu disagreed, replying that they should distribute the gifts together. He then told Wani to wait for a while while he went to change his clothes. After a while, they rang the bell of the first apartment, from which a voice came out seconds later asking who it was. Wani, with a smile on his face and a cake in his hands, good-naturedly informed them that they were their neighbors who had just moved in and now came to greet them. Opening the door, a middle-aged woman with a smile also greeted them, then noticing that the two looked very similar, she asked if they were brothers, to which Wani smilingly replied that they were. Handing the woman a rice cake, he advised her to eat them while they were still warm. She happily received the cake and thanked the brothers. Then, after some more time, they continued to greet their neighbors, continuing to give them gifts, and after an hour they were almost done with greeting the neighbors and heading to the last place. This was the top floor, and the most expensive and the most secure one. While Wani was ringing the doorbell, Ryu was thinking to himself that there must have been someone from a rich family or a celebrity in such a place. Even after ringing the bell for a while, no one answered his call, causing him to have thoughts that perhaps no one was home. Pressing once more and getting no answer, 
he turned to his older brother, who was standing by the wall and said a bit confusedly that it looked like no one was here. Turning around, they were about to head for the elevator, but the sound of the doors opening made them turn around. The person they saw in the next moment shocked Wani, while Ryu, although a little surprised, didn't change his face much. In front of them was a girl who had a beautiful appearance and was dressed in elegant clothes, who was looking at them with incomprehension. When Wani laid eyes on Arin, he was practically speechless, and a little shyness crept in. He couldn't help but blurt out how pretty she looked like an angel come to life, while Ryu was just staring at her, thinking about that angel that he just killed without any reaction. But before either of them could get a word out, this dude dressed in black stepped right in front of Arin. He had a real rude tone, asking the brothers who they were, and he even threw in a snide comment about whether they were her fans. That really got under Ryu's skin and he got a bit annoyed. So with his arms crossed, he made it clear that they weren't fans and that they'd only just moved into the building today. Meanwhile, Wani was feeling a tad shy. Then Wani, all cheerful, tried to hand over a rice cake as a friendly gesture. But that bodyguard of Arin's wasn't having any of it. He rudely stopped Wani right in the middle of his offering and flat out said they didn't want anything. To top it off, he told the brothers to mind their own business and not bother them. With that, he just turned on his heel and walked away, casually mentioning that Arin ain't into sweet stuff. Left the brothers feeling pretty insulted, that's for sure. Next up, the bodyguard opened up the door to Arin's place and told her to head on inside. She followed his lead, but she couldn't help but shoot a sorry look back at the brothers. Today's like goal is 3,000 likes. Like and subscribe to support the channel. Now, let's continue. Now, Ryu was getting pretty mad about the whole deal. He might not know who these people were, but that man's rude behavior was really getting on his nerves. On the other hand, Wani was still standing there, practically speechless. And it ain't just because he was feeling insulted. It's cause he realized that the lady he'd been staring at was none other than his idol, Arin. His eyes lit up with happiness, and he couldn't believe he was seeing her in the flesh. While Ryu was confused, thinking who she was, being a single virgin and a shut-in, he didn't have much knowledge about famous people. Then Wani excitedly explained to Ryu that she was Arin, and Ryu asked in confusion, who is Arin? Then the scene shifts, and we see Arin sitting on her sofa, watching the news on her phone. The news is filled with reports about how some famous actors mysteriously died overnight from heart attacks, and she recognizes that some of them were her friends. She feels a growing sense of terror as she wonders what is happening to the world. She places her phone on her bed, still filled with worry and a hint of fear, and starts thinking about how she barely survived this round, all because of her bodyguard. The thought of killing those damn goblins from her own hand is still terrifying her. To lighten the mood, she thinks jokingly that if she had died today, her name might have been in the news. Seeing Arin's worried expression, her bodyguard asks what's on her mind. She initially brushes it off, but the bodyguard sits beside her and gently encourages her to share her thoughts, assuring her that he's always here to listen. With a somber expression, Arin confesses that she's thinking about how drastically the world has changed and how she might die in the next round. Hearing this, the bodyguard reassures her, emphasizing that his job is to protect her and she can rely on him. Arin smiles warmly in response and expresses genuine gratitude for his unwavering support. Arin goes on to explain that when the company first assigned her a bodyguard, she had assumed he was there merely to keep an eye on her. However, she acknowledges that without his presence, she might not have survived the first round. She shares a light-hearted moment with her bodyguard, mentioning that the new neighbors who brought rice cake looked yummy, but her bodyguard replied that she would get ugly and fat if she ate things like that. Aaron replied that it was okay to take the cake, and they would not have eaten it. The bodyguard was too rude to the brothers, as they might have felt bad and insulted. The bodyguard replied that he knows all about people like them. They were just trying to be friendly for their own selfish reason. And if they had taken the rice cake, they would have bothered them non-stop. But Aaron, remembering the faces of the brothers, Wani, an innocent boy, and Ryu, a Chad, and thought they didn't look like bad people to her. Then Arin notices something about one of the two neighbors. One of them looks older, possibly above 15 years old, which means he must have killed 100 goblins to survive. The bodyguard replied that he must have, and that's why he is alive. Arin again gets a little panicked, saying how amazing Ryu is. To think someone who has gone through such a cruel and hellish experience can look so calm. Hearing this, the bodyguard laughingly replied that killing 100 goblins was not that hard, and those who didn't kill them were just idiots, but Arin knew inside that it was not easy to kill 100 goblins for normal people. 
The bodyguard did manage to do so as he was a skilled fighter and received professional training. Then she started thinking about that guy named Black Scythe. In front of him, her bodyguard looked like a kid. Black Scythe was just too overpowered, and she almost felt bad for the goblins, seeing how brutally Black Scythe killed them. Then she started to think, who would Black Scythe be in real life, and how he looked like in real life? The scene shifts, and we see one month has passed, and it's January 31st. Ryu is now in his bed, and Wani is holding his big bro's hand worriedly, saying he has to promise him that he will come back alive no matter what. Ryu smilingly replied not to worry, as he is too strong to die, even if he wanted to, and not even a god can kill him. Hearing these words, Wani was still worried. Then Ryu patted Wani's head, saying not to worry too much and to eat once Ryu's soul gets transported to another world and sleep. When Wani wakes up from his sleep, Ryu will be there standing beside him. With that, Ryu's vision became blue, and he got transported again with the rest of the people. As all the remaining survivors made their way to the dungeon, they were hit with a wave of panic. Some let out screams of pure fear, while others just looked around, trying to wrap their heads around the place that looked more like a jungle than anything else. Then, one of the girls in the group spotted Ryu and called him out as the guy who ranked number one in the last round. Ryu stood tall, soaking in the attention, and noticed whispers about him starting to spread, a good sign for the plans he had in mind. He wanted everyone to recognize who was running the show. Ryu's eyes briefly met Youngman's, but before he could dwell on that, a voice filled the area. Yep, it was another angel, and man, she was a looker. But this was a different one, and questions buzzed through the crowd about what happened to the last one. The new angel flashed a friendly smile and explained that the previous angel had gone missing for reasons unknown, and she was here to take over. Seeing her smile, the crowd's nerves started to calm. Maybe this angel wasn't going to be as much of a nightmare as the last one, they thought. But that hope was short-lived. Her smile twisted into something sinister, and with a hand delicately touching her lips, she let out a creepy laugh. She was stoked, ready for some fun after a long time. With a casual flick, she handed down the new quest. They had to pick a zone leader in three hours. Seeing this, everyone got confused, but then they noticed that all the people in this round can pass, Unlike the previous round where half of them died, the angel noticed the confused looks on the players' faces and with a smile decided to break down the quest for them. She explained that this round wasn't about fighting. Everyone could make it through just by picking a zone leader. The chosen leader would have the power to command anyone in their zone to do anything they wanted, from crawling on the ground to dropping dead. Isn't that an awesome skill? She asked, looking around at the player. As she laid out the details, a guy with green hair listened intently, and another dude, all muscles and a tattoo on his neck, seemed pretty annoyed. The angel wrapped up, saying that in three hours, she'd be back for the vote to decide the leader. The green-haired guy, a little shaky, raised his hand and asked if it was really that simple. Just vote for a leader, and they all get to live. The angel's grin went a bit wicked as she confirmed it. Just a vote, and then, bam, they'd all be back on Earth, safe and sound. Now, hearing this, everyone got happy and started to celebrate, saying this time no one is going to die. Ryu, from behind, remained with a serious face. Then the angel bid them good luck, and then she vanished, and the timer of three hours began. In the next moment, the remaining players were still happy, as no one will die today, except for Youngman. He was not. He was damn angry, and while grinding his teeth, he said he was ready to fight and kill some monsters. Seeing Youngman angry, his buddy panically said to him that just to let it go, as the angel will let them live if they just vote. So, why is Youngman complaining so much? Youngman, still angry, replied that he has used all his points to strengthen, and now he can't even beat the crap out of someone, and he is just too frustrated. Ryu watched Youngman from a distance, thinking to himself that in all his 99 lives, Youngman was always the same hothead. Ryu turned away, muttering that he'd sort out Youngman when the time was right. Then Ryu noticed everyone's discussion about whom to vote for and what to do, but Ryu said that is not important to him. Then, while walking toward the forest, he continued, saying he has an even more important thing to do, which is selecting a class, the class of a grim reaper, the god of death. And in order to do that, he has to reach level 10 in three hours. Just then, a goblin sporting a red hoodie appeared. Ryu's grip on his dagger tightened. He taunted the goblin, daring it to come closer. The goblin charged, and Ryu, with an emotionless face, 
cut through its neck as easily as a hot knife through butter, then the system notified that he gained experience points with 15 gold, and all his stats increased by 1% because of the ruin of slaughter. Now, standing beside the fallen goblin, Ryu knew what he had to do. He had three hours to reach level 10 and choose his class. That was the only way his plan would work out. As another gang of goblins neared, Ryu readied his dagger. He couldn't help but smile, seeing the goblins approach like a kid waiting for a slice of delicious cake. And the next moment, Ryu started the one-sided slaughter of the goblin. Then, after an hour of bullying the goblin, Ryu wiped the blood off his face and checked the time. One hour down, he muttered to himself and flicked open his status window. He was surprised to see he had hit level 9 and racked up 8 stat points already, way quicker than he'd expected. Without a second thought, he chucked all his points into agility. Given his base stats were pretty much rubbish, and after living for 99 lives, his battle sense became so sharp that his body moves on its own during battle. To support his body, he needs agility. That's when Ryu noticed something and turned back with a serious look. Someone had been following him for a long time while he was caught up in the fight. Normally, he wouldn't bother with distractions since he was so focused on battling, but this was new. This hadn't happened in his lives, so he figured he better check it out. Then, with a serious look, pointing his bloody dagger toward the bush, Ryu said that he didn't know who they were, but now they had to show themselves. If they didn't come out, they better prepare for a painful death. As Ryu finished his sentence, a beautiful woman with messy brown hair panickedly came, both her arms raised up, saying she was here. Seeing her, Ryu realized she was none other than the actress he had met on the first floor, the one who's his little brother is a fan of, and Ryu started thinking why she was following him. Ahren was just about to apologize and explain why she was following Ryu when suddenly someone else jumped into the conversation. It was a familiar figure, and it turned out to be that rude bodyguard from before. He quickly chimed in, apologizing, and making it clear they hadn't been tailing Ryu for any bad reasons. He just wanted Ryu to take it easy. Ryu caught a glimpse of the bodyguard's nickname, Sang Cheol, and his reaction was immediate. His eyes went wide as he recognized the name. Sang Cheol was the trusted right-hand man of Gyunrok, the eldest son of Korea's largest corporation, who is also known by the fearsome nickname Heavenly Demon. He is one of the people Ryu wants to recruit into his team, along with a priest who was rumored to have the power to bring the dead back to life. Ryu hadn't expected to bump into Gyonrok's right-hand man so soon, and it made him wonder why such a guy would be protecting Aaron. Then, it hit him. The priest might just be this skinny, innocent-looking girl right in front of him. Keeping his cool, Ryu's voice dropped as he asked them straight up why they were following him. They admitted they had been on his trail since he first set foot in the forest. Aaron seemed a bit nervous as she explained, saying she had a proposition for him. With a hopeful smile, she said she wanted to team up with Ryu and asked if they could join forces. Hearing this, Ryu smiled and replied that joining forces means both parties are helping each other. Aaron shakily replied that it's true, and Ryu replied he doesn't see how they can be any help to him, so he doesn't want to join forces with them. With a rude tone, he continued that they should go and stop wasting his time with this nonsense and go back. With that, Ryu turned back, saying he doesn't have any desire to form a team, and started going deeper into the forest. Well, it was his way to get revenge from the bodyguard. Then, as Ryu left, the bodyguard was really annoyed, saying Ryu was really arrogant, but Aaron... She just collapsed to her knees, wiped out, mumbling about how Ryu's vibe was intense, like he could take a bite out of her at any second. Then she continued, saying she really wanted to be on the same team as Ryu from the first time she saw him fight, but it didn't work out well. The bodyguard, still annoyed, said he already told Aaron that strong people like him always have big egos, and they like to act alone, and they hate to work on a team. Now standing beside the goblin corpses, they thought about what to do in the remaining time before the vote, and they decided to hunt some goblins like Ryu to level up. Then, as they started to go deep inside the forest, we see someone following them from the bushes. Then the scene shifts, and we see Ryu mercilessly continuing to kill the goblins while the goblins try to run for their lives. After killing goblins for an hour, a group of gnolls approached Ryu, and seeing them, Ryu gave a big, bright smile, saying, Looks like something delicious came on its own. Then, as the group of wolfmen attacked Ryu all at once, Ryu, with a single swing, slaughtered them like vegetables, and their torn body parts fell from the sky like rain. With that, Ryu finally reached level 10. The system notified Ryu that as he reached level 10, he could access the shop. Then, a hidden quest appeared. 
to change class before the voting begins. If Ryu changed his class today, he would get a 50% discount on today's items in the shop. Ryu explained that everyone could choose what class they wanted after reaching level 10, but no one knew how to choose a class. For a warrior, one had to kill 30 monsters in under one hour, and one could become a berserker after battling monsters for one hour while constantly bleeding, and so on. And after continuously grinding for God knows how much time, Ryu gathered this knowledge. After that, Ryu held the angel's special juice in his hand. He started to absorb it, and a bright yellow light surrounded Ryu. The system notified Ryu that he had changed his class to Grim Reaper, and he got three unique ability. First, when he is wielding a scythe, his attack increased by two. Second, when he is fighting at night, his speed will increase by 50%. And lastly, at night, all his senses will increase greatly. But it was not enough, so the system gave Ryu a Grim Reaper Scythe to change his class, making him the first in the entire world. Then the system notified Ryu that he had reached the apprentice rank from beginner rank. Ryu explained that there are six ranks in total, starting with beginner, then apprentice, then regular, then expert, then master, then grandmaster. And with each rank comes a unique skill related to the class. As Ryu reached the apprentice rank, he acquired the skill Seal of Death. Using this, he can cast a seal on a target and deal double the damage. After merging it with the 2x damage of his weapon, the Grim Reaper Scythe, he can inflict 4x damage. He also gained the skill Tracking, which enables him to find anyone's location as long as he remembers that person's face or nickname. Oh boy, I wish I had this skill to track my crush. Now fully equipped, the first person Ryu thought to use his skill on was Youngmin. He used his skill to track him, and the system notified him that Youngmin was 190 meters away, with an arrow indicating the direction. So Ryu started to follow the arrow with an amused smile. The scene changes, and we see a tired Aran struggling to stay on her feet. She collapses to the ground, and when she tries to stand up, her whole body shakes. She's hurting bad and tells her bodyguard she can't run anymore. The bodyguard, who's hurt himself and freaking out, helps her to her feet. She's standing there saying the arrow wounds are killing her. The bodyguard, still scared, throws out a guess, saying maybe if they can just last this one hour without dying, their real bodies won't be hurt. But before Aaron can reply, they hear a voice that makes them freeze. It's Youngman and his crew. Youngman's grinning like he's got the upper hand, telling them they're not getting away today. The bodyguard looks like he's ready to give up, thinking he can't die over this damn woman. He gets his dagger ready, though, because it looks like there's no choice left but to fight. Youngman sees the dagger and calls the bodyguard, an old man, asking if he really wants to go at it with them. He then points behind him, showing off how many buddies he's got, and asking the bodyguard if he's blind not to see them all. The bodyguard yells out, full of anger, wanting to know why Youngman's doing this and what he's gonna get from it. Youngman just smiles that creepy smile and says he's gonna get something really good, leaving them both shocked. Youngman continues, saying that he will take the woman behind him. As he's not interested in men, he can leave, and he won't do anything to the bodyguard. Youngman only wants that woman who looks like Aaron, the actress. Then, Youngman's buddies, eyeing the woman who looks just like Aaron, didn't care whether she was the real deal or not. In this world, where they can feel pain, they figured they could also feel pleasure, so they wanted to have some fun with Aaron. Hearing this, Aaron was struck with fear. Then Youngman tried to make a deal with the bodyguard, saying if he handed over Aaron, he could walk away without a scratch, and they'd return Aaron unharmed after they had their fun. That way, everyone's happy, he said. The bodyguard was torn. If he'd known they were after Aaron from the get-go, he would have ditched her and saved his own skin. He was in this for the money, after all, and his life was worth more than any job. But the fear of the heavenly demon being angry if he failed his duty to protect her made up his mind. He squared up, ready to throw down. Seeing this, Youngman got a kick out of the old man gearing up for a fight. The bodyguard tried to reason, saying that what they were planning was a crime, but Youngman just laughed it off. Who's gonna punish us? He jeered. No one knows what we really look like or who we are in real life. With their backs against the wall, the bodyguard and Aaron braced themselves, trying to figure out their next move. Then, out of nowhere, someone else shows up, and it's none other than the god of death, Ryu, just chilling under a tree, watching the whole showdown unfold. Young men saw Ryu, and panic flickered across his face, wondering what he was doing there. Then Ryu asked Aaron what they were doing there. 
but before they could answer, Youngman tried to tell Ryu with his same attitude to mind his own business. Ryu cut him off midway, asking, Did I ask you? The bodyguard hurriedly told Ryu everything, how Youngman attacked them, and that they wanted to have some fun with Arin. Hearing this, Ryu glared at Youngman and asked if this was true. Youngman, with his rude attitude, replied that whether it's true or not, Ryu should just mind his own business. Ryu had had enough of Youngman's nonsense. With a deep voice, Ryu said whether it's his business or not is none of Youngman's business, and he should mind his own business. With that, he summoned his red, bloody scythe with a terrifying aura, shocking everyone. Now, with one hand in his pocket and the other gripping his sizable scythe, emitting a bloody red aura, Ryu spoke in a deep voice. He made it clear that he wouldn't let Youngman go unscathed, especially when he knew Youngman's intent to harm someone. Aaron and her bodyguard were left speechless, standing behind Ryu. Youngman, grinding his teeth, witnessed Ryu coming to Aaron's aid. Aaron and her bodyguard expressed their gratitude to Ryu for saving them. However, Ryu didn't play the hero out of the goodness of his heart. He had his motives. Turning back, he explained that by saving Heavenly Demon's right-hand man, they would be indebted to him. This, Ryu believed, could help him achieve his future plans. Plus, he already had plans to take care of Youngman, making it like killing two birds with one stone. As Ryu slowly approached Youngman, the latter grew scared. With a shaky voice, Youngman hesitatedly warned Ryu not to come closer, threatening to kill him. Noticing a scared look on Youngman's face, Ryu, with a sly smile, teasingly asked if Youngman didn't want to throw down, mentioning he was itching to test his powers. So guys, today's like goal is 3,000 likes. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. Now let's continue. Youngman, annoyed and scared, wondered who in their right mind would try to pick a fight with Ryu, the one who slaughtered goblins like vegetables and ranked first in all the regions. Before Youngman could say anything, a realization struck him. However, Ryu broke the silence suggesting that if Youngman was scared and didn't want to fight, there was one thing he could do. Youngman, confused, asked what, and Ryu, arms crossed and a smirk on his face, replied that he should get down on his knees, beg for mercy, and bark like a dog. Only then would Ryu consider letting him go. Youngman, bewildered, thought Ryu wanted to humiliate him in front of everyone. Turning back to glare at his buddies, he realized he couldn't do this. He couldn't beg in front of them. Now, Youngman was really pissed, seeing Ryu's smiling face. Although he wanted to avoid fighting Ryu at all costs, for some reason, just looking at Ryu made him increasingly furious. Then, he got an idea. Recognizing that he was no longer his previous self, he remembered how he punched the wall and destroyed it, showcasing his superhuman strength. Youngman, thinking he could land a punch on Ryu if he try and then mercilessly kill him, then he started to laugh arrogantly addressing Ryu as a bastard. He prepared his fist to strike Ryu, leaving his buddies wondering what was about to happen. Now Youngman slowly approached Ryu while stretching his arms, saying Ryu shouldn't have messed with him, and now Ryu will die because of his arrogance. Then we see Youngman getting happy with a sweet face, thinking he is slowly coming toward Ryu, and just like this, he will land a punch to Ryu's face, and then he will make Ryu's face his punching bag. Then suddenly the red scythe from Ryu's hand disappeared, startling everyone. Again, with a confident look, Ryu explained that as young men is fighting barehanded, so he will also fight without any weapon, as people might think Ryu is bullying the weak, and the fight will be no fun. Now hearing this, young men got really, really pissed off. But Ryu had enough of Youngman's nonsense, and in an instant, he dashed toward Youngman, startling him. Then Youngman prepared his punch, saying Ryu is an overconfident bastard as he stored his weapon, and now is dashing toward him like a sitting duck, and because of that, he will die. With great force, he swung his punch toward Ryu's face, but Ryu dodged it effortlessly, and in return, gave a devastating kick onto Youngman's stomach. Youngman flew backward, heavily injured. Now Youngman was in immense pain, lying on the ground, holding his hand, groaning and trembling. However, he didn't stop cursing Ryu. At this point, Ryu had had enough of Youngman's cursing. Before Youngman could do something, Ryu kicked Youngman's face, stating that he had heard more than enough cursing, and his ear would rot if he hears more. But Ryu didn't stop there. Before Youngman could stand and think about what to do, Ryu grabbed Youngman from his collar and started punching Youngman's face like a punching bag. Now, Youngman was in too much pain, feeling like he would die from the pain. He wondered how the hell his fist could hurt this bad. It was like being beaten by a hammer. At that moment, Youngman realized Ryu's fists were as strong as his, and on top of that, Ryu was also lightning fast. Just then, Ryu prepared his heavy punch, and bam, Youngman was done for. 
His vision was getting blurry, and his buddies prepared their bows and weapons toward Ryu, launching an arrow toward Ryu's head. Seeing this, Aaron shouted in panic, warning Ryu to dodge it. However, Ryu, being the god of death, couldn't die with this lousy arrow, and he swiftly dodged it. Seeing this, the bow guy panicked, but before he could prepare another arrow, Ryu, with his lightning-fast speed, dashed toward the bow guy. Although the bow guy launched his arrow, it didn't hit Ryu, and in an instant, Ryu came behind him, shocking him. Ryu expressed his admiration for how skilled the bow guy was with his bow. Then, with a swing, Ryu mercilessly ripped the bow guy's hand, and he started to scream intensely. Seeing this, the dagger guy and the bald guy, although scared, also started cursing Ryu. With that, they rushed toward Ryu with their daggers. However, Ryu, with a gleeful smile, used his skill, Seal of Death, and a red eye with a skull appeared on the bald guy's head, increasing his damage by 2x. With his scythe, his attack increased by 2, and with a single swing, he chopped off the bald guy's both legs. The bald guy fell to the ground in agony, screaming and groaning, seeing this. The dagger guy was just too scared, he felt like he would pee in his pants. Then, Ryu dashed toward the dagger guy, with a serious face stating that as they were holding weapons trying to kill someone, they must also be prepared to be killed by someone with a weapon. Again, with a single swing like cutting a carrot, he chopped off the dagger guy's hands, leaving him in unimaginable pain with a terrified look on his face. Meanwhile, Ryu was satisfied, seeing that by using Seal of Death and adding it with his scythe, 2x damage was enough to penetrate the armor. Now, the bow guy, the bald guy, and the dagger guy all were lying on the ground, screaming and crying in pain while trembling. Seeing them, Ryu thought it was not enough for him, so he once again slowly started to walk toward them. Then, we see Ryu had slowly made multiple deep cuts on their bodies, slowly torturing them. At that moment, the pain was so intense that they started to beg Ryu to just kill them, as dying was more bearable than this hellish torture. But Ryu didn't stop there, and with a swing, he separated the blood from his scythe, saying to stop crying like a baby as he wasn't going to kill them. Now, Seeing how terrified the trio was, Ryu's job was done. He didn't intend to kill them from the start. He just wanted to show them what might happen if they messed with him, as he had future plans for Youngman and his crew. Turning back towards Youngman, who cowered behind a tree with a swollen face and a bloody nose, Ryu declared that hiding was useless. Not even a god could save him now. With a swift swing of his scythe, Ryu chopped off Youngman's right hand, causing blood to spatter like a fountain. Youngman, left in unimaginable pain, wore a horrified expression. Ryu, coldly observing the scene, reminded Youngman not to be a crybaby. Compared to the pain they inflicted on him, it wasn't even close. Another ruthless swing of the scythe severed Youngman's other hand. But Ryu's brutality didn't end there. Ryu began to mercilessly torture Youngman, shocking even the bodyguard. Seeing this, the bodyguard was too shocked, his eyes wide open, not knowing what to do. He thought Ryu was just too ruthless, as he couldn't believe how mercilessly Ryu chopped their body parts like it was nothing. Even when they lost the will to fight, Ryu continued torturing them until they begged for death. Then continued saying others might feel he is too ruthless, but he liked this type of people. As Ryu was chopping off Youngman's other leg, the bodyguard was in awe, seeing the ruthless Ryu. He was in love. The bodyguard was still lost in his daydream, when Ryu's voice abruptly woke him up. After the brutal torture session had concluded, Ryu strolled casually toward Ahrin and the bodyguard, inquiring if they were okay. They responded with a bit of panic, expressing their gratitude to Ryu. Pointing his thumb nonchalantly towards the incapacitated young men and his crew, Ryu remarked that they didn't need to worry about them. They were in a condition where they couldn't even masturbate. Aaron and her bodyguard bowed their heads once again, thanking Ryu for his intervention. Curious, Aaron asked what would happen if Youngman and his men died due to excessive bleeding. Ryu bluntly stated that if they died, they die, comparing them to wind beasts. Observing Ahren's compassionate nature, Ryu realized she might struggle in this harsh world. However, the bodyguard interrupted Ryu's thoughts, questioning why he let Youngman and his men live. He argued that killing enemies was better to prevent potential future problems. Hearing this, Youngman grew terrified, but Ryu, with a knowing smile, found the bodyguard intriguing, as he knows exactly what type of world it is turning into, and only these types of people will survive longer in the future. Then, Ryu said the reason he didn't kill those guys was simple. 
Killing them would not bring any benefit to him. The bodyguard was a bit confused and asked if they might seek revenge in the future if left alive. Ryu glaring at them, who were so terrified that if Ryu even clapped his hands, they might shit their pants. Ryu, with a smile on his face, asked the bodyguard does he think these guys had the will to take revenge, and if they wanted to, he was ready for a round two of torture. Then... Ryu elaborated further, explaining that mindlessly killing people would decrease the player population. Hearing Ryu's explanation, the bodyguard had a moment of realization. He grasped what Ryu meant. Fewer survivors in each round meant fewer available spots for people to pass. In that moment, the bodyguard's admiration for Ryu deepened. He saw Ryu not only as strong, but also incredibly smart, finding him downright amazing. Understanding the situation, the bodyguard sighed, declaring that he wouldn't pay attention to these useless trash. Once again, he thanked Ryu for his assistance, but then the bodyguard stopped Ryu, asking if Ryu could tell his real name or even his bank account name so that he could compensate him. Ryu didn't stop, and with a cold voice said, No need. And just like that, he vanished into the deep forest. Now the bodyguard was left wondering. Ryu had just helped them and didn't even ask for anything in return. He would have to report this to the heavenly demon. However, a groaning voice interrupted his thoughts. As he turned back, it was young men crying in pain. Seeing them, the bodyguard was too eager to kill them. But as Ryu told them not to, he somehow managed to control his anger. Then he spit on young men's face, saying, Disgusting, and they left. Then... The scene shifts, and we see all the players arguing about whom to vote for. They started fighting among themselves, creating a chaotic situation. Suddenly, a voice cuts through the chaos, and it's the green-haired guy. With a serious tone, he stated that only two hours were left, and fighting wouldn't bring any good to them. Hearing this, other players asked what they should do and if he had any solution. The green-haired guy confidently said he indeed had a plan, shocking everyone. With a smirking face, he thought that people are just too foolish easily falling for his skill. We see all the players with hypnotic eyes following the green-haired guy, who gave an evil smile. Then we go back to the past to see what this green-haired guy's ability is. His unique skill is named Rune of Persuasion, and using this, when he talks to someone, there are high chances that they will obey his words. Initially, when he got this ability, he was angry, thinking about how he could fight using this seemingly useless skill. However, to test it, he saw a woman struggling to fight three goblins, he started shouting that the woman was in grave danger and that they should help her. As soon as the other players heard his words, they started running toward the woman to save her. He realized how deadly his skill was. Just by communicating with someone, he could manipulate their minds to do whatever he wanted. Now the task of becoming the zone leader was a piece of cake for him using this skill. Then the green-haired guy said they first have to decide on some candidates so they can narrow down whom to vote for, and they will select five candidates. Hearing this, the players said it's not a bad idea, and they don't think they have any better idea than this. Now, the green-haired guy started to laugh, thinking his plan is going smoothly. The crowd was in deep thought about which five people to choose, and the green-haired guy was seeing this, enjoying the show as he knew he would be there as one of the three candidates. Now the players started to see him as a reliable guy. Just as he thought, someone from the crowd said he wanted the green-haired guy to be one of the five candidates. And following him, others also started saying yes. When all the players were fighting, not knowing what to do, he was the one who guided them, so he could become a good leader. Hearing this, the green-haired guy tried to act like he didn't expect anyone would have said his name, saying he is not capable enough to be a leader. But all the players started to praise him, saying he has the qualities of a leader. From inside, the green-haired guy was just too happy, thinking about how foolish all these players are, easily getting manipulated. Then he said if all the players are saying so, although he didn't want to, he will become one of the candidates. The remaining four candidates went like this. They selected Black Scythe, who was ranked first. Then a guy named Life is a documentary, who was ranked second. Then, the green-haired guy said, as all the candidates were selected, now he will start with a warm and kind smile. He said that if he becomes the zone leader, but before he could finish his sentence, life is a documentary intervened, saying this is all bullshit. As the green-haired guy turned back, he saw a muscular guy with a tattoo on his neck cleaning his ear with his pinky finger. His name was Life is a Documentary, the second-ranked guy in the zone. With an angry face, he said he can't listen to his bullshit anymore. Hearing this, the green-haired guy, 
with a serious face, started to say that his use of words was too harsh and people like him would not become good leaders. But Life the Documentary got furious, saying he is not here to listen to a lecture, especially not from a weak, pathetic guy like him who looks like he still drinks his mommy's milk. Now hearing this, the green-haired guy got a little angry, but he was also shocked, thinking if his skill was not working on him. And if that's the case, then that means his level is higher than his. Life is a Documentary started to threaten the players, saying if they don't vote for him, he will kill everyone. Now hearing this, the green-haired guy laughingly started to lecture him again, saying, does he really think people will listen to him if he threatens them and chooses him as the leader? But before he could finish his sentence, life is a documentary's blood was boiling in anger. Suddenly, in a slash, he slashed the green-haired guy's neck and blood splashed everywhere. At first, the green-haired guy didn't realize what happened, but then, holding his neck in immense pain, he was trying to say something, but words were not coming from his mouth. And just like that, the green-haired guy died. Now, life is a documentary, blood on his back and clothes and with a serious expression, said he doesn't like when someone lectures him, and if they don't vote for him, they'll also die like this piece of shit. Seeing this, all the players started shouting and panicking, saying he killed the green-haired guy and he is a psycho. Hearing this, life is a documentary pointed his bloody dagger toward the players and with a deadly look said, so what if he killed him? And if someone has any issue, he can come forward and he will treat him very well. The people who got manipulated by the green-haired guy, still a little hypnotic, started saying, life is a documentary is a psycho and they will never vote for him. Now hearing this, he let out an evil smile. In a flash, he dashed toward them and started slaughtering them. After a while, his whole face and clothes got covered in blood, and he was very happy and excited, killing people without worrying about the corpse. The thought that he can kill as much as people without anyone stopping or arresting him excited him even more. Then he started to laugh with a wide smile and a bloodthirsty look, thinking, now with that, everyone will vote for him. Once he becomes the zone leader, the first thing he will do is kill that arrogant bastard Black Scythe. Meanwhile, Ryu was just chilling and killing some goblins, leveling up to level 16. Now he was a bit disappointed because when he reached level 16, even after killing 200 monsters, he didn't level up at all, as the level of monsters is not higher than 10, so the experience is too low to level up anymore. But then, the three hours passed, and a yellow light covered Ryu's entire body. In the next scene, we see everyone slowly getting transported to a different place. Some players were dead, while some were scared, and some were heavily injured. Seeing these horrible scenes, the bodyguard and Aaron were shocked and speechless, wondering what the hell just happened here, and why there are so many dead and injured people. Meanwhile, Rao from behind, seeing this, thought just like always, life as a documentary took the leadership role again by killing and threatening people. Seeing life as a documentary, Ryu himself admitted that he is a natural-born fighter and is very strong, but his personality was that of a psycho. He continued, seeing his bloody face, that it's a good idea to get rid of a time bomb like him. But then he said it's not the right time to do so. Life is a documentary called Ryu arrogantly, saying he was waiting for him. Ryu asked what he wants, and Life is a documentary said not much. With an arrogant smile, he said he wants Ryu to become his underling and work for him. Hearing this, Ryu gave a neutral expression, asking why he should work under him. Life is a documentary, confidently spinning his dagger, said it's because if Ryu doesn't work under him, he will kill him. Hearing this, Ryu gave a little chuckle, startling him. Then, with a serious face, he said, So life is a documentary wants to fight with Ryu. Ryu chuckled a little and said, now that he is in a good mood, If life is a documentary gets on his knees and begs for mercy, Ryu might let it slide. Whatever he said, the muscle head got a little confused, saying he is the one who is going to kill Ryu, so why should he beg for mercy? He started to threaten Ryu again, but Ryu had enough of this cutting him midway and asking if life is a documentary doesn't understand Korean. With a terrifying red aura, Ryu summoned his black scythe and said he thinks once he chops off one or two of his limbs, then he will understand what he is saying. Seeing Ryu and his terrifying aura, the muscle head got scared and panicked, realizing he messed up with the wrong guy. Ryu, on the other hand, tauntingly asked the muscle head why he's not answering or if he forgot how to talk. Hearing this, the muscle head gritted his teeth and introduced himself as the gang leader of Jungsik. Shouting, he said he's not scared because of some toy Ryu was holding and that he's ready for a fight. Ryu, with a small smile, explained that he's brave for sure. 
but he can't kill him here. He wants the Musclehead to become the zone leader because he plans to use him in the third round. As the Musclehead was ready to attack with a sparkling sound, the angel appeared from the sky. Ryu said the Musclehead is lucky, turned back, and advised him to pick his opponents carefully next time if he wants to live a longer life. With that, he took back his scythe and left the insulted Musclehead behind. Feeling a bit relieved, the Musclehead explained that the pressure from Ryu was too enormous. He felt like he could just die from fear. Then, grinding his teeth in anger, he vowed that once he becomes the zone leader, he will kill Ryu mercilessly, slowly torturing him. Now the angel noticed that the humans killed each other and died, but said it's none of her business. With a flick of her finger, she started the voting quest. The timer started at five minutes, and they could vote for whoever they wanted by looking at the person for a while. They had to say the word vote in their minds, and whoever didn't vote in this five minutes would die. As soon as the timer started, the muscle head stood proudly, thinking about what he would do once he became the zone leader. However, his pride took a hit when he noticed a girl not looking toward him. He threatened her, saying he would kill her if she voted for anyone else. She retorted, saying she already voted for him and didn't want to stare at some muscle head with blood on his face. The muscle head, true to form, shouted that anyone not looking at him would die. When the five minutes were over, the angel with a kind smile announced that it was time to reveal the results. A big screen appeared with the names, and although the muscle head was in the first rank, he only won by a few hundred votes. Ryu, on the other hand, got a whopping 2077 votes. Furious, the muscle head started searching for people who didn't vote for him. However, the angel announced that Life as a Documentary was ranked number one, making him the zone leader. With a clap, the angel handed over the position to the muscle head, who smirked, thinking that a little longer, and he would make Ryu regret. But before he could dwell on it, something caught his attention. Checking his skill window, he noticed that he could only command 10 people in total, and it was a one-time use skill. After he used it on 10 people to follow his command, he would no longer be able to use this skill, and it wouldn't work on players with classes. This revelation left him devastated. The angel, with a mischievous smile, continued, saying the round was not over yet. There was a hidden quest, and hearing this, everyone started to panic. Then, a quest window popped up, explaining that they could obtain a class after acquiring a class-related item, leaving everyone confused about what this meant. The angel then explained that they would have completed this quest if they had reached level 10 before the vote began. Hearing this, a man scratching his head asked how he could kill monsters when there were no monsters around. The angel's facial expression became a little intense and angry as she said, there were monsters everywhere. It's just that they were too lazy and scared to find them. The angel continued, revealing that a total of 80,000 people worldwide had acquired a class in the second round before the vote. She also mentioned that someone from their zone had achieved this feat. Everyone was shocked and asked who it was. With a flicker of her hand, the angel displayed a big system window with all the information. There, Ryu was ranked one in the entire world and was the first to acquire a class followed by Heavenly Demon. As everyone stared in amazement, not only did Ryu get a class, but he was the first in the world to do so. On top of that, his class name was Grim Reaper, the God of Death. While whispers circulated about Ryu, he stood casually with his hands in his pockets, just chilling. Now, upon seeing the words, Grim Reaper, the God of Death, everyone was shocked and began gossiping about what kind of class that could be. Some commented that just the name itself sounded incredibly powerful, and they wondered if that's why Ryu was wielding that massive scythe. Amidst the gossip, the muscle head was getting annoyed because his plan was to use his zone leader skill to control Ryu and beat him into a pulp. But who would have known that Ryu had obtained a class from who knows where? So guys, today we have 4,500 likes. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. Now, let's continue. The angel explained that this ranking was based on who changed their class first. When the angel saw the system window and noticed that Ryu was not only the first in her zone to change his class, but also the first in the entire world, she praised him. Ryu had obtained his class in only 39 minutes and 42 seconds, which was remarkable. The angel mentioned that the Grim Reaper class was a hidden class, and only one person in the entire world could obtain it. After that, the class would disappear. Interestingly, Ryu's name, Black Scythe, 
matched perfectly with his class. With a mischievous smile, the angel even asked if Ryu could see the future or something like that, implying that his name matched his class too perfectly. Ryu, ever cool and composed with a neutral face, explained that he didn't know anything about it and that obtaining the Grim Reaper class was purely coincidental. As they continued their conversation, the other players noticed that the angel was not talking rudely to Ryu, unlike her usual demeanor. Ryu smiled to himself, realizing that this angel was unaware of the process by which he obtained the Grim Reaper class. She only knew he was a Grim Reaper, and Grim Reapers were the natural enemies of the angel. Now, upon hearing Ryu's answer, the angel slowly placed her hand on her lips, showing interest. Her expression took on a somewhat naughty look, as she couldn't believe someone from her zone had acquired a class. This meant that Ryu would be the only one unaffected by the zone leader's skill. Hearing this, all the players got a little confused and began asking what she meant. The angel decided to explain everything related to this with a warm smile. She clarified that the zone leader's skill, authority, would not work on people who had obtained a class. This meant that the muscle head would not be able to command Ryu. She also added that she forgot to mention the most important information. The zone leader could only use their skill on 10 people, and it was a one-time use skill, not an unlimited one. After hearing this information, a chilling silence fell among the players. Meanwhile, the musclehead was greatly annoyed and he cursed the angel, wondering why she had revealed this to everyone. He even muttered, Is she a bitch? The angel responded by saying that the fastest player to receive a class should receive a deserving reward. With a flick of her finger, she granted Ryu two rewards. The first was a low-rank armor selection coupon, and the second was a mysterious chest. Ryu wasted no time and immediately opened the armor selection. In front of Ryu, three different armors appeared. A plate armor, a leather armor, and a mage's robe. Without hesitation, Ryu selected the leather armor, as it would provide some durability without hindering his agility. Next, Ryu opened the mysterious chest, revealing three options, 3x experience boost for the round, 3,000 gold, and some information related to round three. Ryu contemplated his choices, considering that in round three, monsters would rain from the sky. Therefore, he decided that the 3x experience boost would be the best choice to help him level up. The angel announced that the round had ended, and they would reconvene for round three next month. As everyone slowly began to vanish in a bright yellow light, the angel's tone turned creepy as she expressed her anticipation for the next round and the expressions on their faces. With that, the round came to a close, and the system notified that a total of 873,500,205 people had survived this round. In the next moment, we see Youngman panicking, waking up with heavy breathing and drenched in sweat. He first checked his trembling hand, which seemed to be fine, and then his other hand and legs, confirming that they were all intact. This gave him some relief, realizing that as long as he didn't die in that world, no harm would be caused to his real body. With a serious expression, he vowed that in the future, even if God asked him to act rudely in front of Ryu, he would not behave that way again. He didn't want to experience the pain and fear he had felt today ever again. The scene shifts, and we see the bodyguard trying to comfort Aaron, who is sitting on her sofa while holding a cup of coffee. She's once again terrified because of what happened, but mentions that this time, she didn't do anything. It was all thanks to the bodyguard and Ryu that she was safe. Despite her fear, she smiles and expresses her deep gratitude to the bodyguard, thanking him from the bottom of her heart. The bodyguard, a bit hesitant and shy, replies that he's just doing his duty, which is to guard her body, so it's not a big deal. Aaron's expression turns a little sad. She really wanted to express her gratitude to Black Scythe from the bottom of her ass from the bottom of her heart, and asked if there was any way to do that. The bodyguard explains that since they don't know Black Scythe's real name or what he looks like, there's no way to find him. He adds that he thinks Black Scythe doesn't want his real identity revealed, as he even refused to share his bank account number, which could have led to discovering his true identity. Hearing this, Aaron becomes genuinely sad, realizing there's not much they can do, even though she desperately wants to meet him. The bodyguard suggests an idea. If Aaron really wants to show her appreciation to Black Scythe, she could consider giving him a meaningful present when they meet in the third round. Aaron agrees that it sounds like a good plan and promises to think of something that Black Scythe will definitely like. The bodyguard advised Aaron to eat, get some rest, and relax, assuring her that he would see her the next morning. With that, 
he left her place. As he was about to step into the elevator, his phone rang, and to his surprise, it was none other than the heavenly demon on the line. The bodyguard congratulated the heavenly demon on obtaining the Dark Knight class. The heavenly demon downplayed it, asking about how the bodyguard and Aaron were doing. The bodyguard, a bit hesitantly, explained that due to an unfortunate incident, he and Aaron had only managed to reach level 8. Fortunately, no one had suffered serious injuries. Upon hearing this, the heavenly demon's tone became more serious. The bodyguard, while heading towards his car, mentioned that he was on his way to meet the heavenly demon and would provide a detailed report in person, as it was a long story. In a deep voice, the heavenly demon inquired if it was related to Black Scythe, to which the bodyguard affirmed. The heavenly demon instructed the bodyguard to come to his hotel, expressing a strong desire to hear every detail related to Black Scythe. As the bodyguard entered his car, someone was observing him from a distance, and that someone was none other than Ryu. Rewinding time by ten minutes, we find Ryu waking up from the dungeon, with Wani sound asleep beside him. Ryu wasted no time and immediately activated his tracking skill, anticipating that the first thing the bodyguard would do was report everything to the heavenly demon. Ryu prepared himself to follow the bodyguard's trail, taking advantage of Wani's deep slumber. Returning to the present, Ryu sported a satisfied smile, knowing that his hunch had been correct as the bodyguard was indeed heading straight to the heavenly demon. The scene shifts to a dimly lit night under the full moon, where the heavenly demon stands on his balcony gazing at the city below. He's enjoying the peaceful moment and remarks that nights like this are perfect for work. With that thought, he turns away, knowing that he will soon receive a report about Black Scythe and then get to work. After a while, he sits down on his sofa, waiting for the bodyguard to arrive. He can't help but wonder about this mysterious figure, Black Scythe, who holds the number one ranking in the entire world. Anxious thoughts occupy his mind, and he begins tapping his fingers on the table, contemplating whether Black Scythe had attacked the bodyguard and Aaron. In the midst of his anxiety, he slowly raises his hand and declares that if Black Scythe dared to harm his people, he wouldn't let him go unpunished, no matter his world ranking. At this moment, we finally get a glimpse of the heavenly demon's face. He sits with a dead serious expression, clad in a black suit, holding a glass of wine in one hand, the other on his cheek, and his legs elegantly crossed. He means business and won't take any threats lightly, even from the top-ranked player in the world. Then, as he was thinking about what he would do to Rue, the bodyguard finally arrived at his place and started knocking on his door. They greeted each other, and then the bodyguard, again with a smiling face, congratulated the heavenly demon for getting a unique class as well as surviving the round. The heavenly demon sat on his sofa and, while drinking his wine, said the second round was easy as a piece of cake. He obtained the unique class as he was lucky and he is nothing special. The bodyguard said that luck is also a skill. Plus, getting second in the whole of Korea is not something that luck can achieve, and it's an honor that he is working with someone like the Heavenly Demon. While the Heavenly Demon was hearing all the praises with a little smile, sipping the wine and glaring at the bodyguard, he placed his wine on the table and said that the bodyguard must want something from him. That's why he is flattering him so much. While the bodyguard was silent, then with a gentle smile, the heavenly demon asked while nodding his head, saying he can ask anything if he wants to, and not to be scared. It's not like he will eat him or something. The bodyguard hesitantly asked if the heavenly demon could tell how or from where he obtained his class. The heavenly demon, with a smile waving his hand, said it was nothing special, as he was just killing some monsters. And suddenly the system notified him that he obtained a class. That's all. Now let's take a closer look at the heavenly demon, grinning mischievously. He's got a little secret up his sleeve. You see, it's not because he battled some monsters that he landed himself a new class. Nope, he was just plain lucky. When that angel handed out unique classes to everyone, he didn't score any regular old skills. Instead, he got his hands on a nifty item that lets him switch classes. All he needs to do is reach level 10 and bam, he'll automatically become a Dark Knight. So when he bragged about his class, he wasn't fibbing. Luck was on his side big time. But here's the kicker. He can't spill the beans about this vital piece of info to just anyone, not even his closest comrade. You see, people can change their tune at the drop of a hat, and he's not about to trust anyone but himself. He's playing his cards close to his chest. Now our heavenly demon gets down to business, his tone serious as a heart attack. He's eager to hear how they got banged up during the second round. His eyes turn icy as he asks, 
Was it Black Scythe? It's a chilling look, let me tell you. The bodyguard, quick on his feet, reassures him it wasn't Black Scythe who did the damage. In fact, he was their savior in this mess. The heavenly demon raises an eyebrow, surprised for a moment. He wants the full scoop, every last detail. So the bodyguard spills the beans, telling the whole tale of what went down. And then he drops a concern bomb. He's worried that Aaron might have taken a hit mentally from all of this. The heavenly demon sat there, deep in thought. His fingers were all twisted up, showing just how close he came to losing his trusted subordinate and nearly losing Aaron. It was a real serious situation. He picked up his glass of wine from the table, taking a sip, and then he asked about the fate of the guys who tried to off his bodyguard. He wondered if Black Scythe had given them a painful end. The bodyguard spilled the beans, saying that Black Scythe had really given those guys a beating, tortured them till they were begging for death, but he didn't go all the way and kill them. The reason? Well, he figured there was no point in offing them, and he also mentioned that fewer people meant less spots for others to make it through. Hearing this, the heavenly demon nodded in agreement, thinking that Black Scythe wasn't completely off base. But he had a question in mind. What if those guys came back for revenge down the line? The bodyguard laid out the whole torture scenario, and the heavenly demon sipped his wine, going deep into thought. It seemed like Black Scythe wasn't exactly a do-gooder. He probably had his own motives for helping the subordinate. And our heavenly demon didn't like being in anyone's debt. So he decided that he had to meet this Black Scythe character soon. He stood up from his seat thinking that when he did meet Black Scythe, he'd have to thank him from the bottom of his ass. Oh, sorry, from the bottom of his heart. He made it clear that he wanted to keep an eye on Black Scythe and that if the guy needed anything or asked anything of the bodyguard, he had to report it pronto. Being indebted wasn't his thing, and he wanted to stay on top of things. Then, as he was leaving, the heavenly demon stopped midway, turned back, and with cold eyes like a venomous snake, he addressed those who had attempted to harass Arin, referring to them as sons of bitches. He asked for their usernames. As we zoomed out, we saw Ryu standing outside the building of the Heavenly Demon. He was ready to leave the place as his work was done. Now he knew where the Heavenly Demon lived, and his plans would proceed smoothly. The Heavenly Demon was a very strong player, given his class, Dark Knight, which was terrifying. To use the skills of a Dark Knight, the user had to collect a certain aura called Dark Aura, obtainable only by killing a person and absorbing their life essence. This class suited someone like the Heavenly Demon, who had a penchant for killing, but he targeted only those he considered bad. Ryu pondered with a sweet face whether having someone like him on his team would be too dangerous. He decided he would manage it when the time came. For now, he had to go somewhere important. He hailed a cab and began to think about recruiting her. The scene shifted to the store where Ryu had bought the lottery tickets. Inside the store, the owner was holding his head, clearly upset and frustrated. He expressed his despair, not knowing what to do. Just then, someone entered the store. It was Juri, the store owner's daughter. Seeing her father in distress, Juri approached him and asked what was wrong. Her father hesitated at first, saying it was nothing, but Juri persisted in her questioning. Finally, he admitted that the government had banned lottery tickets. This sudden turn of events had left him in a difficult situation. He explained that a player had recently won multiple lottery tickets, each worth millions of dollars, and the government suspected it was due to some player skill or related issue. As a result, they had banned lotteries all over Korea, and since their store primarily relied on selling lottery tickets, they were now struggling with very few customers. Jury, with a warm smile, assured her father not to worry. She mentioned that she would be graduating soon and would find a part-time job to help with their financial situation during this emergency. Her father, however, insisted that her main focus should be on her studies, as her dream was to become a doctor and he would handle the money problems. With a bit of a neutral expression, Jury revealed that she had given up on becoming a doctor due to the current situation in the world. Her father suddenly realized the weight of his worries and anxieties, expressing concern about what might happen in the next round and the thought of something happening to Jury being too much for him to bear. He confessed that, despite wanting to be normal, he couldn't help but worry. And if things continued this way, he felt like he might go crazy. Seeing her father in such a state, Jury reassured him, holding his hand and telling him not to worry. She explained that now that she had a class, she wouldn't easily die in some otherworldly place. Her father, still puzzled, asked what she meant by having a class. 
In response, Juri used her skill. She placed her hand close to her father's hand, and a bright yellow light emitted from her hand, entering her father's body. The sudden display of her power left her father shocked and bewildered. With a bright smile, Juri raised her hand, which emitted a radiant yellow light. She explained to her father that he should be feeling a bit better now because of her unique skill which she had gained from the other world. Her father indeed felt a lot better than before and praised Juri for her abilities. He thanked her, and she assured him that he could let her know whenever he was feeling down and she would use her skill to relieve his worries. With great enthusiasm, Juri encouraged her father to cheer up and he chuckled, agreeing that whatever would happen in the future, they shouldn't worry about it now. They would face it together when the time came. Just then, the doorbell rang, signaling the arrival of a customer. Juri's dad turned to welcome the customer but was immediately shocked when he saw that it was none other than Ryu, the person responsible for the government's ban on lottery tickets. Juri whispered to her dad, asking who he was, and her father panic-strickenly replied that he was the person who had won 115 lotteries, all in first place. Due to his winnings, the government had banned lotteries, causing significant trouble for their store. Ryu, with a pat on his shoulder, slowly approached the store owner and asked if he remembered him, mentioning that he had bought many lottery tickets from here a month ago. Jury's dad hesitated but admitted that he did remember. Before he could say anything more, Ryu bowed down, startling her father. Ryu apologized, stating that because of him, the store owner was in trouble. He had seen on the news that after he had won the lottery, the government had banned it, and since the store's main income came from lottery ticket sales, the store owner was facing difficulties. Ryu sincerely expressed his regret. Hearing and seeing Ryu, Juri stared at him, feeling somewhat tense and nervous for some reason. Her father waved his hand, saying that it wasn't Ryu's fault and that it was okay. They weren't starving because they couldn't sell lottery tickets anymore. However, Ryu insisted that it wasn't okay. He believed that since he had caused this trouble, he should be the one to solve it. Ryu handed Juri's father a white envelope and explained that it was compensation. Inside the envelope was $10,000. Before they could say anything, Ryu left, leaving them bewildered. Holding the envelope, Juri's father deep in thought. Juri and her dad decided to return the money and Juri hurriedly ran to catch up with Ryu. Then we see Juri finally catching up with Ryu, shouting his name from behind. Hearing her, Ryu stopped, and as she came closer she wore a curious expression and asked if he was Ryu. Ryu in turn asked if she knew him, and she hesitantly replied that they were in the same class at college. However, Ryu still didn't recognize her, which left her a bit surprised. She asked if he really had never seen her in class. Ryu responded with a warm smile and explained that he was a single, virgin, a shut-in loser, and not good at socializing with people. Then, he admitted that he did know her because she was the one he was after for his team. She possessed buffing and incredible support skills, and he had met her in his 27th life on the seventh round, where he had saved her life. There, he had found out that she was his classmate, so it wasn't entirely a lie when he told her he didn't recognize her. Juri, a bit hesitantly, asked Ryu if they could go to a park to talk. Ryu, with a warm smile, nodded and agreed. The scene shifted, and we saw both of them sitting on a bench in the park, somewhat resembling a couple on a date. Juri handed the money envelope to Ryu, insisting that they couldn't accept such a large amount of money. Ryu, knowing that this was precisely why he had given her the money, refused to take it back, which startled Juri. She strongly insisted on him taking at least some of the money, as her hand was starting to hurt from holding it for so long. Ryu firmly declined, explaining that he had given the money to the store owner because he felt guilty for being the reason behind the store's loss of income. Therefore, he couldn't take it back. Hearing this, Juri began to panic, saying that the amount was too large, and they didn't know how to repay his kindness, which was exactly what Ryu wanted. Juri then had an idea and suggested that she would take $1,000 and return the remaining $9,000. Ryu questioned why she was deciding what to do instead of the store owner, and she responded by revealing that the store owner was her dad, so she had the authority to make such a decision. Then, a bit sad, Juri mentioned that she still couldn't believe that Ryu had never seen her in class as she immediately recognized Ryu when she saw him in the store. Then, her expression turned a little angry, and she pouted, and seeing her Ryu to apologize to her in his thoughts. Then suddenly Juri, enthusiastic, moved closer to Ryu, and urged him to look at her closely, and remember her face and name, Juri. Ryu responded with a warm smile, assuring her that he would remember her. Realizing that she was very close to Ryu, Juri blushed slightly. However, her mood shifted once more, 
and she became a bit sad and depressed, feeling like introducing herself to her classmate at the end of their graduation was a bit awkward. Ryu, still smiling warmly, comforted her, saying that it was okay because now they knew each other. He suggested that even after their graduation, they could meet. Then, he asked if she would mind giving him her number. Juri blushed a little and hesitated for a moment, but eventually she gave her number to Ryu. Ryu mentioned that friends usually had each other's numbers, and with that settled, he said he had to go and left. Juri noticed that she hadn't been able to return the money in the end, but that wasn't the main concern now. Her heart raced wildly, and she felt overwhelmed. She started to feel shy and blush, confessing that she liked Ryu. She explained that she had seen Ryu in her first year, getting brutally bullied, and from then on, whenever she saw Ryu being bullied, she would call the cops for help out of pity for him. Over time, she had started following Ryu regularly and had found herself developing feelings for him. However, she had never mustered the courage to confess her feeling. Now that she had met him again, and Ryu had helped her family, she decided to be more open about her affection. With a slightly tilted head, and while holding her hair, Juri asked if she could invite Ryu for a meal. Now Ryu was just chilling on his bed, phone in hand, chatting it up with Juri. She asked if he'd eaten yet, and if he hadn't, could they grab some lunch together around one? Ryu was like, sure thing, I'll foot the bill. They chatted for a bit, but Ryu couldn't help but notice that Juri was being extra friendly and trying real hard to please him. He figured maybe she was really grateful because he'd given her a nice chunk of money, but something about her attitude seemed a bit off to Ryu. He thought to himself that whatever the reason, getting closer to Juri like this might mean he could recruit her into his team down the line. So he put on this serious face, got up from his bed, and made a declaration that he'd do whatever it takes to keep Juri alive until the last round. So guys, today's like goal is 4,200. Please like and subscribe to the channel. I thank you all from the bottom of my ass, bottom of my heart, for supporting the channel. Now let's continue. A little while later, Ryu was all dressed up in a black shirt and black pants. Wani, his little bro, saw him like that and got a bit puzzled. He asked Ryu where he was off to. Ryu simply said he was meeting a friend. Now that threw Wani for a loop, because... You see, Ryu's a single virgin loser with no friends. Plus, he hardly ever dresses up and takes showers, so it was a shocker. So, Wani got straight to the point and asked, Is it a friend or a girl? Hearing that, Ryu didn't see any issue and asked if he couldn't have female friends. Then he hit Wani with a warm smile and told him to go ahead and have lunch without waiting for him. With that, he left to meet up with Juri, leaving Wani in a state of shock. It was a lot to take in, and he had to process it all. Finally, it hit him. Is Ryu really going on a date with a girl? The scene changed, and we found ourselves at a fancy restaurant called Steakhouse. It was one of those really, really expensive joints. Inside, Ryu and Juri were having lunch. Ryu had this warm smile on his face as he asked Juri if she liked the juicy steak they were having. Juri, still kind of lost in her daydream, only caught the word like and blushed a bit, asking, do I like what? Ryu clarified, saying he meant the steak, and Juri finally replied that yes, the steaks were absolutely delicious. Ryu told her to go ahead and enjoy as much juicy steak as she wanted, but you could feel the awkwardness settling in. They both sat there, not saying much, and the atmosphere got a bit uncomfortable. Juri was getting more and more shy, not sure how to break the silence. She told herself to be brave and muster up the courage to say something. Finally, she asked Ryu how he managed to win first place in the lottery 115 times. Ryu, with that same warm smile, replied that an old man with a pig on his head came to him in a dream and gave him the winning numbers. Hearing this, Juri tried to picture that old man with a pig on his head and asked Ryu how much he'd won from all those lottery wins. She made it clear that if Ryu didn't want to share, it was totally fine. Ryu, still with that gentle smile, told her that he'd won enough money that he never had to worry about finances for the rest of his life, but to use that money, he'd have to be alive in the next round. Hearing this, Juri hurriedly inquired about Ryu's experience in the first round of the tower. She shared that it felt like being thrown into hell for her, as she had never even killed an ant before, let alone facing the terrifying challenge of taking down 100 goblins. Ryu, with a neutral expression, admitted that it had been quite a challenging experience for him too. Juri then asked Ryu about the zone he was in. Ryu casually sipped his water and replied that he couldn't remember the exact zone number, but the last digit was a five. Juri, feeling a bit shy, shared that her zone number ended with seven, so it was a shame that they wouldn't be able to meet in the dungeons. She had hoped their zones would be the same. Ryu, with a reassuring smile, thought to himself that she shouldn't be disappointed because in the future, all the zones would merge into one, 
and they would definitely meet. Juri then inquired about Ryu's level, to which he replied that he was at level 10. She excitedly shared that she was also level 10 and had acquired a class called Supporter. Ryu, intrigued, asked if that meant she could buff other people's stats like in-game. Juri, now more confident, explained that her skill was called Bless, and by using it, she could enhance all the stats of whoever received her blessing. She activated her skill, and a green light emanated from her hand as she placed it close to Ryu's head. A magical pattern formed, and the system notified Ryu that all his stats had been increased by 50%, an effect that would last for three hours. Impressed, Ryu complimented Juri, calling her skill cool. Deep down, he already knew about her skill from his previous life, but the feeling of sharing a meal with a friend was new to him, and he genuinely enjoyed it. The awkwardness that had initially hung in the air had dissipated, and they both continued to enjoy their meal with smiles on their faces. Then, Ryu expressed his gratitude to Juri for the buff, feeling invigorated by the enhancement. Juri, however, gave him a playful glare before breaking into a joyful smile. She assured Ryu that it was no big deal, and that if he ever needed anything from her in the future, he could call her any time, and she would be there with her thing. Ryu simply nodded in agreement, saying, Okay. Then Ryu inquired about what Juri wanted to tell him on the phone, and Juri seemed a bit startled, realizing she should have mentioned it earlier. She playfully scolded herself for being a bit slow. However, with a gentle and warm smile, she began expressing her gratitude to Ryu for the money he had given them. She explained that the money had been a tremendous help, as her family was in debt, and they had managed to repay all their loans thanks to Ryu's assistance. Her father was now happy, all thanks to Ryu's generosity. She also promised that she would find a way to repay the money in the future. Ryu was a bit surprised by this expression of gratitude and told Juri that she didn't need to repay him. He reminded her that he had already acknowledged that he was responsible for her father losing customer, so it was only fair for him to compensate for it. Hearing this, Juri stood up, clapping her hands, and excitedly mentioned that if Ryu didn't want money, she could offer him something else. Then, her hand started to emit a bright yellow light, and she took out an item from her inventory. Curious, Ryu asked her what it was, and Juri extended her hand, revealing a purple crystal with unusual patterns. She admitted that she didn't know what it was, but she had obtained it while killing goblins. She insisted that Ryu take it, and said he couldn't refuse. The scene then shifted to outside the restaurant where Juri bid farewell to Ryu. Ryu, in return, wished her to take care and not to die in the next round. After Juri left the park, Ryu wore a serious expression and opened his inventory to check the description of the peculiar crystal she had given him. The system notification revealed that it was a low-rank purple monostone. Ryu hadn't expected to obtain this item so soon, especially not from Juri. As Ryu held the purple mana stone high in his hand and gazed at it with a contemplative look, he remarked that he knew exactly what this item was, but hadn't anticipated receiving it, especially not from Juri. He proceeded to explain that once a player reached level 20, they unlocked a feature called Combination. This feature allowed players to fuse mana crystals like the purple one with their equipment, granting the equipment unique skills or attributes. There were seven types of mana stones, red for damage, orange for strength, yellow for luck, green for agility, blue for intelligence, and dark blue for defense. Ryu emphasized that the purple one was the rarest, with a very low chance of obtaining it. Unlike the other crystals that increased specific attributes, the purple stone enhanced skills or attributes for all stats. With a gentle smile, Ryu expressed his luck at receiving the purple mana stone for free, considering it a fortunate turn of events. He then realized that his luck stat was doubled due to the bless skill. Was that the reason he was having such a lucky day? However, Ryu's meeting with Juri was primarily thanks to her blessed skill. With only 30 minutes left until the buff expired, Ryu wanted to open the golden mysterious pouch he had acquired in round two, capitalizing on his doubled luck stat. But before that, Ryu reached into his pocket and pulled out a packet full of small meal worms. Still holding the worms with a serious expression, Ryu proceeded to explain that his slaughterer skill increased all his stats by 1% for each opponent he killed, and this applied to bugs as well. With that, he threw the packet full of bugs onto the ground and, with a solemn face, offered his apology. Then, he began stomping on the bugs. As he continued to stomp, the system notified him of his progress. 45 opponents killed, then 67, until he finally reached his 100th kill causing all his stats to increase by 100%. After this bug-squashing exercise, Ryu checked his status window, 
His luck stat had skyrocketed to an impressive 45. Initially, his base luck was 15, but with the help of his slaughterer skill, he had boosted his stats by 100%, bringing his luck stat to 30. The bless skill from Jury had further increased his stats by 50%, resulting in his luck reaching 45. Ryu then retrieved the mysterious gold pouch, and the system notified him that it was a gold pouch. And upon opening it, one could receive gold coins ranging from 1 to 9,999, determined randomly based on their luck stat. Ryu cautiously opened the pouch, holding high hopes, but expecting to receive no more than 6,000 gold. However, what he witnessed left him utterly astonished, his eyes wide open in surprise. The system notified him that he had obtained a whopping 9,999 gold. Seeing this, Ryu couldn't contain his happiness, exclaiming that today the god of luck was truly on his side. With this newfound wealth, he now had a total of 16,249 gold. Ryu added that he could buy an epic item with this amount and still have money left over. However, he had no plans to spend any money at the moment, as the item he desired would become available in the shop after two weeks. With that decision made, Ryu closed his status window and inventory. The scene then shifted back to Ryu's building. As Ryu entered the room, he greeted Wani, who was sipping hot chocolate. Seeing Ryu, Wani's eyes sparkled with excitement as he eagerly asked how Ryu's date had gone. Ryu, on the other hand, was momentarily taken aback by the question and paused. Without offering any details about the date, Ryu simply sat on the sofa. Wani, sensing his brother's reluctance to discuss it, asked if Ryu wasn't coming home after a date with the girl he had feelings for. Ryu, feeling a bit awkward, replied, dismissing the question and redirecting the conversation by asking what Wani had eaten for lunch. Wani, feeling comfortable in his seat, replied that he had enjoyed black bean noodles, emphasizing how delicious they were. Ryu, with a joyful smile, assured Wani that he could have ordered something even better. Wani pouted, defending his choice of black bean noodles, explaining that he had been craving them for a long time. Ryu reflected on how just one month ago, they were in a dire situation and had to beg for food. Now, with money, Wani still enjoyed his previous lifestyle of food, which Ryu found perfectly fine. He was genuinely happy to see Wani enjoying himself. As Wani engrossed himself in watching the epic battle between Luffy and Kaido in one piece, his excitement palpable, Ryu's thoughts were elsewhere. Ryu had his mind on the price of Bitcoin, contemplating that it would rise by a significant margin in the next two weeks before potentially crashing. He knew he needed to withdraw his money before the crash, but he had some plans in mind. One of those plans was to buy a Lamborghini. To make this dream a reality, Ryu first decided to obtain his driver's license. He took the driving license exam and aced it with a remarkable 95% score, leaving everyone astonished. With his license secured, Ryu wasted no time and placed an order for a Lamborghini. Finally, the day arrived when the price of Bitcoin increased by a factor of 10, prompting Ryu to swiftly withdraw all his Bitcoin holdings. Now, with a devilish grin on his face, Ryu was visibly pleased with his actions. Seeing him smile like that, Wani couldn't contain his curiosity and asked if something good had happened. Ryu explained that he had just sold all his Bitcoin and made a massive profit. When Ryu asked how much he had earned, he revealed that he had made 300 billion won, equivalent to a staggering $222,662,700. Wani was utterly shocked by the astronomical amount, and he started to shake with disbelief. Ryu casually mentioned that they had multiplied their initial investment by 20-fold and sat back on the sofa, relaxed. Now, Wani, still in disbelief, said when Ryu first told Wani he invested all their money into Bitcoin, Wani wanted to stop Ryu, but now to think they hit the mega jackpot. Ryu, with a warm smile, replied that he was just lucky as he himself didn't know they would have won that big. That's why he withdrew all the money as greediness leads to destruction. Then Wani asked, that means Ryu will not invest in Bitcoin anymore? And Ryu replied, yes, no more Bitcoin stuff. Hearing this, Wani let out a sigh of relief as he took a sip of his hot coffee. However, Ryu dropped another bombshell. He planned to invest all the money into stocks. Wani was so shocked that he ended up spilling his hot chocolate, and with teary eyes, he asked Ryu why he was taking such a risky step when they already had enough money to secure their future generations. Ryu remained cool and reassured Wani not to worry, insisting that everything would work out and that he should trust him. Ryu pointed his finger upwards, explaining that an old man with a pig on his head had come to him in a dream and predicted the rise of Bitcoin, which had led to profits. 
The same old man had also given him insights into which stocks would increase in value, further reinforcing his confidence in the stock market. Hearing this, Wani, still stressed, believed what Ryu told, saying to do as Ryu wished, but at least to keep some money in reserve just in case something happens. Ryu understood Wani's concern, but knew the future and believed that his investments would pay off. Now scrolling his phone, searching multiple companies, Ryu wanted to invest in the company named Heavenly Demon Consulting. This is a no-name company now, but in the future this will become the number one in Korea and dominate everyone. Ryu purchased a 31% share of the company, ensuring that he would have some influence as it grew. Then a murmur broke Ryu's attention, and as he turned back, he saw Wani intensely praying to the old man with a pin in his head, saying, Please make the company that Ryu is investing in grow. Seeing this, Ryu let out a joyful smile. Then, the night had arrived, and Ryu lay on his bed, eagerly anticipating this day. He opened the store window, revealing a list of various items. Among the options was one called Today's Item. Clicking this option allowed you to obtain a random item ranging from normal rank to high rank. To unlock this chest, you had to pay 4,600 gold. It might seem foolish to open a random chest at such a high price, risking getting a common rank item worth only a few gold. But Ryu knew the future. He had opened this chest 99 times, every other day, and he knew which item would appear. With confidence, he opened the random chest, and voila, Ryu received an epic item called the Skeleton Bone Necklace. It was an epic item with a unique effect. After defeating an opponent, it would increase the intelligence stat by three points and attack speed by one. However, this effect would only last for one round, and it was capped at 25%, meaning Ryu could only increase his stats by a maximum of 25%. Ryu then used the 50% coupon he had obtained from a class-changing quest to purchase the necklace at half price, which amounted to 2,300 gold. Now Ryu was fully prepared for the next round. As time passed quickly, the day arrived, March 1st, 2023. Slowly but surely, one by one, the players started to appear on the third round of the dungeon. A dense and tense atmosphere enveloped the area as the players whispered among themselves, wondering what this place was. The players began to explore their surroundings, realizing that this place was once a village that now lay in ruin. They saw the remnants of what used to be a thriving village, but it had been reduced to rubble. A massive castle gate loomed over the village, surrounded by the remnants of a fortress. The atmosphere was thick with tension and uncertainty. Suddenly, a massive purple crystal materialized in the middle of the village, causing panic among the players. Anxiety filled the air, but Ryu, standing calmly in the background, didn't seem phased. Then Ryu noticed the muscle head. Some players started to gossip while seeing the muscle head, saying the last round he became the zone leader by threatening everyone and he literally started slaughtering whoever didn't obey his command. Some even started saying the muscle head is not worthy of becoming a zone leader, and Black Scythe should be the zone leader. Then one player, in panic, said to his friend not to say it so loudly as if the muscle head heard him, he could use his authority skill on him and make his life miserable. But he, with an arrogant tone, replied that he doesn't care, as the muscle head can only use his skill ten times, and after that, he is no more than an ordinary player, so what is there to be scared of? Now hearing this, the musclehead got furious and started shouting, calling them bastards, but the whispering didn't stop, and the players again started to make fun of the musclehead. Now the musclehead got furious, his blood started to boil, and he turned with great force, started shouting, asking who mother f asterisk 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 air just spoke, but everyone was just silent and the muscle head couldn't do anything in this position. He started to grind his teeth in anger, thinking he knew this would happen, only if that bitch Angel didn't reveal everything related to his skill. Things would have been different, but then something funny happened. Well, you see, suddenly Youngman came and arrived on the scene with quite a dramatic entrance. He forcefully bowed his head before the muscle head, exclaiming aloud and cheerful, Hello! The muscle head was taken aback by this sudden display, and inquired about the newcomer's identity. Youngman, his voice tinged with submission, introduced himself as Youngman and respectfully addressed the Musclehead as his senior. He explained that he had come to pay his respects to the Musclehead. This response left the Musclehead somewhat puzzled. He questioned whether he knew Youngman, to which Youngman replied that they were strangers. However, he confessed that his life's ambition was to become a gangster just like the Musclehead and that he was a massive fan. And how Youngman begged the Musclehead that he wants to come inside. He wants to come under the Musclehead's team. 
The musclehead couldn't help but be surprised by Youngman's unusual aspirations. He wondered what kind of crazy guy dreams of becoming a gangster like me. Before the musclehead could respond, Youngman just came to his knees and bowed his head, saying he will serve the musclehead for the rest of his life and will do anything that the musclehead will say. And he requested, saying, Please, I beg you, take me in. Now seeing this, the musclehead started to laugh, thinking he has seen all types of psychos in his life but it is the first time he saw this type of psycho. Then the musclehead extended his finger, pointing towards the gathered players, questioning whether something was wrong with Youngman's eyes. He remarked that everyone seemed to dislike Youngman, yet he wanted to join his team. Youngman, filled with excitement, clenched his fist and tapped his chest, wearing a wide smile. He made it clear that he doesn't care what other players think or say. He just wants to come inside the musclehead, and he can do anything to come inside the musclehead. Now the musclehead was hearing this with a serious face, and after a pause, the musclehead, with a grinning smile, replied that he likes people like Youngman, so he would take Youngman under him, take responsibility, and raise Youngman. Hearing this, Youngman was overwhelmed with gratitude, repeatedly bowing and expressing his thanks. It was truly an honor for him. Meanwhile, the other players couldn't help but gossip about the unexpected partnership. They found it hard to believe that Youngman had teamed up with the musclehead, and some questioned Youngman's sanity. However, as they observed the musclehead and Youngman laughing and chatting happily, they couldn't resist making remarks. They suggested that there is a saying that birds of a feather flock together, so it's not weird seeing one piece of shit getting attracted toward another piece of shit. So today's like goal is 4,700. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. Now let's continue. Then out of nowhere, the angel descended from the sky with a dazzling entrance, startling all the players. She floated in the air for a moment, seemingly calculating something. She then announced that there were 90 fewer people than in the previous round. Hearing this, the players started to get confused, asking, what does that mean? But before they could say anything further, a quest window came in front of them, stating that their quest was to protect the purple crystal from being destroyed by monsters. Only 1,255 players would survive this round. Now seeing that there were 90 fewer players than before, confusion and panic spread among the participants. The angel, still floating with her hand on her lips, politely explained that she couldn't go to the real world and kill anyone, as that would mean those players died in the real world for some reason. A player shouted in shock and panic, realizing that only 1,225 players would survive this time, which was one-fourth of the total players. As all the players slowly noticed it, they started to panic, and some started to scream. A player asked the angel, Is there an error? In every round, only half of the players survive. So how... But before he could finish his sentence, the angel burst into laughter. She started to laugh loudly while holding her stomach, her laughter echoing throughout the entire area. So there they were, the whole gang of players listening to that angel with their eyes wide in horror and panic. She fired back at him, calling him filthy monkeys and saying angels ain't no dummies. She made it clear there was no error in the rules. With a point of her finger and a cheerful tone, she dropped a bombshell on him. She reminded him that everyone had survived the last round, so it was only natural that only a quarter of them would make it through this time. That sent the already freaked out players into an even deeper panic. The angel's look turned deadly serious as she laid out the quest details. In this village, there were four castle gates, and every 30 minutes, monsters would start pouring out of them. Their mission? Protect the purple crystal from getting wrecked by these beasties. There were going to be four waves of monsters, and if they couldn't keep that relic safe, they'd be hit with a big, fat penalty. To make things a bit easier, she said they'd be ranking players based on the number of monsters they killed. That's how they'd figure out the top 25% who'd get to live. And just to sweeten the deal, she dropped the monster's power by a third. Now, there was this muscle head in the group, grinning like he had it all figured out. He thought this round would be a cakewalk. All he had to do was slaughter a bunch of monsters, and he even had that authority skill to back him up. Easy peasy, right? The angel clapped her hands, making sure she got everyone's attention, saying she almost forgot to say the most important thing. She stared at the muscle head and said that in the last round, life is a documentary became the zone leader, right? So he can use the authority skill to command 10 people without any class. Then she questioned, did no one think about what will happen if the zone leader dies? And as soon as the musclehead heard this, he became like a statue without saying anything. Then the angel with a wicked smile explained that if the zone leader dies from a monster, 
or any natural cause, like if he killed himself or fell down on a dagger and died, the zone leader's position will remain empty and they will have to vote again to decide who will become the next zone leader. But what if the zone leader got killed by another player? The musclehead was still frozen in his position in shock when the angel continued that if a player kills the zone leader, then the one who will kill him will automatically become the zone leader, and he can also use 10 authority commands regardless of what the previous zone leader had used. As soon as she said this, all the players turned their gaze toward the muscle head with a deadly look, like they would eat the muscle head alive. Then the angel clapped her hands again, saying the monsters will appear in 10 minutes, and she hopes everyone will work together and survive. But then she smiled, looking like she was too happy, enjoying the moment and glaring at the muscle head, saying that she hopes everyone works together, but she is not sure if he will be able to. With those last words, she vanished, leaving the muscle head shaking in anger. Then the muscle head started to scream in anger, cursing the angel and calling her a bitch. However, a whisper caught his attention, and when he turned around, he noticed the players were ready with their weapon, ready to attack. Seeing this, the muscle head also took out his dagger in anger and started to shout, saying if they want to die this badly, they can come and he will fulfill their wishes. But the players didn't back down, explaining that the musclehead could only use his authority ten times, and if they all attacked him together, he wouldn't be able to defend himself. Just when tensions were escalating, an unexpected turn of events occurred. A heavy, commanding footstep echoed, drawing everyone's attention. It was none other than Ryu, who walked past the players with a majestic aura. They made way for him as he approached the musclehead. Noticing Ryu coming toward the musclehead, he started to panic and asked, why is Ryu coming close toward me? But Ryu didn't say anything, and he just walked close to the muscle head, and with a chilling cold tone said, Don't be afraid. I'm not here to kill you. If I wanted to kill you, you wouldn't be alive in the first place. I'm here to say something to you. The muscle head just stood there with a sweaty face. Then the muscle head, still scared but not showing it to everyone, replied that he's not scared at all and he's listening. So Ryu can say whatever he wants. With a touch of arrogance, the muscle head added that although Ryu was strong, if they were to fight, he would make sure to at least chop off one or both of Ryu's hands. He declared that he wasn't scared of Ryu's threats. However, before he could finish his sentence, Ryu began to smile wickedly. This sent shivers down the muscle head's spine. Then Ryu, with a cold expression and a cool pose, hand in his pocket, and the other holding his black scythe, suggested that the muscle head seemed to be in a tight spot. He proposed an offer. How about he protect the muscle head? The muscle head was left utterly bewildered and stood there in confusion as Ryu explained that he will stand behind the mush head and protect his ass so that no one can fuck his ass up. Now hearing this, all the players got shocked, saying, Why is Black Scythe protecting the muscle head? So if they want to kill the muscle head, they have to fight Black Scythe too. And if it is, they will not be able to face two strong opponents. This declaration sent shockwaves through all the players. They couldn't understand why Black Scythe, Ryu, would protect the Musclehead ass. They realized that if they wanted to kill the Musclehead, they'd have to face off against Black Scythe too, and that it's impossible to fight against Black Scythe. Meanwhile, the Musclehead was listening to the whispers, thinking that just the name of Black Scythe was enough to strike fear into the players. With a somewhat unsure and cautious tone, the Musclehead asked what Black Scythe wanted in return for his protection. Ryu, always cool and collected, casually replied that he didn't want much. Then, his expression turned serious, as he stated that the only condition was for the musclehead to follow his orders. This condition seemed to take the musclehead by surprise, as he realized that Black Scythe was essentially offering him a subordinate role. Curious and cautious, the musclehead inquired why Black Scythe was making such a kind offer. Ryu cryptically replied that he couldn't tell him. When the musclehead asked about the nature of the orders he'd have to follow, Ryu gave a similar response saying he couldn't reveal that either. He advised the musclehead not to talk too much and simply follow his commands. He doesn't have the entire day here. The musclehead found himself in deep thought. He didn't want to become Black Scythe's subordinate, but he feared what might happen if he rejected the offer. Would Black Scythe come after him? In a state of panic, he nervously gulped, feeling the pressure of the decision weighing on him. Ryu urged him to give his response quickly, as the other players were eagerly waiting for his answer. Hesitantly, the musclehead declined Black Scythe's offer, stating that he wouldn't come under his command. Ryu fixed him with a cold, deadly look, and the other players started to get happy, saying, Is the musclehead dumb? 
If he had accepted the offer, Ryu would have protected his ass, but no, because of his eco, he rejected the offer. The atmosphere grew tense as a girl prepared her long sword and her friend readied his spear. Slowly, everyone geared up to attack the muscle head. Ryu, on the other hand, distanced himself from the scene, stating that he no longer cared about what happened to the muscle head. Whether he lived or died was none of his concern. Just as the players were about to make their move, the system sent out a notification. The first wave of monsters would arrive in a minute, catching everyone off guard. Their priorities shifted instantly, and protecting the crystal became their top concern. The players abandoned the idea of attacking the muscle head. Seeing an opportunity, the muscle head decided to follow Ryu, thinking that whatever Rao was up to might be a better option. As he trailed Ryu, he noticed that Ryu was heading toward the third castle entrance, which was unguarded. Suddenly, a loud sound signaled the start of the first wave of monsters, startling everyone. Slowly, the massive castle gates began to creak open, and a chilling wind swept through, making everyone shiver. The system then delivered a grim notification. 9,800 weakened goblins were approaching, intent on destroying the crystal. Panic and fear washed over the players as they stood, clutching their weapons tightly. With creepy smiles and eerie noises, the bloodthirsty goblin horde emerged from behind the gates. They looked as if they hadn't eaten in a thousand years, their hungry eyes fixed on the defenseless players. Even the musclehead got panicked as he himself didn't expect 9,800 goblins to come. Without wasting any time, the musclehead started to run, finding a hiding position and started thinking, why isn't Black Scythe running? Is he planning to fight against all the goblins alone? Then the musclehead started climbing a staircase, trying to go to a higher ground, saying, even if it's Black Scythe, he will not be able to face against thousands of goblins at a time. As the musclehead reached the top of the building, he noticed hundreds of goblins marching toward Ryu, and Ryu just standing there. He said, now Ryu will run with his tail between his legs and this scene will be a sight to see. Then the horde of bloodthirsty goblins dashed toward Ryu, screaming, and Ryu prepared his black scythe. A group of goblins jumped toward Ryu, and Ryu, as cool as ever without breaking a sweat, in a flash, chopped all the goblins. He didn't stop there. Like a killing machine, he continued to chop each and every goblin into small pieces with great force displaying tremendous strength and precision. The muscle head, on the other hand, was left speechless. Seeing this, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. Then he thought, as Ryu got a class, that's why he must be so strong. After he obtains his class, then he will beat the crap out of that arrogant bastard. With that, the muscle head left to kill some goblins to level up and obtain a class. He also started to kill a single goblin at a time without any issue, thinking that in no time, he will obtain a class. Suddenly, an arrow whizzed through the air, narrowly missing the muscle head's face. He managed to dodge most of it, but the arrow grazed a small part of his ear. Angrily, he began searching for the person responsible. But in the chaotic crowd of players, it was impossible to identify the shooter. Fuming with rage, the musclehead declared that he didn't know who had attacked him. But once he found the culprit, he would peel his skin off. Before he could finish his sentence, he felt a piercing pain. As he looked back, the spear guy had already thrust his spear into the musclehead's stomach. The musclehead was really angry, so he grabbed the spear stuck in his stomach and with his dagger thrust it into the spear guy, killing him instantly. However, that was just the beginning. One by one, other players began to attack him, and he found himself desperately defending against their relentless onslaught. Even if he managed to survive this battle, he hadn't killed enough monsters to avoid automatic death when the round ended. Amidst the chaos, he spotted a barbarian-like player, Black Flame Dragon, ranked third in the zone. With a cunning grin, the musclehead used his command skill on him, instructing him to protect him at all costs. Meanwhile, Ryu was doing his favorite thing, yes, bullying the goblins. At this point, Ryu had slaughtered 502 goblins, and all his stats had increased by 100% because of the reign of slaughter. And because of the skeleton bone necklace, his stats further increased by 25%. On the other hand, the other players were barely defending themselves against the goblin, and finally, after a hellish battle, the first round got over, and 3,933 players were left, while 936 players died in this time. Then, Ryu slowly approached the battlefield where dead bodies of players could be seen. He was searching for the muscle head, wondering if he was still alive. On the other hand, the muscle head was heavily injured, but his suffering was far from over. 
With the players no longer distracted by the goblins, they started to attack the muscle head. One player bravely attacked him, but his attempt was swiftly crushed by the combined might of the barbarian guy and young men. Seeing this, the muscle head was thankful that he had those bastards to protect him because of the authority of command. He managed to survive the first round. Then, young men asked the muscle head in concern if he's okay, and seeing that the muscle head was in deep thought. Youngman followed him, even though he did not use command authority on him. But then, he started groaning in pain as the wound in his stomach was too deep, and he was bleeding heavily. However, before he could even take a sigh of relief, the second wave of goblins began to surge towards them. The goblins started running towards Black Scythe, Ryu. With a serious expression, he did not hesitate to slice the goblins with his scythe. He continued to attack multiple goblins at the same time. The bodies of the dead goblins were piling up on the ground. Then the system notified him that he had reached level 20. His rank had risen from apprentice to regular. He could now use the combination function. He wiped his sweat as he rejoiced in reaching level 20, saying that now he could use the combination function to create unique items that can't be obtained in the store. Then, another window screen appeared before him, displaying important information. The first announcement was about the strengthening of the Death Seal due to his rank increase, now boosted from 100 to 120 percent. Additionally, he had unlocked a Reaper-exclusive skill called Knight of Death, which could create an artificial knight within a 500-meter radius. Combining this skill with his Grim Reaper's abilities would double his attack power and increase his attack speed by 50 percent during the night. This was indeed a formidable combination. After quickly reviewing the screen, the goblins came charging towards him, driven by their bloodthirsty instincts. He welcomed their approach with a confident smile, eager to put his new skill to the test. With a swift activation, Night of Death shrouded the area in impenetrable darkness. The goblins, unable to see through this pitch-black veil, were disoriented and panicked. In the midst of this darkness, Ryu became a reaper of death, precision, and swiftness personified. He systematically beheaded the goblins, causing chaos among their ranks. Their panic escalated as they tried to flee, but in a single sweeping motion of his scythe, Ryu carved through them like a hot knife through butter. When he turned around, a gruesome pile of goblin corpses bore witness to his deadly efficiency. The system chimed in to announce the end of the second wave, giving Ryu a moment of respite. Seizing the opportunity, he opened his in-game shop, eager to spend the gold he had earned from his goblin slaying spree. He invested in the precise location skill, which granted him the ability to sense every particle within a 30-meter radius. With this newfound skill, he was well prepared for the arrival of the third wave of goblins. As the third wave approached, Ryu remained unfazed. With eyes closed, he moved effortlessly through the goblins, slicing them down as if he were casually sipping his morning coffee. Meanwhile, the Musclehead found himself in a dire situation, forced to fend off the goblins while protecting himself despite his severe injuries. The Musclehead had been intensely focused on the front, engrossed in the battle before him. However, a sudden eruption of screams from behind shattered his concentration. When he turned around, a horrifying sight awaited him. His subordinates were being mercilessly slaughtered, and a group of aggressive players was advancing, determined to end his life. Arrows rained down upon him, and in a desperate bid to shield himself, he grabbed two of his subordinates and used them as human shields, blocking the deadly projectiles. Now only he and three others were left, facing a larger group of players ready to kill them. Realizing that he couldn't win this battle, the Musclehead made a quick decision to flee. He started running from the scene, with the players hot on his heels. His only goal was to survive for one more hour. If he could do that, he would make it to the next round, as he was already among the top 25%. However, the relentless players chasing him had other plans, and they were determined not to let him live. In his desperate flight, the Musclehead encountered Ryu up ahead. Panic overcame him, and he rushed toward Ryu, offering to accept any deal Ryu proposed. He was ready to do anything, from licking Ryu's feet to killing anyone for him. But Ryu merely glared at the Musclehead with a cold, deadly look, and firmly stated that he refused to accept the Musclehead. As shock registered on the Musclehead's face, Ryu went on to explain that he had already made it clear earlier that he didn't care whether the Musclehead lived or died. It was none of his business. As Ryu prepared for another round of bullying the goblins, the Musclehead couldn't contain his desperation any longer. He started screaming, begging Ryu to save him. In response, Ryu calmly stated that he would have considered taking the Musclehead under his wing if he hadn't already used all his authority skill charges. But now, in Ryu's eyes, the Musclehead was nothing more than trash. Hearing this, 
The muscle head felt a surge of frustration and helplessness, not knowing what to do. Meanwhile, the other players behind them began to laugh gleefully, relieved that Black Scythe hadn't intervened to save the muscle head. In a fit of intense rage and determination, the muscle head drew his dagger, clutching his wounded stomach with his other hand. He screamed, vowing to take at least ten people down with him before he met his end. However, at that moment, Youngman appeared from behind, and in a concerned tone, assured the muscle head that he was there to help. Seeing Youngman, the muscle head's face lit up with happiness and he gave a wide smile. He expressed his confidence that Youngman would come to his rescue and promised to reward him generously once he survived this round. And when he was too weak to fight back, instead of protecting the muscle head, Youngman, being an even bigger piece of shit than the muscle head, delivered a heavy skull-crushing blow to him, causing him to fly backward with his nose broken. Then, Youngman grabbed the muscle head by his collar while the muscle head was in pain, grinding his teeth. Youngman gave yet another heavy punch to the muscle head's face, causing him to start coughing up blood. But Youngman was even more of a bigger piece of shit than the muscle head. So, Youngman started a barrage of heavy punches all into the muscle head's face. After a few hundred punches, the muscle head was now lying on the floor, blood coming from his nose, ears, and mouth. His one eye got injured, and slowly his vision was going blurry, as Youngman glared at the muscle head with a wicked smile. But wait, it was not enough. So today's like goal is 4,900 likes. Please like and subscribe to support the channel from the bottom of your ass. Then Youngman lifted his foot high, and with all his might, bam, he smashed the muscle head's head. The system notified Youngman that he had killed the zone leader. So now he became the new zone leader with the authority skill. Now, seeing Youngman all covered in the Musclehead's blood, he shouted in excitement, saying he is the king of this zone now. Then, Youngman started to laugh mischievously, and the first thing he thought was that now that he had the authority skill, he could control Aaron and do whatever he wanted with her body. Youngman, while looking at the dead, lifeless body of the Musclehead, said that he would use the authority skill very well and now the muscle head could rest in peace. Youngman turned back with a proud face and walked toward his friends. He told them that he had promised to kill that piece of shit, and his friends hesitantly replied that they were happy for him. However, deep inside, they were a little scared because Youngman was getting more psycho and perverted day by day. As they saw the muscle head's blood dripping from Youngman's hands, they became even more terrified. Youngman had killed someone barehanded, without any weapon. Now, the other players also started gossiping, Realizing that Youngman was indeed the biggest piece of shit in the entire universe, his goal was to kill the Musclehead from the start, which is why he had joined the Musclehead's team. And now that someone like him had become the zone leader, all the players were getting very angry. They said they had to kill him because leaving someone like him alive would decrease their own chances of survival. But Youngman, for some reason, was not scared at all. He was just laughing with an arrogant smile. Seeing his arrogant smile, all the players prepared to attack Youngman. Then, Youngman suddenly, still with a confident smile, started running somewhere, shocking everyone. And guess what? He went running toward Ryu, shouting his name and hurriedly asked Ryu if he saw how he killed the muscle head. And now he became the zone leader, and he even had the authority skill. Then Ryu asked, so what? Youngman, tapping his chest confidently, asked Ryu if he had made an offer to protect the muscle head because of his authority skill. He explained that he had the authority skill and then promised Ryu that he would do whatever Ryu asked. If needed, he could even wipe Ryu's ass if necessary. Then, Youngman, after saying this, was just very happy, thinking Ryu would accept his offer because he had the authority skill. But Ryu, with an annoyed face, replied that he didn't like Youngman's attitude, which startled Youngman. Ryu continued, saying that if Youngman got on his knees and begged, then Ryu could think about it. Now, hearing this, Youngman got confused and in a state of confusion asked Ryu if he heard what he just said, that he had the authority skill and could use it ten times. Ryu replied, saying he knew, but Youngman must be misunderstanding something, as the one who was in a dire situation was Youngman, not Ryu. If Ryu really needed the authority skill, did Youngman really think he couldn't get it by killing him? Then Ryu, with a kind smile, explained that he just wanted to protect the muscle head because he was a piece of shit, and he wanted to tease and humiliate him in front of everyone in place of protection. Youngman, being even more of a piece of shit, needed to earn Ryu's protection, so he should get on his knees and bark like a dog two times now. As Youngman turned back, he saw all the players glaring at him like hungry dogs ready to devour him. Realizing the dire situation he was in, Youngman turned toward Ryu, and after taking a deep breath, he bowed down in front of Ryu, 
saying he was Ryu's slave and barked like a dog. Rough, rough, rough. Then Ryu just stared at him as he barked like a dog for a while with a satisfying look, thinking that he really didn't care about the muscle head. But unlike the muscle head, Youngman did have some value, and he had future plans for him. But before that, he wanted to bully him to his heart's satisfaction. And after begging like a dog, Ryu finally accepted Youngman to come under him. Hearing this, Youngman started bowing heavily with a surprised face, thanking Ryu continuously. Seeing this, Ryu, with an annoyed and disgusted look, said that if Youngman ever even thinks of betraying him like what he did to the muscle head, he will chop Youngman into small pieces and feed it to dogs. With that, Ryu, with a majestic aura, started walking toward the players, leaving them in a state of confusion, wondering what was happening and whether Ryu would really protect Youngman. Some foolish individuals even contemplated attacking Ryu and Youngman together. However, one wise person panicked, warning others not to even think about attacking Ryu. He recounted how Ryu had slaughtered 100 goblins at once and emphasized that they couldn't possibly challenge such a formidable opponent. Before the wise man could finish his sentence, Ryu spoke loudly, asking if some of them wanted to attack him. This sent shivers down their spines, and Ryu continued with a serious expression, presenting them with two options. First, they could go and kill goblins to reach the top 25% and survive this round. Then, with great force, he pointed his black scythe toward the players, and with a deadly stare, announced that they could choose to die, and he wouldn't mind. He even jokingly mentioned that it would give him a good warm-up before the next wave of goblins arrived. After hearing Ryu's command, all the players immediately hid their weapons and panicked in a state of fear. They started running away from Ryu as if their lives depended on it. Meanwhile, Youngman was simply amazed. He couldn't help but marvel at how just a single word from Ryu could send all the players into a state of terror, causing them to flee like frightened rats. Youngman started laughing and gave Ryu a knowing look, realizing that when he used to be Ryu's enemy, he had also witnessed just how terrifying Ryu could be. Now, he felt safe with Ryu on his side. As Ryu observed the players battling the wolfmen, he couldn't help but smile to himself. He thought that now that he had everything he wanted, he could finally begin his grand plan. Ryu called Youngman over, and Youngman happily approached him, addressing him as, Sir. Ryu spoke in a deep voice and made a serious request. He asked Youngman to use all his ten authorities to break the purple relic that all the players were protecting. Youngman was shocked by this command. He remembered that the angel had instructed them to protect the relic at all costs, and failure to do so would result in a heavy penalty. Youngman was frustrated and puzzled, wondering why Ryu was ordering him to break the relic. Using all his ten authorities would also mean he couldn't control Arin and engage in any lewd activities with her. Youngman hesitated, scratching his head, as he asked Ryu why he had to break the relic. Ryu's response was stern, telling Youngman to shut up and obey his orders. Youngman then made a request, asking if he could please use only nine of his authorities and save one, as he had other plans for it. But Ryu replied in a cold tone, making it clear that he wouldn't repeat himself and that Youngman had to do as he was told to if he don't want to die. With a sad expression, Youngman agreed and assured Ryu that he understood. Then Ryu dropped yet another bombshell, revealing that he would now dictate whom Youngman had to use the authority skill on. As Ryu began reciting the names, Youngman realized that these were all the names of his friends. He couldn't help but wonder why all of his friends were on the list of people he had to use his command skill on. Youngman apologized to his friends, explaining that he couldn't deny Ryu's command. He used his authority skill, uttering his friends' names one by one. A strange purple symbol appeared on the heads of his friends, and they started to get mind-controlled. With the final command, break the relic, they succumbed to the mind control. Suddenly, a system notification appeared in front of all the players, stating that the relic was being attacked. Shocked and panicked, the players turned toward the relic and saw ten people breaking it. In a state of panic, they rushed toward them to stop the destruction. Some players managed to trap a few of the culprits, while others were killed in the chaos. However, before the players could take further action, a crack formed in the crystal and with a resounding crash it shattered into small pieces. A massive system window appeared, announcing that the relic had been broken and that they had failed the main quest. As a penalty, the Agent of Divine Punishment would be summoned, attempting to kill everyone for 30 minutes. After that, the round would be over. A sense of horror and panic enveloped the area as players grappled with the gravity of the situation. They questioned who this Divine Punisher was and what they should do next. 
Meanwhile, Ryu stood holding his black scythe with a slight smile, confident that everything was going according to his plan. A system window appeared in front of everyone, announcing that a sub-quest would begin, and upon completing it, all players would receive 3,000 gold. As players contemplated this offer, they realized that getting 3,000 gold for surviving the 30-minute punishment was a better deal than the 2,000 gold they were receiving for protecting the relic. This realization led to some optimism among the players. However, Ryu noticed the naive players getting happy and started thinking that the larger reward indicated a more significant threat was coming to attack them. He also considered the reason he didn't break the relic himself. But before he could finish his thoughts, a big system notification appeared in the sky, stating that the 10 players who attacked the relic would receive a substantial penalty, which was a 50% reduction in all stats for those players. Hearing this, Youngman's friends were left speechless. Some felt depressed, while others were angry, and they started cursing Youngman, blaming him for their predicament. Youngman could only reply with a simple sorry, as he didn't know about this penalty. However, deep down, he felt a little relieved as nothing penalty had been applied to him. But before he could finish processing this information, a system notification appeared in front of him, stating that since the zone leader couldn't protect the relic from being destroyed, the zone leader's stats would also be permanently decreased by 50%. At first, Youngman took his time to comprehend this information, but when he realized what had just happened, he exploded in anger. He began kicking objects nearby, and his friends cursed him while he vented his frustration. Meanwhile, Ryu enjoyed this scene, as he had planned all along to make Youngman's life a living hell, just as Ryu had experienced himself. Without wasting any time, Ryu opened the system shop and purchased an assassin hoodie and boots with the rest of his remaining gold, which slightly increased his movement speed. Then Ryu opened his combination window, a feature he had gained after reaching level 20, where he could fuse crystals into his equipment to gain bonus stats and abilities. He began the process by placing the skeleton necklace into the combination window and combined it with a mana stone. The system notified Ryu that the combination was successful and all his stats increased by one. Ryu repeated this process for all his mana stones, which he had obtained after killing the goblins, enhancing all of his equipment. As Ryu finished preparing himself, a chilling wind suddenly swept through the area, causing panic among all the players. Youngman and his crew were even more panicked, as their stats had already been decreased by 50%. In contrast, Ryu remained calm and collected, awaiting the arrival of the Divine Punisher. He knew that even for the Divine Punisher, it wouldn't be easy to defeat him. In his previous life, there had been a time when they had failed to protect the relic, and only 500 players had barely survived by fleeing from the Divine Punisher. However, Ryu wasn't here just for himself. He was on a mission to make every holy being into holy shit, and the Divine Punisher was next in line. Suddenly, with a crackling sound, a large crack formed in the sky. And from that crack, an angel with big bright wings wearing a hoodie and holding a large golden staff with a chilling aura appeared. The Divine Punisher slowly descended to the ground, raising his wand up into the sky. Under his hoodie, two creepy eyes stared at the players as he asked, Any last words? With that, he tapped his staff onto the ground, and the entire ground started shaking. All the players were hit by a tremendous pressure and could barely stand, while Ryu gazed at the Divine Punisher like an ice cream ready to be licked. Now, a new quest has been issued, and everyone has to survive or dodge the attacks of the Divine Punisher for 30 minutes. The Divine Punisher slowly descended to the ground, raising his wand up into the sky. Under his hoodie, two creepy eyes stared at the players as he asked, Any last words? With that, he tapped his staff onto the ground, and the entire ground started shaking. All the players were hit by a tremendous pressure and could barely stand, while Ryu gazed at the Divine Punisher like an ice cream ready to be licked. Then, the purple energy wave slowly started to cover the entire area, and the system notified everyone that the agent of Divine Punisher had cast a restriction field. As the players tried to run from that area, the purple aura formed a barrier, restricting the players from going outside the area. The players started to panic and feel scared as they tried to break the barrier, but their efforts were in vain. So today's like goal is a little high. It's 6,900 likes. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you. Now let's continue. Another system notification appeared, hitting all the players with the news that the stats of those inside the barrier would be decreased by 50%. Ryu observed this from outside the barrier, realizing that 300 people were now trapped inside, and he couldn't break the barrier to save them. The Divine Punisher started to laugh, and with a flick of his wand, 
thousands of purple auras formed around him. Ryu, with a saddened expression, turned away from the 300 players and said, So it has started. Just like that, the Divine Punisher launched his attack toward all 300 players inside the barrier. Each and every arrow found its mark mercilessly, despite the players' attempts to run, hide, or defend themselves. The arrows struck them down mercilessly. Then Ryu explained that under the Divine Punisher's domain, he could gain full control over the space and use his arrows just like his own body parts, ensuring that his arrows would hit the enemy no matter what. Suddenly, Ryu positioned himself at the edge of the barrier, stating that it wasn't a big deal for him since he had fought the Divine Punisher countless times before. Standing just behind the Divine Punisher, Ryu explained that now that he was positioned behind the Divine Punisher, the Divine Punisher wouldn't be able to see him. The Divine Punisher lacked ears and could only sense everything within his barrier. With this advantage, as soon as the entire barrier lifted, Ryu, like a venomous snake, leaped high with deadly intent. He used his seal of death on the Divine Punisher, and before the Divine Punisher could react by turning back, Ryu thrust his black scythe into the Divine Punisher's right eye, popping it like a cherry. Golden blood splattered everywhere, and the Divine Punisher started to scream in pain. Ryu elegantly landed on the ground, and behind him the Divine Punisher was still screaming. In just one hit, Ryu had already drained 40% of the Divine Punisher's health. Then Ryu suddenly started running, and in anger, the Divine Punisher tapped his staff on the ground, initiating the formation of his Domain Expansion Barrier. At this point, Ryu had already memorized each and every move of the Divine Punisher. So before the barrier could trap Ryu, he was already outside the barrier and standing behind the Divine Punisher in his blind spot. Ryu explained that as soon as the Divine Punisher saw that no one was trapped under his barrier, he would release it. During the release of the barrier, the Divine Punisher couldn't attack for two seconds, and Ryu only needed that two seconds. As soon as the barrier lifted, Ryu, with a dead serious look, dashed toward the Divine Punisher, jumped high, charged his black scythe, and in a swift slash, chopped the Divine Punisher's last eye like a cherry tomato. Golden juice splashed all around the place, and now the Divine Punisher was in immense pain. This was the first time in the last 500 years that anyone had even made a scratch on his body. He didn't even know how pain felt, and now both of his eyes were punctured. As Ryu slowly landed on the ground, the Divine Punisher was still crying in pain like a baby, in immense anger. Before Ryu could leave the Divine Punisher's domain, he casted his domain expansion barrier. Now, Ryu got trapped under the barrier, and all of Ryu's stats got dropped by 50%. Sensing Ryu was trapped under his barrier, the Divine Punisher started to laugh wobbly, saying that now he would kill Ryu by piercing thousands of arrows into Ryu's ears and every hole. But Ryu just stood there with a confident look and a slight smile, saying that without the Divine Punisher's eyes, he would no longer be able to land his lightning arrow on an enemy. He explained that first, he had to see his enemy and mark them, and only then would the attack automatically hit the enemy. Now, without his eyes, he was nothing more than a living waste. In his last cry, the Divine Punisher charged his ultimate attack. He summoned thousands of lightning spears, covering the entire barrier with them. But Ryu had had enough playing with the Punisher. In an instant, he jumped, activated his Black Scythe, and had already activated the Seal of Death on the Divine Punisher. Thanks to his skeleton necklace and the title he gained from killing the Angel, his stats were now 7.5 times more potent, and with a single slash, Ryu chopped the Divine Punisher left wing. Then, the Divine Protector, still blind, tried to counterattack, but Ryu swiftly, using the staff of the Divine Punisher, jumped even higher into the sky, dodging the attack. Once again, with a swift slash, he chopped off the last wing of the Divine Punisher. As Ryu swiftly landed on the ground, the Divine Punisher was already in immense pain. With this, the Divine Punisher was left standing in silence, wondering what was happening. His job was supposed to be slaughtering players for 30 minutes and torturing them as much as his heart desired. But this was out of script. Suddenly, the Divine Punisher began to tremble and mutter something. Ryu immediately started running away from him. Now, the Divine Punisher was furious, and in a deep voice, he threatened Ryu, saying he didn't know who Ryu was, but now he would chop him into pieces and feed them to holy dogs. Ryu would not have a peaceful death. A system notification then informed everyone that the Divine Punisher had activated his passive skill. He would become invincible and all his stats would be doubled for 10 minutes. On the other hand, Ryu watched this from the side, realizing that this was why he had popped out the Divine Punisher's eyes. 
Before his death, the Divine Punisher became invincible, and when the Punisher was blind, he was just a punching bag, as he could only land his attacks by seeing his opponent. Then, with a loud scream, the Divine Punisher waved his staff, and multiple small purple portals appeared around him. Deadly light strikes started landing everywhere under the barrier at random places, trying to hit Ryu. However, Ryu, with all his stats multiplied by 7.5x, easily dodged all the attacks with a smile on his face. Finally, the time came as the Divine Punisher's invincibility wore off. Ryu immediately charged toward the Divine Punisher, and before the Punisher could even move an inch, Ryu chopped off the Punisher's head with a cold look. Golden blood started to splatter like a fountain, and Ryu stood there with a satisfying look on his face. The system notified Ryu that he had murdered the Divine Punisher and leveled up three times, gaining a total of 12,200 gold. Additionally, as Ryu was the first in history to kill a Divine Punisher, he earned the title, The One Who Opposes the Divinity. Because of this title, when fighting any divine being, he would take 80% less damage from them. Now, Ryu was standing beside the Punisher, and he had finally made the Divine Punisher into a Divine Milkshake. But it wasn't the end. The system notified Ryu that an additional reward would be given, as he didn't even get a single scratch from the Divine Punisher's attacks. Just like that, two items appeared in Ryu's hand. The first item was the skill Radiance, and without wasting any time, Ryu clenched his fist, breaking the seal, and started to absorb the skill. The second reward was a condensed ether. Ryu explained that this was called condensed ether, and despite all the gold skills and level ups he had gained, the main reason he defeated the Divine Punisher was for this item. It was an important material for crafting a Divine ranked item. Finally, he successfully absorbed the skill Radiance. With this skill, he now had a passive ability. Ryu's intelligence would increase by one with each level, and all his Divine-type skills would receive a 1% boost with each level. This meant that as he was now level 30, he would automatically have 30 intelligence, and the same applied to his Divine-type skills. Now the Punisher had been turned into a holy shit, and everyone was just standing there cheering and calling Ryu a monster. Some were even calling him their savior as he had single-handedly slaughtered the Punisher like a vegetable. As the Punisher's body was disappearing, there was a jittering sound, and an angel appeared from behind, amazed by what she saw. She commented with a, wow, amazing. Hearing this, all the players turned back in shock. The angel was floating just above Ryu's head, holding her chest and speaking in a kind voice as she praised Ryu. She couldn't believe that a human had managed to kill a Punisher, even now seeing it with her own eyes. However, Ryu didn't give a shit. He straight up ignored her and was only checking his stats. Noticing that Ryu wasn't responding, the angel playfully came floating closer to Ryu with a smile, folding her hands and suggested doing an interview. She asked Ryu how he even thought of murdering the Punisher when the system clearly stated only to survive for 30 minutes. Ryu, still not turning back and not seeing the angel's face, replied in a cold tone that he killed the Punisher because he wanted to, plain and simple. The angel curiously asked why Ryu took the risk when with his skills, he could have easily survived the round without risking his life. Ryu explained that even though he could have survived the round, he didn't want to bear the burden of seeing countless players getting slaughtered in front of him when there was a chance to save them after killing the Punisher. Now, hearing that all the players started to see Ryu with respect and admiration. They thought Ryu was a cold-hearted killing machine, but behind the cold-hearted man, there was a kind soul hiding. Hearing this, the angel went into deep thought, saying, One minute, humans kill each other. And the next minute, they want to save each other. Humans are really weird. But then she turned her head away, saying it's none of her business. Ryu, with a warm smile, thought to himself that these celestial beings would never understand human emotion. Then the angel cleared her throat to get everyone's attention. With a mischievous smile, she announced her intention to announce the top 25% and eliminate the remaining players. A huge hologram appeared in front of everyone, and upon seeing it, Every player was bewildered. Ryu alone had killed 3,600 monsters, and on top of that, he was level 30. The second-ranked player hadn't even killed a 1,000 monsters. Ryu was simply too much of a monster. As always, the system recognized Ryu as the number one-ranked player worldwide and rewarded him with a special prize, an intermediate-grade rare ring selection coupon. 
Ryu didn't waste a single second and used the coupon. Three rings appeared in front of him. The Ring of Rushing Wind, the Ring of Azure Magic, and the Ring of Resistance. Ryu chose the Ring of Resistance, which increased his luck by four and enhanced his resistance by 30% against status effects. This choice was crucial, as acquiring resistance against status effects was only possible by ranking first in round three. Lastly, the reward for ranking one in his zone arrived as always. This time, Ryu decided not to choose the 50% stat boost, stating that in round four, there were no monsters to kill, making a stats boost a waste of time. Instead, he chose 4,000 gold. While Ryu was busy managing his stats, a chilling and terrifying voice echoed from behind him. The angel, with a joyful expression, announced that it was time for her favorite game, killing the useless player. After some calculations, she grinned and flicked her hand. Just like that, the players who hadn't made it to the top 25% slowly began to disappear, experiencing immense pain. Finally, after agonizing moments, they died, screaming. The scene then shifted, and we saw Shrin waking up from her bed. First, she checked her body for injuries. Then, she slowly got out of bed, and with a flick of her hand, a cute little creature appeared. This creature had a bee-like head, butterfly-like wings, and a bird-like body. The creature landed on her shoulder, and she explained that these cute creatures were fairies. Thanks to them, she had survived round three as the fairies worked as shields to protect her and even healed her wound and took out a purple crystal from her inventory, saying that she had obtained this mysterious crystal while killing monsters. She stood beside the window, pondering whether to give this crystal to Black Scythe and wondering if he would like it. A blush crept onto her face as she thought about it. Meanwhile, as soon as Youngman woke up from his sleep, he grabbed his lantern and angrily threw it into the wall, shattering it. He was sweating and clearly furious because the system had notified him that the penalty had been applied. Now all his stats had been permanently reduced by 50%. Now Youngman was really nervous and worried as he watched his phone ring in his hand. It was a call from his friend, the one on whom he had used his authority skill. After staring at his phone screen for a moment, he finally answered it, his voice chilling. He tried to say hello, but his friend cut him off midway and started cursing him, calling him crazy. Youngman still attempting to act like he didn't know what was going on, asked his friend what he was talking about. On the other side of the phone, his friend was becoming increasingly frustrated. He couldn't hold back any longer and burst into anger, shouting furiously and continuing to curse Youngman. He accused Youngman of playing the innocent card after ruining his entire life. So guys, today's like goal is 9,000 likes and I thank you all from the bottom of my ass, from the bottom of my heart for supporting this channel, now let's continue. He asked how Youngman could use the authority skill on his own friends, causing all their stats to decrease by 50%. Now, how would they survive in future rounds? Youngman, attempting to justify himself, replied that he didn't have a choice. Black Scythe himself had given him the order, and if he hadn't followed Black Scythe's command, he would have been killed. So, he claimed he had no choice in the matter. His friend, annoyed and still furious, retorted that Youngman should have chosen to die rather than harm his friends. He said that someone who, just because they were at risk of dying, would harm their friends was no true friend. Youngman hadn't even tried to find a way to convince Black Scythe otherwise or explore alternative options. Instead, he had blindly followed Black Scythe's orders and used the authority skill, indicating that he didn't care about what happened to his crew members and friends. His friend told Youngman, that if he wanted to learn about true friendship, he should watch One Piece. And now Youngman could go and die in a gutter, because they were no longer friends. Youngman listened to this in silence, but then Youngman, also shouting and tapping his chest while addressing his friend angrily, replied that he was also affected, as his stats got decreased by 50% because he was the zone leader and failed to protect the Crystal Ruin. However, his friend cut him off mid-sentence and started shouting at Youngman again, accusing him of playing the I am also a victim card. His friend emphasized that all of this had happened because Youngman was greedy. Youngman had been obsessed with getting the authority skill to confront Aaron, and this was all he used to talk about. His friend continued to curse Youngman, while Youngman could do nothing but listen with an annoyed and frustrated expression. Then, Youngman tried to say something about figuring out how to get their stats back, but his friend cut him off once more. His friend stated that, as he had mentioned before, Youngman could go and die in a gutter, and from that day on, they were no longer friends. His friend made it clear that Youngman should not call or try to contact him. He warned Youngman that if they ever met in the real world or the other world, he might be tempted to kill Youngman out of anger. 
With that final warning, his friend ended the call, leaving Youngman standing there silently, glaring at his phone screen. Then, in frustration, Youngman immediately started dialing his other friend's number, stating that he would command all his other buddies to crush the friend who had just called him. However, each and every one of his friends had already blocked his number, and he was unable to contact a single friend. Frustrated, Youngman threw his phone onto his bed and glared at it in anger. He said he didn't need anyone to live his life, as only pigs and sheep roam in groups, and tigers move alone. He considered himself a tiger, even though his stats had decreased by 50%. Grinding his teeth, Youngman vowed to rip each of their body parts one by one, torture them until they begged to die, and then kill each and every one of his buddies, reducing them to pieces of shit. The scene then shifts back to the Imperial Hotel, where the Heavenly Demon is staying. We see the bodyguard bowing his head politely and the Heavenly Demon, casually dressed in his usual black t-shirt and pants, sitting in his office chair. He complimented the bodyguard for passing the third round and expressed relief that he was alive. However, the bodyguard, maintaining his polite tone, replied that he was just lucky and that he had passed the third round because the monsters were weakened, making it easier to deal with them. The Heavenly Demon then asked the bodyguard about his current level and whether he had managed to obtain a class. The bodyguard replied, still maintaining his polite tone, that he had reached level 11 and had been fortunate enough to acquire the class of knight. Then the bodyguard said that Aaron had also reached level 11, but she got a rather unique class called Summoner. Hearing the term Summoner, the Heavenly Demon became curious and asked the bodyguard to explain this in detail. The bodyguard raised his hand and, with a serious face, started explaining that, at first, he himself had been surprised. Now, Aaron can summon little creatures called fairies who can cast magical spells. These spells can do things like using skills such as protection shield or even healing minor injuries. Thanks to Aaron's ability, he had been able to successfully hunt and survive the third round. The Heavenly Demon listened in silence. After thinking for some time, the Heavenly Demon, with a smiling face, said to the bodyguard that he should maintain a close relationship with Aaron because she seemed to have a really interesting class. In the future, she might become a very strong and important person. The Heavenly Demon also suggested that if the bodyguard wanted to, he could even date Aaron, as she was actually quite a gorgeous lady. So if the bodyguard managed to become affectionate with Aaron, she would always be with them, and their team or forces would grow stronger because they needed more powerful awakeners, as Earth would no longer be peaceful in the future. Upon hearing this, the bodyguard became a little flustered, saying he couldn't do it because he was a virgin and didn't have the courage to be romantic, especially with Aaron. He just lacked the confidence. However, Heavenly Demon, with a chuckle, told him he was just teasing about the dating part, as he hadn't seen the bodyguard laugh in a long time. But seeing the bodyguard getting shy indicated that he had feelings for Aaron. Heavenly Demon suggested that the bodyguard could try dating Aaron. Hearing this, the bodyguard grew a bit worried, realizing that even if he tried, Aaron would likely reject him outright. He was certain of it. Heavenly Demon then asked if the bodyguard was still a man, to which the bodyguard replied that he was, but the problem was different. Aaron still addressed him with a formal tone, calling him Mr. Bodyguard. Heavenly Demon decided to put an end to the playful banter and urged them to discuss the serious matters at hand. The bodyguard bowed his head and began explaining. He first apologized, stating that he had failed to carry out the Heavenly Demon's order to help and approach Black Scythe. Additionally, he hadn't been able to deliver the message that the Heavenly Demon had intended for Black Scythe. The bodyguard took a seat on a sofa and proceeded to recount everything that had occurred in round three, starting from the death of the Musclehead and covering all the events. The Heavenly Demon listened attentively with a serious expression, maintaining silence throughout the narration. After the bodyguard had explained everything, the Heavenly Demon sat in contemplation, placing his hand on his chin. He remarked that based on the description of the bodyguard, the Divine Punisher seemed like a powerful entity, and even he, the Heavenly Demon, wouldn't have been confident enough to face it alone. The atmosphere turned gloomy. Hesitantly, the bodyguard continued, suggesting that individuals like Black Scythe, who were exceptionally strong and self-reliant, often had significant egos, making it nearly impossible to work together with them. The heavenly demon remained silent, wearing a serious expression, contemplating the information. He began to think that Black Scythe's stats must exceed their imagination, and his class, Black Scythe, sounded incredibly formidable. 
so much so that the heavenly demon felt a sense of shame, considering himself strong with his unique class, Dark Knight. With determination in his eyes, he wished to meet Black Scythe face to face and engage in a manly conversation. Then, still maintaining his serious expression, the heavenly demon replied that it was not the bodyguard's fault, and they couldn't hold him accountable for the mission's failure. The bodyguard once again apologized for falling short in the mission. The heavenly demon, while taking a sip of his cold whiskey with his usual serious demeanor, diverted the conversation away from Black Scythe and asked about the results of tracking down the thugs who had attempted to harass Arin. The bodyguard responded by mentioning that the boss had a nickname, Youngman, although it was unclear if that was his real name. The challenge was that there were thousands of people with the name Youngman worldwide, making it nearly impossible to track them all down. However, assuming he was in his 20s and looked identical to his real-life self, they narrowed the search to Koreans, reducing the pool of suspects to five individuals. Upon hearing this, the heavenly demon inquired about the current locations of these five people. The bodyguard, still a bit nervous, explained that it would take some time to pinpoint their exact home addresses due to the world's current situation, causing delays in the investigation process. Holding his whiskey with a disappointed expression, the heavenly demon remarked that he wouldn't be able to locate that individual before round four, even though he was eager to confront them. The bodyguard refilled the heavenly demon's glass with more whiskey and reassured him that there was no need to rush and they could take their time. The heavenly demon then asked the bodyguard about his gold reserves, and the bodyguard mentioned that he had 10,000 gold. The heavenly demon deemed it sufficient and explained that there was a skill called tracking available in the shop for 20,000 gold, which the bodyguard should learn as soon as he collected enough gold. The bodyguard agreed and expressed his determination to acquire the skill. The bodyguard hesitantly called the heavenly demon and mentioned that he had forgotten to mention an important detail. He explained that last month, an individual had purchased a significant number of stocks in the Heavenly Demon's company. The Heavenly Demon, maintaining his usual serious demeanor, inquired about the specific company involved. The bodyguard replied that it was the main company, Heavenly Demon Consulting, which he had been actively working for over the past few weeks. The Heavenly Demon paused for a moment, then set his whiskey glass on the table and asked about the quantity of shares the person had acquired. The bodyguard revealed that the individual had bought all the available shares on the market and now held a 31% stake in the entire company. Upon hearing this, the usually serious expression on the heavenly demon's face gave way to a mild shock. He exclaimed his disbelief, wondering how one person could purchase 31% of an entire company. The heavenly demon sat on the sofa, deep in thought contemplating the market value of Heavenly Demon Consulting, which stood at 720 million United States dollars. To acquire 31% of the company, someone had invested a staggering 212.8 million United States dollars. He pondered who this wealthy individual could be and whether it might be one of his brother's actions. After reflecting for some time, his expression turned serious once more, and he concluded that someone who bought such a significant stake likely intended to become directly involved in the company's management. He picked up his phone and instructed his department head to gather information about the person who had acquired the 31% stake in the company. Meanwhile, Ryu lay on his bed, holding his phone, eagerly awaiting a phone call. He knew that even though he wanted to meet the heavenly demon, he couldn't contact them first. He had to demonstrate that he was the real deal. Ryu was confident that the heavenly demon would contact him any moment now especially after discovering that someone had bought a 31% stake in his company, which had only started a few months ago and wasn't particularly big or well-known. Suddenly, Wooni burst into Ryu's room, shouting loudly, Brother, what level are you? Ryu, startled by the sudden door slam, dropped his phone and it hit him in the face. With a slightly red face due to the unexpected impact, Ryu asked Wooni why he was asking this out of the blue. Wooney, with a worried expression, explained that there was a kid who acted all high and mighty, bragging that his brother was a high-level player. This kid and his friends kept making fun of Wooney, saying that his brother was already level 11, had a class, and was very strong while Wooney and his brother were losers. Upon hearing level 11, Ryu let out a sigh and a playful smile, assuring Wooney not to worry because he was higher level than that. Excitedly, Wooney asked Ryu what level he was, and Ryu began to ponder. He considered whether he should tell the truth, knowing that if he did, Wooney might get into trouble again. With a warm smile, Ryu told Wooney that he was level 12. Hearing this, 
Wuni's eyes filled with excitement and admiration, and he exclaimed that Ryu was the best in the world. He then asked if Ryu also had a class, to which Ryu replied affirmatively, saying he did indeed have a class. Wuni's eyes sparkled with curiosity as he asked about the name of Ryu's class. However, Ryu simply lied down on his bed, going under the blanket, and playfully mentioned that it was a secret. He added that he would tell Wuni everything when the right time came. Frustrated, Wuni insisted that there should be no secrets between brothers, but Ryu, claiming fatigue, said he needed to sleep and promised to tell Wuni later. Annoyed, Wuni left the room, stating that he would definitely find out Ryu's class when he woke up, and he closed the door in frustration. Then, as Ryu was about to sleep, his phone started to ring, and it was the call of the Heavenly Demon. Ryu picked up the call, and the Heavenly Demon introduced himself as the CEO of the company. He inquired if it was a suitable time to talk. Ryu, with a slight smile, decided to play the role of a naive beginner who had just started investing in the stock market. He thought that the more he appeared like a pushover, the more the Heavenly Demon would let his guard down, making his plan go smoothly. So Ryu replied that it was indeed the right time to talk. The Heavenly Demon, with a polite tone, asked if Ryu had purchased a large amount of stock in his company, and Ryu pretended to be startled and nervous as he confirmed that he had. The Heavenly Demon then informed Ryu that, with his recent purchase, he now owned 31% of the company. He expressed his desire to meet Ryu and suggested going for a meal. He proposed a lunch meeting on Friday. Ryu, after a moment of thinking, remembered that on Friday he had an important task. He was planning to make the person who kidnapped Wani on his seventh life regret it, so he politely declined the offer for Friday, citing his prior commitments. Instead, he suggested Saturday, which the Heavenly Demon agreed to. With that, the phone call ended. Ryu, now wearing a confident smile, muttered to himself, Tomorrow is Friday, and it's the day when Wani's kidnapper will face justice. I'll make so many holes in that bastard's body that he won't know from where to fart and from where to take a breath. The next day, he went into a deserted factory at night. As Ryu walked, he explained that there are many ways to obtain a skill rune. Until now, people believed that skill runes could only be found inside dungeons after fulfilling special conditions, such as killing the Divine Punisher. In extremely rare cases, one could get a skill rune by killing normal mobs under certain conditions, like killing 100 virgin goblins while still being a virgin on a full moon night. However, this wasn't the only way. Skill runes could also be obtained in the real world. Ryu reached a deserted factory as he continued to explain. He secretly entered the factory and clarified that the time had finally come for him to confront the person who had kidnapped Wani in his previous life. Ryu went inside the factory and sat beside some box, waiting patiently. He explained that a person named Zhang would come there, a morally corrupt man who had killed Wani nine times. Ryu couldn't do anything but cry in pain in those past lives. Now, Ryu intended to torture him in such a way that he would beg to be killed. Ryu was determined that anyone in the world who even thought of harming Wani would face his wrath, even if they were a god. Then we jump back to a flashback of Ryu, where, for the first time, the morally corrupt man kidnapped Wani and brought him to this very same factory. Wani's eyes were covered with a black cloth, and Jang was holding an ice dagger threatening Ryu. He demanded Ryu spill all the details about future events, or he would kill Wani with a wicked smile. Naive Ryu, on the other hand, didn't know what to do. He tried to pretend he was clueless, questioning how he could possibly know what's going to happen in the future. Hearing this, Jang started to laugh maniacally. Then his expression turned sinister, and with a deadly look, he accused Ryu, Don't lie, you mommy milker. I know you're a regressor. Hearing this, Ryu panicked. The only person he had told he was a regressor was Wani, and he knew Wani would never reveal this under any circumstance. So how? As Ryu reeled in immense shock and tension, Zhang, continuing with his wicked smile, explained that he possessed the skill of inner thought, allowing him to read anyone's mind. Wow, we? If I had that skill, I'd be a banger in bed with my girlfriend. Now back to the story. Ryu was tortured by the sight of Wani being kidnapped and killed 11 times in his first 11 lives, even though he never told Wani that he was a regressor. One way or another, Zhang always ended up discovering that Ryu was a regressor. In the end, Wani always ended up kidnapped and killed, even after Ryu divulged all the details about the future. This was because Zhang was a morally corrupt, violent criminal who knew nothing but violence. Now back to the present, Ryu was wearing a white, creepy mask while explaining that this was the only reason he was killing the king of shit each and every time before he ended up kidnapping Wani in each of his regressions, and this was his 100th time. This time, 
Ryu's mission was not only to kill Zhang by torturing him, but also to acquire the skill of inner thought. Just then, Zhang entered the factory, carrying a woman tied with ropes over his shoulders from the back. He forcefully threw the woman onto a mattress he had prepared in advance for all his victims, those he brought here to satisfy his naughty need. With a creepy voice, while removing the tape from the woman's mouth, Zhang said he was going to remove the tape so she wouldn't yell. The woman was terrified, shivering in fear. As soon as Zhang removed the tape, the woman, with a trembling voice, started to beg for mercy. She repeatedly pleaded to be spared, but Zhang, sitting casually and with a laugh, replied that was all she had to say once he let her talk. She should say something dirty and sexy. Then Zhang's expression turned a bit creepy. His aura became sinister, and with a deadly look, he said, Save me, I have a kid, or I will give you as much money as you need. But this plea was futile. The only thing Zhang wanted was to have his twisted form of fun with her. Then Zhang threw the tape backward and with a serious tone asked the woman if she knew why this was happening to her. The woman, even more terrified, joined both of her hands. Still with her trembling voice, she replied that Zhang is probably doing this because she glared at him the other day. That day, Zhang had offered her to spend a night with him, and she's really sorry for rejecting him, explaining she's married with a kid. How could she sleep with another man? That's why she rejected his offer, not because he looked like a piece of shit. Hearing this, Zhang got even more pissed off. He remembered that day and how he felt so damn shitty when she rejected him. Then we go back two days to when all this started. Zhang was just walking on the street searching for a girl to have fun with. Yeah, Zhang is a big pervert. Just then, he noticed a pretty girl walking beside him. After checking her out, Zhang commented on her nice body. He followed her as she walked into a dark, less crowded alley. Zhang activated his skill, and his whole body started to glow, startling the girl. In panic, she dropped her phone. The light was so intense that her vision went dark, and she became blind for a moment. Panicked and trying to comprehend what was happening, but Zhang, taking advantage of this situation, grabbed the girl's boobs, and well, you know what happened next. After having his twisted fun with the girl, Zhang, with a sinister smile, quickly made his escape before she could regain her vision. He casually mentioned how he enjoyed doing this with different girls every night, reveling in his sadistic acts. He explained that just a few months ago, his life had been rather dull after his release from jail. He didn't care whether he lived or died until that fateful day when a hot angel transported him to another world and granted him a skill that allowed him to temporarily blind anyone. It was then that he realized the sinister potential of this newfound ability. Returning to the present, Jang decided to visit a store to buy some coffee. In the store, a woman in her mid-30s welcomed him with a warm smile. As soon as he saw her face, he couldn't help but once again laugh wickedly, thinking about her attractive appearance and curvaceous body. Approaching the counter, he ordered an Americano, and she, still maintaining her warm smile and polite tone, informed him that the Americano would be ready in a few minutes and that the total bill was 5,001. With a wicked smile and a lustful demeanor, Jang handed the woman the money and inquired if she was new here. He mentioned that he was a regular visitor to the cafe but had never seen her before. The woman, still maintaining her smile but sighing softly, explained that due to the current chaos in the world, all the part-timers had left the shop, so she had taken up the vacant position. She apologized for not recognizing him earlier as she was new to the cafe. Then, maintaining his flirting tone, Jiang asked the woman if she was the owner of this cafe. She, while bringing the Americano, replied, yes, she is the owner. Then Jiang playfully asked how old she was, noting she looked quite young and pretty. She replied she's 32 years old. Jiang, again with an ugly smile, asked if that meant she wasn't a player. She replied yes, she wasn't, gladly stating she wouldn't have to live with the constant fear of dying every month. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Jiang, maintaining his ugly smile and shit-like face, said with a lustful look that he really liked the cafe woman and asked if she'd go out with him. Hearing this, she got a little confused and paused for a moment to process what she just heard and what to say. While she was standing still like a statue with a confused look, Yang, seeing this, got really pissed off. Banging his hand on the counter, he asked if his face was that ugly that she was making this type of face while staring at him. Was she disgusted just because he had a few spots on his face? If she was, she's a huge dummy, as his banana is really huge, and she would beg Zhang to go out with him every night once she rides Zhang's banana. Hearing this, the cafe woman really felt disgusted and didn't say anything. Seeing this, Zhang got even more pissed off and punched the counter, declaring he wouldn't be drinking coffee here anymore. 
He demanded his money back, saying she was really an ugly old hag and she should fuck off. Now, hearing this, the cafe woman got a little scared, thinking Zhang was a psycho who might do something unthinkable. With trembling hands, she returned the money. Zhang forcefully took the money from her hand and furiously left the store, calling her a bitch. He ranted about how she was looking down on others just because she was a little hot and he had some spots on his face. Zhang vowed to make her pay for looking down on him. After that, he followed the cafe woman for two days. When she was in a silent, dark alley, Zhang struck her head with an iron bat and brought her to this deserted factory. Now, back in the present, the cafe woman was still begging, joining her hands and bowing while trembling. Zhang was enjoying the scene, seeing her begging and getting scared. Then after some time, Zhang turned back, saying this wasn't fun as she wasn't being sincere enough and not begging sincerely. He pushed her back onto the mattress, and she fell to the floor. Zhang held her hand and opened his pants zip, stating he knew everything, that she was only pretending to apologize to get out of the situation and she still didn't like Zhang. He asserted that only by riding his banana and enjoying the night could she prove that she was really sorry. This, he declared, was her punishment. While the cafe woman continued to beg and cry, Ryu from the shadows slowly walked forward with his black scythe. Then Zhang's facial expression really became sinister and full of lust. Lust was just dripping from his face as he began his play by removing her bra. But just then, a deep footstep echoed through the entire hall. Hearing the sound, Zhang got startled, and fear covered his entire body. He panicked, thinking that he thought this place was deserted. Why was there a person here? He wondered if this person was a detective who had followed him to arrest him. In panic, he turned back, shouting, Who is it? while cursing whoever was there. Ryu, while holding his black scythe on his shoulder and walking sideways, said in a deep tone not to curse and not to waste his energy by shouting. He told Jiang he would be cursing and shouting a lot, so he should save his energy. Seeing Ryu, wearing a white mask and carrying this huge-ass scythe, Jiang started to think who this guy might be. Then he realized that he was not a detective or police, as no police or detective would come here hiding their face. So Jang, continuing with his trashy personality, said, Does Ryu think this is a place to play with that toy of his? He said that now Ryu had seen Jang's face, so Ryu had to pay the price by dying. As he continued to spew his bullshit, Ryu just listened with a silent face. Then, after hearing Jang's bullshit, Ryu finally raised his black scythe with a deadly look, saying it looked like Jang hadn't figured out the situation yet. While swinging his black scythe with great force, Ryu said, Does this look like a toy? If yeah, then Ryu will be putting this toy of his into Jang's ass and he'll make sure Jang enjoys it. Just the swing was enough to create a small shockwave around Ryu. Seeing this, Jang realized that the black scythe was indeed real. Then Ryu turned towards the cafe woman and, politely addressing her as ma'am, said she could leave now and he would take care of this king of shit. She, still trembling and joining her hands, first paused for a moment, then tried to get up. But before she could do anything, Jang shoutingly turned towards the cafe woman and started yelling at her in a loud voice. He demanded to know on whose permission she was trying to get up, asking if he had given her permission to go. This made her tremble in fear even more. Now having had enough of Zhang's bullshit, Ryu dashed towards Zhang with his black scythe. Zhang also got alert and got ready to defend himself. But even before he could react, bam, Ryu popped Zhang's balls by giving a good hit to Zhang's balls. The pain was so intense that for a moment, his breath stopped. His whole body felt like it was on fire and getting electric shocks all over. Then Zhang fell on the floor, holding his little PP, screaming in pain. His whole body was shivering, and he was cursing Ryu. Ryu stood with a satisfied look, watching Zhang in pain, and reminded him that he had just said a moment before that Zhang would be swearing his ass off. He told Zhang this was just the beginning, and just like before, he should save his energy. Ryu once again turned toward the cafe lady and said now was the time for her to leave. He advised the lady not to talk about what happened outside and to act like nothing happened. The cafe lady, after seeing Ryu, got so scared that it felt like her soul had left her body. With a shaky voice, she thanked Ryu and, in an instant, started running toward the exit. Ryu, swinging his black scythe downward, turned his attention back to Jiang. He said that now, in this deserted factory, there were only the two of them, so they could enjoy the entire night without anyone interfering. Jiang was still kneeling on the ground, holding his little PP, still shaking in pain. The pain was so intense that it was getting hard for him to even breathe. After watching Jiang moan in pain for a while, 
Ryu's facial expression became really sinister, and he gave a creepy smile, saying, Now, shall we begin the real game, shall we? Then Jang got furious, veins starting to foam on his face. His eyes widened as if they would pop out any moment now. He continued to curse Ryu, saying he would kill him and prepared to attack while holding his dagger. Ryu, seeing this, let out a slight laugh, saying he liked Jang's reaction. He mentioned it's no fun to torture and kill someone who has left the hope to live. One who wants to live and has ego, it's his favorite thing to break that ego. Jang, seeing Ryu smiling, had enough of Ryu. With one hand on his little PP and the other hand holding the dagger, he charged towards Ryu to kill him while shouting and screaming. Jang dashed towards Ryu and started a barrage of attacks with his ice dagger. But Ryu just dodged all the attacks. Jang continued to attack Ryu. After a moment, Jang was really getting frustrated, thinking how the hell Ryu was dodging all his attacks like he could see the future. He was getting sweaty and more and more frustrated. Ryu, still dodging the attacks like playing with a two-year-old kid, commented laughingly that he couldn't believe Jang was still carrying that shitty ice dagger that a goblin holds that everyone has in round one. Now, at this moment, Ryu had enough play. So the next moment, Ryu jumped beside Jang, and just as Jang stretched his hand to attack Ryu with his dagger, Ryu, in a single slash, chopped off Jang's hand. Now, blood was splattering from Jang's hands like a fountain. Jang, seeing this blood, first got a panic attack. Then, as the pain kicked in, he started to scream his lungs out, just standing there not knowing what to do. His whole body was trembling, and Ryu was just watching this scene with an enjoyable mood, getting happy seeing the morally corrupted king of shit crying in pain. Then, Ryu tauntingly asked Jang, Does it hurt, huh? He said if it does, Jang should brace himself as he hadn't even started yet. It's just the trailer. Jang, at this moment, still in immense pain, grinding his teeth, his face turning pale, holding his hand with his other hand to stop the blood from splattering, realized he was fucked up. But before he could even take a breath, Ryu just vanished from his position and, in an instant, dashed toward poor Jang. Whoosh! Ryu slashed Jong's other hand also in a swift slash, and Jong couldn't do anything but scream like a donkey. Blood was just splattering from both of his hands, his vision was getting blurry, and he was feeling dizzy. His whole body was on fire, and fear overtook his mind. Jang was scared to his core, thinking at this rate Ryu would really kill him like a chicken getting slaughtered for dinner. And if he really wanted to live, first he would have to use his ability to blind Ryu, then he would run for his life, depending on it. Then Jang glared at Ryu for a moment, and seeing that Ryu was just standing there watching and getting happy from Jang's screaming, he saw an opportunity. Jang instantly activated his skill while screaming and cursing Ryu. Jang's whole body started to glow, and at that moment he decided before running, he would at least pop Ryu's fucking eyes. He shouted, Die, you fucking shit! But the next moment, something unexpected happened. His body, which was glowing, slowly saw its light start to dim, and then his entire body's glow began to fade, effectively canceling his skill. Jang got confused, thinking, what the hell is happening here? Then, with a jolt of realization, he understood that whatever the reason, his skill didn't work, and now he was going to die. On top of that, he had just cursed Ryu, saying he would kill him, so there was no room for even begging. Thinking this, he was dripping with sweat while grinding his teeth. Ryu, still laughing under his mask, explained that Jang's shining skill would not work on Ryu, as no light on earth could even come near him. Ryu knew this would happen, so in advance, he had cast his skill Night of Death that he acquired in round three. By using it, he could command the darkness, ensuring no fucking light on earth could even come near him. Then Ryu once again prepared his black scythe to attack Jang. Jang was so scared that he felt he might shit his pants any moment now, even before Jang could do anything, whoosh. The next moment, Ryu, in an instant, cold-heartedly, in a swift slash, chopped both of Jang's legs like cutting butter. For a moment, Jang didn't even realize what happened, and he was just standing there. The next moment, his torso got separated from his legs, and his balance was lost. Jang fell down on the floor while screaming. Just like before, Ryu was just watching this beautiful scene from behind, enjoying it. Now, Jang's spirit finally broke. He, while dragging his body, came close to Ryu while crying. His whole body was trembling, and at this moment, so much blood was lost from his body that his whole body was turning pale. Cryingly, Jang asked Ryu why the hell he was doing this to him, addressing Ryu as a demon. Just hearing the word, why, Ryu got really pissed off. First, he raised his black scythe high, and with a pinch, 
stabbed and punctured Zhang's left leg, while continuing to make multiple holes on Zhang's body and piercing his black scythe with a break, he said, Why do people kill mosquitoes? Because letting them live, they will at the end come to suck people's blood, so it's better to kill them even before they bite. Now at this moment, Zhang, who had lost his will, still had tears in his eyes. He was really getting frustrated, saying that Ryu is a psychopath and asking if he had run out from a mental asylum. Ryu, hearing this, again laughed, saying it looked like a little bit of spirit was still dwelling inside Zhang. He wondered how long Zhang could keep this attitude of his. With that, Ryu continued to puncture Zhang's body with his black scythe. Zhang continued to scream, and Ryu took his sweet time to slowly make so many holes in Zhang's body, just like he said he would, so that Zhang would get confused about from which hole he would fart and from which hole he would breathe. After a few minutes, Zhang had finally lost it, as Ryu was not hitting any vitals and was attacking Zhang in such a way that he stayed awake while feeling this hellish pain. Zhang started to think about what grudge Ryu had against him. Now, at this moment, the last bit of spirit just left Zhang's body. Saliva was coming out from his mouth, mucus from his nose. He was crying, thinking of just killing himself as it was better to die than to suffer this hellish torture. Then, after gathering some courage, Zhang finally decided to kill himself by biting his tongue. He closed his eyes, opened his mouth while sticking his tongue out, and prepared to bite his tongue. But before he could bite his tongue, Ryu stopped him by placing his black scythe near his neck, startling him. Zhang slowly turned his gaze upward, seeing Ryu. Ryu, furious with a deep, chilling voice, asked, What's wrong? Is Zhang planning to die by biting his tongue? Does Zhang think Ryu will just let him die this easily? The next moment, Ryu, continuing with his cold aura, raised his black scythe and swish, pierced Zhang's shoulder, and again blood started to splatter. Ryu declared he would not let Zhang die until he made Zhang beg on his knees for death. Zhang could do nothing but scream, and once again, Ryu began his piercing game. He continued to stab again and again on all parts of Zhang's body, from his ass to shoulder to even his little pee pee. Ugh, just by seeing it, I am feeling a little dizzy. Well, anyways, at this moment, Zhang had lost his mind. He was just lying on his back, barely alive but still feeling the hellish pain. Tears were not stopping from coming out of his eyes, and blood was coming from his nose. With a shaky voice, Zhang was begging to get killed and die. At this point, even I am feeling a little bad for him. Then Ryu, hearing this, asked Zhang to say it again as he hadn't heard what Zhang said. Zhang, still with a shaky voice, said, Kill me, kill me, please. Ryu just watched him begging to get killed with a satisfying look. Then, after some time, Ryu, finally feeling satisfied, withdrew his black scythe. Placing his black scythe on his shoulder, Ryu, with a joyful tone, said Jang didn't know why he was doing this to him, right? To Jang, Ryu was a total stranger. And Jang, at this moment, was in such a state that he just glared at Ryu, not even able to say anything. Then Ryu continued, telling Jang that Ryu might be a total stranger. But to Ryu, Jang was not. He was a guy because of whom Ryu got nightmares at one point. Now, hearing this and realizing Ryu even knew his name, Jang started to think who even Ryu was. With his shaky voice, he asked if Ryu was someone who was related to the cafe woman, or anyone he had fun with in the last few months. Ryu smilingly replied that he had no connection with any woman. Hearing this, Jang asked then why Ryu was doing this to him. Ryu finally revealed the truth, saying Jang kidnapped his little precious brother and threatened Ryu to give Jang the hidden information he had. Hearing this, Jang was shocked, saying he didn't even know who Ryu was, let alone about his little brother. Now, hearing this, Ryu laughingly commented, Of course Jang doesn't know it because it's an incident that will happen in the future. After 15 days from today, Jang will kidnap his little brother and then torture him and then kill him. And there's a second reason Ryu is doing all this to Jang. To acquire the ruin of inner thought. Today was the day Jang was destined to acquire the skill inner thought. Hearing this, Jang was confused, asking, What the hell is Ryu talking about? Ryu explained that today, Jang would have raped the cafe woman. And after begging from her heart for Jang not to do it, Jang would have gotten the ruin of inner thought. The condition to get the ruin of inner thought was that, in this exact, deserted factory, a person had to beg from his heart, and the person to whom the person will beg will get the ruin of inner thought. After acquiring this inner thought, Jang will become the biggest criminal the world will ever see. So Ryu was just doing his job, removing a bug from this already messed up world. As Ryu continued to explain, 
Jang just listened with a bewildered expression. Ryu continued to explain that in his past 99 lives, even when Ryu tried his best not to come face to face with Jang, one way or another, Jang always ended up finding out about Ryu that he is a repressor. And each and every time, Jang kidnapped his little brother and killed him. So Jang is really a morally corrupted individual who deserves to just die. Hearing this, Jang said if he really deserved to die, then just quickly kill him, as he couldn't bear the pain anymore. But Ryu replied, Nope, I'm not even going to touch a single hair of Jang now. Hearing this, Jang's whole world turned upside down. He started to scream and cry even more, saying he just wanted to die now, and started to beg greatly. Ryu, having heard enough of this, raised the handle of his black scythe and placed it on Jang's mouth to shut him up. With a cold, chilling aura while glaring at Jang, Ryu said, Now, I will not do anything. I, Ryu, will just sit here and watch Jang die slowly, tortured by the pain. Jang's vision finally became dark. He was not able to feel his arms or legs, but the pain was not going away. He was trembling in pain, thinking if Ryu really wanted the ruin of inner thought, he would want him alive, right? So why was Ryu giving him such a hellish punishment? Ryu then replied that he was not letting him speak because he wanted to test the skill in her thought. Hearing this, Zhang's eyes widened, and Ryu explained that just a moment ago, he finally got the skill in her thought. Ryu was just testing the skill, so he was really sorry for that. As just a moment ago, Zhang really begged from his heart to get killed. At that moment, Ryu got the skill. Then we go back a few moments to when Ryu got the skill in her thought. As soon as he acquired the skill, the system notified him that he had obtained the skill inner thought. The system explained that by observing the target, Ryu could hear the inner thoughts of his target, and he could only read the thoughts of the person when the target is within 30 meters of him. Now, back to the present, Ryu, still placing his black scythe's handle on Jang's mouth, said he was just testing the skill to see if it was working properly or not, and it looks like it is working. Jang, in his mind, thought that since Ryu finally got what he wanted, he once again begged Ryu to kill him. But Ryu, continuing with his cold aura while glaring, said, Nah, I can't kill Zhang so easily. That would be too unfair for all the victims of Zhang's. Hearing this, Zhang could do nothing but grind his teeth, trying to chew the handle of the black scythe while thinking Ryu is a damn demon. After half an hour, Zhang finally slowly dies. Then Ryu stood up, glaring at Zhang with a satisfying look as if he had won a war. He then used the skill Erase Traces that he bought in round three. By using it, he could erase all the traces of blood, corpse, fingerprints, or anything. Just like that, a green aura surrounded Jang's body, and in an instant, Jang's body started to disappear. After a moment, everything was clear. Jang's body disappeared. Not a single hair of Jang was left. Then Ryu finally took off his mask, turned back, and while walking outside the factory said, Now it's time to meet the heavenly demon. Now, after dealing with Zhang, Ryu was getting ready to meet the heavenly demon. He wore a formal black shirt with a black coat and a gray tie. His hair was styled just right. Seeing Ryu dressed like this, Wani also got shocked and in awe. He asked Ryu if he was going on a date with a girl, keeping his hand on his mouth in shock. He was himself surprised at how his virgin brother could look so hot. Ryu turned toward Wani and paused for a moment, as he may be the god of death, but he is a total loser when it comes to date. So Ryu, with a sweet smile, replied, Nope, I'm not. Wani asked this because Ryu just wore this black suit out of nowhere. Ryu, still with a sweet smile, explained that it's because he has an important meeting with someone, and it's not a girl, it's for a business-related thing. Wani, a little concerned, asked if Ryu was starting a business. Ryu, with a slight smile and holding his iPhone 21 Pro Max Ultra Giga Max Edition, nodded in response. Hearing this, Wani scratched his head and got a little worried. He thought about how Ryu had invested all his money in stocks last time and now he was trying to start a business. Wani was really concerned for Ryu, as what if his business failed and didn't work out? From a young age, Ryu wasn't good at studies, let alone running a small candy shop, but Wani decided to trust Ryu. Then Ryu turned his attention toward Wani and noticed that Wani was panicking and worrying. Seeing this, Ryu smiled a little and sighed. He wondered if Wani was getting worried, thinking he wouldn't do well in business or get too busy again. But seeing Wani like this, he realized how cute and adorable he could be at times like this. To ease Wani's worry, Ryu pointed his thumb towards him and replied with a confident smile that he would tell all the details about the business after he's done talking with the person he was going to meet. So Wani didn't have to worry too much and should just trust his big brother. 
This business idea, too, Ryu had seen in his dream, and the old man with a pig on his head had told him about it, so just like always, it would work out. Wani, hearing this, got a little embarrassed, and with a panicked voice replied that, of course, he trusted his big bro. Who else could he trust if not Ryu? It was just that the whole world was in chaos, so business seemed too risky, that's all. Ryu, while keeping his phone in his pocket while walking toward the door, replied that if Wani really trusted Ryu, then he should be a good kid and wait at home and not go out until Ryu returned home, because it's not safe outside the building due to some players turned criminals who gained powers and were committing heinous crimes in broad daylight. As Ryu was heading toward the door, Wani also followed him with a worried face and his arms crossed. He mentioned that he saw this in the news, that the whole world was in utter chaos. Players, after gaining powers, were starting to misuse them and committing crimes. The worst part was that some criminals in jail had also gained powers, and now they had broken out of jail, remaining openly in the city. The crime rate was soaring and outside was no longer safe. Ryu, with a serious face, replied that yes, as long as a human was of the right age, they would become a player and not all people would use their powers for good. That's why at any cost, Wani couldn't go outside. Wani listened to Ryu carefully and nodded in agreement. Then Ryu's facial expression became serious, thinking and explaining that every month the number of players would go down, but the remaining players would become even stronger than before. In the future, the crimes happening now would be child's play compared to what would happen in the future. In the future, players would dominate the world in such a way that not even the government would be able to do anything, and the players would start to enslave the non-players and do whatever they want. An era where players would be considered king, and no laws would be able to bind them. Ryu became even more serious, and explained that before the city turned into that lawless place, he had to become so strong that just his name would be enough to scare the shit out of each and every player so that they would think a hundred times before even taking a shit let alone committing crime. As Ryu came close to the exit door, he once again told Wani to be careful, and Wani said yes, he would. But he asked Ryu when Ryu was going to tell him what his class is. He was really curious. Ryu replied that it's a secret, and Wani pouted and sighed, insisting that Ryu tell him. He said he wouldn't let Ryu go until he found out. Ryu, hearing this while pinching Wani's cheek, scolded him. He said he would tell about his class and powers very soon, so Wani should stop whining and eat his lunch. He also told Wani to order something expensive and not the usual black bean soup noodle. Wani should eat something healthy and grow stronger. Wani, with his cheeks stretched wobbly, replied, Gua in, trying to say, got it. The scene shifted, and we see Ryu standing in front of a huge building. With a slight smile, Ryu said, I knew it. Heavenly Demon would call me to this hotel. It's advantageous to play on their home turf. As Ryu entered the hotel, he explained that the hotel was under the name of Osung Group, but the original owner was Heavenly Demon. It served as his personal hideout and secret base, a fact known only to Ryu. As Ryu approached the counter, he tried to appear like a naive newcomer, intending to make Heavenly Demon let his guard down in front of him. Finally, he reached the counter, wearing a nervous expression and looking around. He said he had a meeting scheduled there today, and he was told to check in at the counter upon arrival. He started to fumble with his word. The receptionist, wearing a warm smile, asked, Are you here to meet the CEO of Heavenly Demon Consultant? Ryu, still shaking and nervous, replied, Yes. The receptionist then guided Ryu to an empty room, instructing him to sit on the sofa and wait. She assured him that the CEO would arrive soon. Ryu, still fumbling and nervous, said, Okay. He then bowed his head with a warm smile and thanked the receptionist. Then Ryu continues with his Oscar-level acting, trying to look like a loser. He looks left and right, slowly sits on the sofa, trying to act like he is overwhelmed and nervous. Then, with a straight expression, he looks at the ceiling and exclaims, Whoa, the chandelier's so cool! Just then, a voice asks if he's Ryu Min. Yup, it was their bodyguard. Ryu, trying to act startled, hurriedly stands up, saying yes he is and greeting him. The bodyguard, upon seeing Ryu, gets a little confused and pauses for a moment, noticing how much of a loser Ryu appears to be. He realizes that Ryu is the exact guy whom he met a few months back when he came with his little brother to give rice cakes. On that day, he rudely shooed Ryu away. With a slightly shocked and confused face, the bodyguard asks Ryu if they have met before to confirm if he really is the same person. Ryu confirms and says yes. 
He thinks Ryu saw the bodyguard when he and his little brother were giving rice cakes to all the neighbors in the building. Then Ryu saw the bodyguard with the actress Ahrin. Realizing that Ryu is the person he showed away that day, the bodyguard first bows his head and then apologizes, saying he is really sorry for being rude that day. While bowing his head, he is really confused and a little frustrated, thinking that the kid in front of him doesn't even look like he is 20 years old. So how the hell did he invest 280 billion ones in the company and become a major shareholder? Then Ryu thought, as expected, the bodyguard is suspicious of him, which would be a natural reaction since someone in his 20s couldn't have that much money. So it's natural. Ryu continued his act, holding his neck and with a warm smile, his hand slightly lower, giving a submissive vibe. He politely replied that it's okay after all. The bodyguard acted that way because he didn't know Ryu. Ryu himself didn't know that the CEO of the Heavenly Demon was living just above his floor. The bodyguard, upon seeing Ryu, thought he was the Heavenly Demon and explained not to misunderstand as he is not the CEO. With a serious face, he introduced himself as Shang Chiu, the department head and the bodyguard of Arin. He mentioned that the CEO was busy in a meeting, which is why he came to greet and receive Ryu. The CEO would be coming in just a few minutes. The bodyguard asked Ryu to come and follow him inside to wait, and Ryu, still acting nervous, replied fumblingly, Okay. Then the bodyguard left the room, and Ryu sat on the chair. As soon as the bodyguard left the room, he instantly opened his phone and started messaging the heavenly demon, writing that he just met Ryu. But Ryu doesn't look like a person capable of investing that big of money. On top of this, Ryu is really a loser and naive, and he can't be someone smart. It's highly likely that someone else is above Ryu, giving Ryu instructions to do all this. The heavenly demon has to be careful. Ryu from behind was watching this from behind. Then Ryu, seeing this, smiled a little, thinking that he knew that the heavenly demon would be sending the bodyguard as a scout, as there is no way that someone as disciplined as the heavenly demon would be coming late because he is busy in another meeting. Just then, a walking sound distracted Ryu, and as Ryu turned back, it was none other than the heavenly demon himself. He, with a confident smile, said hello and introduced himself, saying he is Gyong, the CEO of Heavenly Demon Company. The bodyguard followed him from behind. Heavenly Demon, maintaining his polite smile, came close to Ryu and extended his hand for a warm handshake. Ryu also extended his hand and shook Heavenly Demon's hand, still acting nervous and fumblingly introducing himself, saying hello and his name is Ryu Min. Heavenly Demon told Ryu to have a seat, and Ryu said okay and sat down. Then Heavenly Demon instructed the bodyguard to sit. On the other hand, Ryu noticed that he was a major shareholder so he could join this meeting. But Heavenly Demon, even without asking for his permission, gave permission to the bodyguard to sit in this meeting. That means his acting like a naive and submissive individual work, and Heavenly Demon thinks that Ryu is a pushover. Then Heavenly Demon, with a warm and polite tone, gave a single command, and his servants started bringing dishes one by one. Heavenly Demon explained that they should eat breakfast before discussing business, as he had specially prepared delicious Korean food, hoping that it would suit Ryu's taste. On the table, there was hot pot, sushi, sashimi, grilled meat, pickled vegetables, and many other delicious dishes. Heavenly Demon, laughing, said that any food served at a high-end hotel-like place would be tasty anyway, even before Ryu could comment on the food. Ryu, playing his role as a naive and loser, took a bite and said the food was really delicious. Heavenly Demon replied that he was really glad Ryu liked the food. As they had their breakfast, Heavenly Demon, after observing Ryu for a while, concluded that the bodyguard was right. Ryu indeed seemed naive and like a loser, and he was too young to have invested 280 billion won alone. Someone was definitely behind Ryu, pulling the strings. Heavenly Demon's face turned a little serious, and he started to wonder who would be behind Ryu. Would it be his brother or his uncle? Whoever it was, he had to get to the bottom of this. Then, Heavenly Demon, with a polite tone and a smile, asked Ryu about his aid, wondering if Ryu would mind sharing it. Ryu, while taking a sip of water, replied that he turned 20 years old this year. Then, hearing this, Ryu just turned 20 years old this year. Heavenly Demon paused for a moment, trying to process what he just heard. He thought Ryu might be around 24, 26 years old. With a sweet face, still maintaining his polite tone and his warm smile, he replied that he himself is 29 years old. Seijay also is in his 20s, and he is really glad that he met Ryu today. Ryu replied that he is also happy to meet Heavenly Demon. Heavenly Demon, with a confident and dominant tone, asked Ryu if he doesn't mind telling how he had so much money at such a young age. Does Ryu perhaps come from a very rich family? 
Ryu, hearing this, thought Heavenly Demon is a straightforward person, as he directly came to the point without wasting any time. Then Ryu, maintaining his naive appearance while waving his hands, and with a big smile, hearing this, Heavenly Demon once again paused for a moment in confusion, and with a confused face, he asked Ryu, what does he mean by, until recently? Then Ryu asked Heavenly Demon if he perhaps heard how, in the news, Heavenly Demon was still confused. So Ryu then politely explained that he is talking about the news about the person who became a billionaire overnight by winning lottery tickets, first place numerous times. And because of this, the government banned the selling of lottery tickets. Hearing this, Heavenly Demon nodded and said he indeed heard about the news. Then Ryu, with a confident smile, said, Well, that person is sitting right in front of you as he is the one who won multiple lottery tickets until the government banned the selling of lottery tickets. Hearing this, both the heavenly demon and the bodyguard got bewildered. Their minds were blown with surprise, and they were in a state of shock. The heavenly demon asked Ryu if he was really the winner who shook the entire Korea, even the world. Ryu said yes, he is the exact same person. As the heavenly demon and Ryu were talking, the bodyguard was still too shocked to even say a word. Then, the heavenly demon, with a curious face, asked Ryu about the article in news that said Ryu won 60 billion from the lottery. He pointed out that the news mentioned Ryu wasn't rich and was a student a few months ago. He asked how Ryu got the rest of the money to invest. Ryu, while enjoying the delicious food, politely with a smile, explained that he invested the 60 billion won in Bitcoin. And then, when his investment matured, he multiplied his initial investment by six. Hearing this, the heavenly demon asked if Ryu was really telling the truth, and Ryu affirmed that he was. Now the heavenly demon was at a loss for words and commented on how amazing Ryu was. He asked how Ryu even thought of investing such a big amount of 60 billion into Bitcoin so fearlessly, as he himself would never have the courage to do that. Then, the bodyguard finally spoke and said to Ryu that he must have been really lucky that his investment grew, calling it beginner's luck. But Ryu immediately denied that luck played a role and emphasized that he made the decision to invest in Bitcoin, knowing that it would rise. The bodyguard mentioned an article where Ryu claimed to have seen the lottery numbers in his dreams and asked if Ryu also saw that Bitcoin would rise in his dream and invested accordingly. He suggested that if that's not luck, then what is? But before he could finish his sentence, Ryu interrupted him. His face was no longer that of a loser or naive person. It turned serious. While glaring at the bodyguard, he said, It's just a lie. I didn't see it in my dream. Hearing this, Heavenly Demon had a serious face as he asked if Ryu didn't see it in his dream. How he knew all the lottery numbers and knew Bitcoin would rise. Ryu paused for a moment, thinking that this is the only way to convince Heavenly Demon and get him on his side. Then Ryu, with a serious face and tone, said that it's his first time revealing this to anyone. Even his little brother doesn't know about it, but he has no other choice but to reveal it. As Ryu was telling all this, the bodyguard and Heavenly Demon were just listening with silent curiosity. Then, sitting like a king, holding both his hands with a mischievous smile, his whole body started to glow blue, and his eyes also started glowing blue. He explained that he has the skill Ruin of Future, and by using it he can see what will be happening in the future. Hearing this, the bodyguard and Heavenly Demon were stunned, with their mouths open. They didn't say anything for a few moments, trying to process what they had just heard, and Ryu just sat there, smiling. Now, Heavenly Demon and the bodyguard, after realizing what they just heard with their eyes wide, thought, how is this possible? What kind of explanation is this? Then Heavenly Demon, now a little panicked, asked Ryu, is Ryu being serious? Is Ryu telling the truth? Ryu still confidently explained, yes, I am telling the truth. Why would I lie about something this ridiculous? Heavenly Demon then asked, that means Ryu found out the winning lottery number using his skill, Future Sight. Ryu, now with a polite tone and warm body language extending his hand, explained, That is correct. The reason I invested the 60 billion lottery winnings in Bitcoin is because I knew the Bitcoin price would rise. I saw it using my future sight. Only a pig head would put all 60 billion on Bitcoin just because they saw it in a dream. Heavenly Demon had a doubtful face and curiously asked Ryu, if Ryu doesn't mind, can Ryu use his skill right now and tell what Heavenly Demon's future will be like? What will happen after a few hours, for example, so that the doubt can get cleared? He still found it hard to believe what Ryu was saying. Ryu, hearing this, thought that as he had the inner thought skill, he could easily tell what would happen after a few minutes or hours by reading Heavenly Demon's mind. However, he was not going to do it because if he did, things would get complicated. 
Heavenly Demon would be calling him all the time, asking for predictions, and it would create many more problems, so Ryu decided to go with Plan B. He had a disappointed and worried face as he explained. First, he said he was really sorry because at this moment, he couldn't use his ability, Future Sight, at will. During the entire day at random times, he gets visions of the future, and sometimes he sees visions in his dreams. So the thing that he saw, the lottery numbers in his dream, was not entirely a lie. There was some truth in it. He couldn't tell what would be happening just after a few hours. As Ryu was explaining this, Heavenly Demon, while taking a sip of water, thought that whatever Ryu was saying made sense. Just the skill to see the future is an overkill skill, and if one can watch what will happen in the future at will, they will be like a god. So it's natural that Ryu has a restriction like this. Just then, with a jolt of realization, a thought hit Heavenly Demon. He started a bit and then hurriedly asked Ryu if he invested his entire 280 billion in his company because Ryu saw in his vision that his company would grow in the future. Ryu replied, Correct. He invested because he was sure his money would grow rapidly in the future, as seen in multiple visions. Heavenly Demon's companies were giving the highest returns. Hearing this, Heavenly Demon curiously asked if Ryu could clearly tell what he saw in his vision, how much his company would grow. Ryu, with a serious face, raised his hand and explained that he had only seen the future of a few years, and in just half a year, Heavenly Demon's company would become a top 10 company in all of Korea and be listed in the index. As Ryu was telling this, Heavenly Demon started to smile happily, with a wide smile that made his whole face sparkle and shine in excitement. He thought about the possibility of his small company becoming a top 10 company in just a few years, how great it would be if that really happened. If this became a reality, not only would his father acknowledge his abilities, but he could also become the next chairman. Reality hit him, and all his excitement evaporated. His face became a little worried as he thought he couldn't believe he got happy thinking that whatever Ryu was saying would come true. There's no guarantee that this will happen in the future, and his company will become a top 10 company. As Heavenly Demon was lost in deep thought, Ryu broke the silence by saying, there is a little problem. In his vision, he saw Heavenly Demon on the top 10 company list, but that company was totally different from the current Heavenly Demon company. It meant they would have to make some changes inside the company. Hearing this, the bodyguard, while banging his hand on the table, started to scream and shout in anger, saying, this is extremely unreasonable. How can they change what the company is doing? At this rate, Ryu might even tell us to change the name of the company. Seeing the bodyguard so angry, Heavenly Demon tried to calm him down, saying to stop screaming and stay calm. But before Heavenly Demon could calm the bodyguard down, Ryu said that if one is changing the business and industry, it's obvious that you have to change the company name as well. Hearing this, the bodyguard was at a loss for words in anger. He didn't like Ryu from the start, and hearing all this nonsense made his anger explode, and he started screaming at Ryu saying he's a scammer. Now Ryu's patience was getting annoyed, seeing the bodyguard screaming at him. With a serious face and a deep tone, he said to the bodyguard, Do you think I came all the way here to make joke? Continuing with his serious face, he continued, saying to the bodyguard and Heavenly Demon, Heavenly Demon and the bodyguard are also players, and they know how huge of a disadvantage and risk it is to reveal your skill to others like this. Heavenly Demon and the bodyguard just listened to Ryu with a little tense atmosphere with worried expression. Ryu continued to explain that despite this, he took the risk and revealed his power to complete strangers, as one can easily take advantage after knowing someone can see the future. He emphasized that if this information gets leaked, Ryu could even get kidnapped, tortured, or experimented on because this skill is really an overkill skill. Ryu only took this risk because he really wanted the company to grow, and that's why he invested $280 billion in the company. If Heavenly Demon truly wanted his company to grow, he had to listen to what Ryu was telling him and make changes inside the company. The worried bodyguard asked Heavenly Demon if he really believed what this Ryu guy was saying, and once again, the bodyguard started to say bad things about Ryu. Heavenly Demon just listened in silence with a serious face, glaring at Ryu with deadly eyes. Then, seeing Heavenly Demon not believing Ryu, with a disappointed sigh, he said, it looks like Heavenly Demon and the Bodyguard don't believe that Ryu can see the future. The Bodyguard, with skeptical eyes, said, Yes, he doesn't believe Ryu. Ryu turned his gaze toward the Bodyguard and asked him a question, saying, Has the Bodyguard ever considered why Ryu moved to the same hotel as the Bodyguard? Does the Bodyguard think it's pure coincidence? Hearing this, the Bodyguard startled for a moment, and sweat started to come from his face. He paused for a moment, not knowing what to say. Just then, Heavenly Demon turned his gaze toward the Bodyguard 
and with a deadly look, he asked the bodyguard what Ryu was telling. Same building, same hotel. He commanded the bodyguard to explain what Ryu was talking about. The bodyguard, still panicked and with a nervous face, explained that two months ago, Mr. Ryu moved into the house just below the floor where Miss Ah Rin was living. Ryu intervened, saying that after getting his skill, Future Sight, just a few days later, Ryu moved into the house below Ah Rin's and asked them to think why. Hearing this, Heavenly Demon got a little worked up and raising his voice toward the bodyguard, he asked why the bodyguard was telling him this now. The bodyguard wouldn't say anything, and he started to fumble. As Ryu casually enjoyed his delicious breakfast, Heavenly Demon started to look at Ryu slightly differently and went into deep thinking mode. He began connecting all the dots, considering that if Ryu had known that his company would rise in the future, he might have moved into the same building where the bodyguard was living. Heavenly Demon thought that things might also be a pure coincidence, and just because Ryu moved into the same building as the bodyguard, it couldn't confirm that Ryu could indeed see the future. Ryu, with a mischievous smile, said, Then, seeing Heavenly Demon's skeptical face, it seemed like he still didn't believe that Ryu could see the future. Then, Ryu dropped yet another bomb of information, saying, I know one more thing. The hotel we are in right now, Heavenly Demon, is the owner of this place, right? And not only this, Heavenly Demon is the eldest son of the Osung Company, and he runs the company so that he could gain the acknowledgement of his father by growing his company. Am I correct? Hearing all this, the bodyguard's mental wires seemed to break. Furious, he stood up from his chair and started yelling at Ryu, demanding to know who was behind him and pulling the strings. He emphasized that only Heavenly Demon's father and close relatives knew this information, and it was a top-secret matter that no one else should be aware of. Once again, Heavenly Demon maintained his cool and calm tone, asking the bodyguard to calm down. The bodyguard then apologized to Heavenly Demon, saying he was really sorry, though he still wore an angry expression. Heavenly Demon sat there silently, still deep in thought. After a while, Heavenly Demon, with a serious expression and maintaining his cool tone, said, Ryu is correct, and all the information that Ryu told is correct, but it's still not enough to convince me that he can see the future. By seeing the future, Ryu could have obtained this information from those close relatives, and there's also an uncle of his who doesn't want Heavenly Demon to succeed, so he might be behind all of this. Yes, at this point, Heavenly Demon is suspecting that Ryu has been hired by someone to come into his company to hinder its growth. Changing the business industry and even the name of the company might have a negative impact, realistically speaking. As Heavenly Demon explained all of this, Ryu listened in silence. Heavenly Demon continued, it's not that I don't believe that there can't be a skill that can show the future. If someone saw his company's future, and by following some steps, their company could grow easily. Why would I say no to company growth? But there are too many enemies of Heavenly Demon, so it's very hard to believe what Ryu is saying. Then Heavenly Demon thanked Ryu for investing in his company, and said they should talk again in their next meeting, as he had to attend another meeting. With this, Heavenly Demon concluded that the meeting ends here. As he stood up from his chair, Heavenly Demon apologized to Ryu, saying he really is sorry for not believing Ryu's word, and they would meet soon. But before he could say anything further, Ryu stopped him. Heavenly Demon, with a startled expression, asked Ryu if there was something more that Ryu had to say. Ryu, now really annoyed, thought that there was only one way left to prove he could see the future. He turned his gaze toward Heavenly Demon and said he wasn't going to reveal this information because it was worth billions, but he had no choice but to say it to prove he wasn't some scam. He was going to share what would happen on the fourth floor. He had important intel on the fourth round. As soon as Heavenly Demon heard this, he was in shock and surprise. He once again sat in the chair and the bodyguard remained silent. Heavenly Demon, still in shock, asked Ryu if he was telling the truth. Ryu replied affirmatively. Just a few days before, he saw in his vision the tragedy that would happen on the fourth round. With a confident smile on his face, Ryu explained that this information should be enough to prove that he could indeed see the future. Heavenly Demon didn't share the intel with Ryu to gain the trust of Heavenly Demon. The scene then shifts and a few minutes have passed. The bodyguard was apologizing to Heavenly Demon, expressing his regret for his behavior during the meeting when he got angry and shouted. Heavenly Demon turned toward the bodyguard with a polite smile and tone, and said that it was fine, as he understood that the bodyguard did it because of Heavenly Demon, not because he wanted to. So, it was okay. Then the bodyguard, a little hesitantly, said to Heavenly Demon that he wanted to say something if Heavenly Demon didn't mind. Heavenly Demon said, feel free to tell anything you want to say. 
The bodyguard, looking a bit worried, said, To be honest, I'm still suspicious of that man, Ryu. Being able to see the future is too overkill. If he really has the skill, he can live his life like a king. So why on earth would he come and invest all his money in Heavenly Demon's company and help them? Heavenly Demon, with his hand on his chin sitting elegantly, said, Ryu said he wanted to grow along with his company, so if his goal is to earn money, it's justifiable. The bodyguard spoke once again, saying, Even though he has 280 billion won, that's an amount even 10 people can live their entire lives like kings, and the amount will not get finished. So why would he go to this extent of investing his money and getting into trouble by growing the company? Heavenly Demon said that amount must not be enough for him, so he invested to grow his money, as we all know how greedy humans are. The bodyguard, at this moment, was determined to prove Ryu wrong and said, even that, it's too risky to trust that Ryu. The bodyguard then replied, Why the hell are you so annoying? Fuck off. <laughs> Heavenly Demon replied that he totally agreed with what the bodyguard was saying. But if Ryu really can see the future, they have to do anything to get him on their team at all costs. While standing up from the chair, he explained to the naive bodyguard that thinking that if Ryu can really see the future, and if Ryu would give intel on every floor, it's just too much of a thing. Then, growing the company just by having Ryu with their company and their lives in future rounds will be more secure and safe. They could avoid future dangers. But the bodyguard, for God's sake, once again like a fucking tape recorder, asked, Heavenly Demon, but still they are not sure if he really can see the future. With a confident smile, Heavenly Demon replied, They will find out if Ryu was really telling the truth or not in time when they will enter round four. Meanwhile, we see Ryu walking on the street, his hand in his pocket looking like a prince. Ryu explained that after round four ends, Heavenly Demon and that annoying bodyguard will get convinced that he can indeed see the future. Then he can manipulate them, so his plan worked big time. Then, while looking at the hotel, Ryu says he didn't share extremely important information like side quests or any hidden and important information that will get them into top ranks. Then, we got a flashback where Ryu explains to Heavenly Demon that on round four, there will be no quest related to killing monsters. In fact, there will not be a single monster present. There will be a massacre among players, and Heavenly Demon and the bodyguard must not be negligent of their surrounding. Now, back to the present, as Ryu was walking, he thought to himself that that should have been enough to prove that he can indeed see the future. And after round four, they will start to treat Ryu differently. They will treat him with utmost respect and protect him because he can see the future, as no one would want an enemy who could see the future, right? Then Ryu took out his iPhone Ultra Pro Max Giga Chad edition and started to text someone, saying that it was finally time to meet her and start his second step of the plan. Then the scene shifts, and we see Juri walking on the street in a hurry, thinking she needs to hurry as at this rate she will be late. She was wearing a hot black mini skirt, a white shirt, and a brown coat. Juri was still a little panicked and nervous as she reached the zebra crossing, seeing the red traffic light. She started to pray for it to change to green as she really didn't want to be late. She began to wonder why Ryu had called her in such a hurry, lost in her daydreaming. Just then, a red limited edition Lamborghini swiftly came to a stop just on the zebra crossing, right beside her father's store. Seeing it, Juri muttered, what is wrong with this car? This car is blocking the storefront gate and what kind of careless person would... But before she could finish her sentence, the window of the Lamborghini slowly started to come down, revealing Ryu inside. With a warm smile, he waved and said hello to Juri, urging her to hurry up. Juri, seeing Ryu inside the Lamborghini, got a little startled and panicked, as just a moment ago she was about to say something bad about Ryu. As the traffic light turned green, Juri, still a little panicked, hurriedly ran toward Ryu's limited edition Lamborghini. She came close to the car's window, her face nervous and a little worried, and asked Ryu if this was his car. Ryu, maintaining his warm and polite tone with a confident smile, replied that yes, this was his car, and he was really sorry for parking it in front of her store. Ryu had parked the car there to pick her up. Now, at this point, Juri was taken aback and thought, can Ryu read his mind? She replied that it's okay and she doesn't mind, and with that, she entered the car. Afterward, Within seconds, the Lamborghini whooshed, instantly accelerating. Juri, on the other hand, still felt a little nervous watching the outside view from the car. She said with a nervous smile that this is her first time riding a car like this. Ryu, on the other hand, also said it's his first time riding a car like this. She knows that just a few months ago, he was just a poor loser, so they are the same, and she can be a little more comfortable and not be nervous. Then Juri, now a little more comfortable, turned toward Ryu and asked him how much a car like this costs. 
She always wanted to own a car like this, but, well, it's just an unachievable dream. Ryu casually replied, not much, just around 900 million won. Hearing the words, 900 million won, Juri was shocked and stammered, 9, 9, point nine zero zero million. Ryu was saying it's not much. Then she asked Ryu if he knows how many convenience stores she could open with 900 million won. If her family didn't eat anything for 30 years and only saved money, even after that, it would be nearly impossible to get so much money. Ryu, casually driving with concentration, replied that compared to the money he earned from the lottery, this much is not much for him, so it's okay. Juri, on the other hand, hearing this while enjoying the view, thought that he's right. Ryu is no longer that pathetic loser who used to get bullied. He is a changed man now, and on top of that, he is a rich guy with a whopping 60 billion won to his name. Now she feels like they live in different worlds, and Ryu is going further and further from her. Then suddenly, a thought came to Juri's mind, and she got a little shy and flustered. While holding her hair, she thought that the way they are on a ride together, all dressed up, it definitely feels like a date, and she is kind of feeling a little shy. Just then, Ryu silently said, Honestly, there is something that Ryu needs to confess to Juria. Hearing the word confess, it was enough to blow Juria's mind. Her whole face turned red, and her brain seemed to short circuit. Smoke started to overflow from her head like a volcano eruption. Now Juria's whole face was red. Her vision was becoming blurry, and she was all sweaty. With a trembling and shaky voice, she asked, What? See, see, confess. She is not ready for that yet. She needed to be mentally prepared for that. She muttered, and Ryu, seeing Juria like that, at this point, Ryu also heard what Juria was thinking because of his skill, inner thought skill. Ryu also became a little nervous, and he said, It is nothing weird to confess, and it's not what Juria was thinking, so not to misunderstand it. Juria instantly came back to her senses, saying, Misunderstood? What is Ryu talking about? She waved her hand and said, It was just that something went into her eyes, so she was acting that way. But deep inside, she was so embarrassed that she wanted to jump out of the car window or hide in a rat hole. After that, as the situation became a little more normal, Ryu said, He told Juria that an old man on a pig on his head came to his dream and told him about the lottery number, right? That's how Ryu won the lottery. Juria replied, That is correct. That's what Ryu told her. But then Ryu said, Actually, that's not true. And he admitted that he had lied. Hearing this, Juria was a bit taken aback and confused at first. Ryu continued to explain that in reality, he got the information about the winning lottery number from his skill. He explained that he has the skill of future sight. And because of that skill, Ryu occasionally gets visions of future events. That's how Ryu found out about the winning lottery number, but it's totally random. And Ryu can't see any specific future he wants to see. Sometimes, Ryu sees weird visions like the color of his neighbor's underwear or other strange things. Hearing this, Juri excitedly started clapping and congratulated Ryu, saying Ryu really got a cool skill. And just on top of that, Ryu's class is a totally unique class. Ryu, well, he may be the god of death, but he is indeed a virgin loser in front of a girl when he knows she likes him. So, with a sweet smile, he replied, it seems like it is, but his skill is not so great as it doesn't help him in battle, and his combat is really weak. Then Juri, feeling more comfortable in front of Ryu now, said, It's nothing like this. Ryu might get intel or vision of what might happen in future rounds, and by using that knowledge he can survive. Juri thanked Ryu for telling her the truth, and she was really happy that Ryu trusted her to reveal his secret. Just then, Juri, even more excited, said, Since Ryu told me about his secret, I also want to share some of my secrets. Ryu, hearing this, tried to say it's okay, but even before Ryu could say anything, Juri started talking about her secrets. She explained that during the first round, she got the skill Protection. Using her skill, she could either boost others' stats or boost her own stats. She explained that if there are five people within a 10-meter radius around her, she would be able to cast five layers of a barrier and boost herself, making her even stronger. So the more people around her, the stronger she become. Ryu just listened to all of this with a smile. Finally, after she was done explaining, Juri turned her gaze toward Ryu with a big smile and said that she feels really great to share her skill with someone she can trust. She's really happy. Ryu just laughed a little, not knowing what to say, as he already knew everything about her skill from his past life. Then Juri asked Ryu, but why did you suddenly tell me all about your skills and secrets? Ryu explained that keeping it a secret from a friend was bothering him, and he also felt like Juri wouldn't tell her about his skills. Hearing this, Juri, a little surprised, 
asked Ryu if there was something more he wanted to tell her. Ryu proceeded to explain everything that was going to happen in round four, confirming that Juri was right. He had indeed seen a vision of what would occur in round four. He shared all the details with Juri about round four. Hearing this, Juri was shocked and exclaimed in surprise, Is Ryu telling the truth? Is that what's going to happen in round four? Ryu, with a serious expression, confirmed that it was true and warned Juri to be alert at all times, as there was no telling what the other players might do in round four. Juri replied with determination, Okay, I will. Then Juri, looking outside the window with a warm smile on her face, relieved and very happy, began to think and thank Ryu silently in her mind. She felt truly grateful to Ryu for sharing everything about round four out of concern for her safety, so that she could survive round four without any serious injuries. Later, Juri, feeling a bit shy, slowly turned her head toward Ryu and took a thoughtful glance at him. She wondered whether Ryu might have some feelings for her, and if that was why he was worried about her. Or maybe Ryu was doing it simply because they were friends. Whatever the reason, Juri secretly hoped that one day Ryu would develop feelings for her. While she was lost in these thoughts, Ryu continued to drive the car, unintentionally overhearing everything Juri was thinking because of his skill in her thought. The scene shifts, and we see Ryu now sitting on his bed while holding his iPhone Ultra Max Giga Edition, looking at Juri's photo. Ryu was really in serious mode. He was also a little nervous, thinking he had no idea Juri had feelings for him. Now he realized that in his past life, whatever the situation was, Juri always helped him, and sometimes she even sacrificed herself to save Ryu. Now he realized why, because Juri always liked Ryu from the bottom of her heart. After that, Ryu closed his phone, placed it beside him on the bed, prepared his pillow and went to sleep. He thought he didn't have time to think about feelings and love now. He would when the right time came. For now he had to do everything to protect everyone he cared for. And for that, he had no luxury for something like love. Then, just like that, Time flew by and the day came March 31st. It was 11.55 p.m., just five minutes more before starting round four. Ryu, lying on his bed, was browsing the store, searching for equipment. He bought Shadow Gloves of Darkness, which were of epic grade. Its ability was that after wearing it, the glove would become transparent at night, and whatever weapon the wearer would be holding would become semi-transparent. It would also increase strength and agility by five points. Ryu, in deep thought, was now fully prepared, as this glove would play a great role in round four, and he was really excited for this round. As Ryu was in his deep thinking, there was a knock at the door. Ryu turned toward the door, and it was none other than our adorable Wani. He was a little scared and worried, and he asked Ryu if it was almost time. Then Wani came close to Ryu, saying if Ryu was fully prepared and would Ryu be able to complete this round. Ryu, on the other hand, to tease Wani, said Wani will find out once Ryu enters round four. Wani, still worried, said that when Ryu told him that his unique skill was to see the future, he was really happy, thinking that using this skill, Ryu would be able to clear all the floors without dying. But now that the time has come, he is really worried. Ryu said that seeing the future and acting according to it are totally different things. Hearing this, Wani got even more scared and panicked, saying Ryu has to come back alive at any cost. Ryu teasingly, told Wani not to say unlucky stuff like that, as it's a death flag right there. They continued to chat for a while, and now only a few seconds were left. Ryu slowly closed his eyes, thinking that this round is indeed tough, as it is called the death round. Then, as Ryu finally closed his eyes, we are shown that everyone arrived at round four. Youngman was standing in frustration, holding his head because the system once again notified him that, because of the penalties, all his stats were permanently decreased by 50%. Youngman, a little panicked, grinding his teeth, thought he can't believe this is the result of betraying the muscle head. On top of that, now he didn't even have his ten commands to use in round four. Still panicked, Youngman started looking left and right, trying to find if there was any person or his former friends hiding or planning to kill him to become the next zone leader. A son of his friend even warned him that he would kill Youngman in round four. But then, as Youngman looked around him and looked up, he got bewildered and surprised. The entire place was built with a material full of white. There were weird structures floating in the sky, but everything was white. Seeing this, Youngman got even more panicked, thinking, what the hell kind of quest will be taking place in this weird place? As far as he could see, there was nothing but whiteness, and all the white color around him made him feel like he was a lab rat, and someone was observing him from above. Just then, Youngman's attention turned toward Ryu, and seeing him, he got more frustrated, 
thinking all this is happening because of that bastard Black Scythe. That wicked devil knew what the penalty of breaking the crystal was, which is why he didn't break it himself but used him and his friends. On top of that, Black Scythe also single-handedly killed that divine punisher like it was nothing. Now glaring at Ryu like a hungry dog, Youngman thought, only if he would be powerful enough, he would beat the shit out of that fucker's face now. He was grinding his teeth and clutching his hands. He said to himself that he can't do anything, and it's really frustrating. He didn't have any other choice, but at least he wanted to save his life. And to do that, if he had to shake hands with the devil, he had to do it. Then, Youngman slowly walked toward Ryu, saying his name, and Ryu turned back and asked in a deep voice, what is it? Youngman, now with a polite and respectable tone, asked Ryu if their agreement from the last round still stands, as Ryu himself had said that he would guard Youngman's ass if he becomes Ryu's subordinate and does whatever Ryu says. So he did whatever Ryu told him to do in the last round. Ryu, hearing this, gave a slight laugh, saying that yes, he did remember saying that, but he didn't need a subordinate anymore. Youngman explained that he didn't even have the command skill anymore. So what's the point of keeping a zone leader without the command skill? It's like having a dog who doesn't bite, and he doesn't need a dog without its claws and teeth. Not to mention, most of the players now have gotten their classes, so even if Youngman did have his command skill, he still wouldn't need him, as the command skill doesn't work on players with class. Hearing this, Youngman was speechless, not knowing what to do. Ryu, with a warm and bright smile, said, You no longer hold any value, so you can go and fuck off. Hearing this, Youngman got devastated, his whole face turned pale, and fear was all over his face. He thought that now everyone would be targeting him to become the next zone leader, and while he's in this state, he can't do anything. It's karma for him. Hearing this, Youngman started to look left and right, searching the area for potential threats, but he found no one coming to kill him. Today's like goal is 6,700 likes. Please guys, many of you are not subscribed to the channel, so please like and subscribe to support the channel. Now let's continue. Then Ryu, with a smile on his face, said not to take too much stress, as Youngman is only at risk of getting targeted. It's not like everyone will come together to kill him right now. In reality, there are not many people targeting Youngman. Hearing this, Youngman worriedly asked Ryu to clarify what he meant by the players not targeting him in reality. Ryu politely explained that Youngman should know better than anyone else what happened to the previous zone leader. Well, he died, and zone leaders will always get targeted by other people. So not many people will risk becoming a zone leader just to get targeted by other players. The reward just isn't worth the risk. Hearing this, Youngman agreed with Black Scythe. He himself thought that even he would like to hand over the zone leader position to other people if he had the choice. So yeah, he's not in great risk now. As Youngman was in deep thought, from behind, the bodyguard and Aaron slowly walked toward them. They were wearing some fancy clothes, armor, and were equipped with high-quality weapons. Seeing them, Youngman got startled and a little worried, thinking, Why the hell are they coming toward us? Are they here to kill me or take revenge? But Aaron straight up ignored Youngman, and with a polite and warm smile, first greeted Ryu, asking how Ryu was doing. Ryu turned back toward Arine with a cold look, and then the bodyguard also politely said hello to Ryu. He asked Ryu if he remembered them, and Ryu replied that of course, he remembered them. Then he asked why they were here and if they wanted something from him. The bodyguard, while glaring at Youngman, maintained his polite tone and warm smile as he said it was nothing much. They just wanted to say thank you to Ryu once again, because he had saved them from a certain scumbag. Hearing this, Youngman got furious and asked who the scumbag was, ready to start a fight. However, Ryu stopped him with a single wave of his hand, like a loyal dog obeying its owner. Ryu, still with his cold killer look, told the bodyguard that they had already thanked him before, and thanking him once was enough. The bodyguard replied that they were just very, very grateful, so they were expressing their feelings. He thanked Ryu once again, mentioning that this thanks was from their CEO, Heavenly Demon, who was also very grateful to Ryu. As they were discussing, Youngman continued to glare at the bodyguard like an angry dog ready to bite. Then the bodyguard continued his talk, saying that since they were on the topic, but even before he could start his sentence, Ryu stopped him and turned back, saying he wasn't interested in whatever the bodyguard was about to say. Now that Ryu had accepted the thanks, they should also leave. Hearing this, Aaron got a little sad, and the next moment, with great concern and a little nervousness, she stopped Ryu while holding a low-level purple mana crystal. She said, please just listen to her for a moment. She wanted to give this stone to Ryu as a token of gratitude, 
and she would be very happy if Ryu accepted it. She insisted that he not reject it. Ryu, on the other hand, noticed the rare low-level purple crystal in Arin's hand and was a bit surprised. He didn't expect Arin to have her hands on something like this. Arin, still nervous and a little panicked, said to Ryu that she thought it would be better to give him something rather than just a plain thank you. After all, Ryu had saved her life from being ruined, so she was really really thankful to him. Ryu then extended his hand and gently picked the low-level purple mana crystal from Aaron's hand, expressing that he really liked the gift. In response, Ryu thanked Aaron as well. Now holding the purple crystal in his hand while studying it, Ryu thought that there was no reason for him to reject her gift when she was giving him such a valuable item for free. He decided that when he returned home, he would try to create a low-rank mana stone from it. On the other hand, Ahrin, still nervous and holding both of her hands, wondered if Ryu liked her gift. She started to get more nervous, thinking about what if Ryu got offended because the stone she gave him looked very ordinary. She worried that he might not talk to her in the future. Meanwhile, Ryu was using his skill of inner thought and could hear Ahrin's thoughts. He thought that Ahrin didn't know the true value of the purple crystal, and if she knew its worth, she probably wouldn't have given it to him. Youngman, observing all of this, thought to himself that he also had a similar stone. Ryu could hear Youngman's thoughts since he was within his 10-meter range. Youngman, while scratching his face, remembered that the stone was called something like a Black Diamond. As Ryu heard the name Black Diamond, he was shocked, wondering if Youngman really had the Black Diamond. If he did, Ryu would have to figure out a way to get his hands on it. Ryu explained that Black Diamond is a material item that has a very, very low chance of dropping upon killing a monster, an item that is ultra-hard to find, harder than mana stones, and getting one in round four is practically impossible. Then Ryu, while smiling a little, thought that Youngman got caught having such a precious item on him by Ryu. Ryu just doesn't know if he has good luck or bad. Then Aaron, still nervous and holding both of her hands, asked Ryu if he needed a protection barrier. If he needed one, she could cast it on Ryu, and it would greatly increase Ryu's defense. Ryu, upon hearing this, asked Ahren what this barrier was. Ahren explained that just in round three, she got a unique class, a summoner, and then her expression became a little excited and happy. While holding her chest, Ahren said that now she can summon little fairies, and those fairies can create a protection barrier and even do some minor healing magic. So if Ryu needed one, but... Boy oh boy, Ryu is really a Giga Chad, and will always remain single, virgin, and a loser. So he cut Aaron midway, and with a cold tone said he appreciated the offer, but no thanks, and he didn't think he needed the protection barrier. Hearing this, Aaron got a little sad and said, Okay, it's okay then. Then Aaron bowed her head, saying they should go now, and she hoped Ryu would do his best in this round as well. Ryu replied, saying he also wished Ahrin and the bodyguard good luck. With that, Ahren and the bodyguard left and started walking away from Ryu. Youngman also started to move away from Ryu, but Ryu's attention was toward Youngman. Before Youngman could leave, Ryu stopped him, which startled Youngman, and he turned back and asked, What? Ryu then, with a serious tone, said to Youngman that he will gonna regret leaving like this. Hearing this, a confused Youngman, while scratching his head, asked Ryu what does he want to say as he is unable to understand. Ryu further explained that he already told him before that Youngman is a walking target, didn't he? Youngman, on the other hand, replied that just a moment ago Ryu himself told him that there are not many people who are going to target him, and now Ryu is telling him he is a walking target. Ryu further explained that he said there are not many people who are targeting Youngman. It is not like there is zero people who are targeting him. Ryu, maintaining his serious tone while looking left and right, explained that most players got classes after hitting level 10, but there are definitely classless players too, so they will definitely target Youngman as soon as the round will begin. Hearing this, now Youngman got a little worried and startled, realizing what Ryu is saying. There is some truth in it. Ryu continued his explanation, saying there is at least a thousand people, and does Youngman think not a single one of them will target him? Then a worried Youngman, with concern, asked Ryu then what should he do then? Ryu, with a warm and mischievous smile, replied, Well, Ryu will help Youngman to avoid being targeted, so Youngman should not worry. Hearing this, Youngman got really happy and about to say thank you to Ryu, but Ryu stopped him midway saying, who told Youngman that Ryu would help Youngman for free? Ryu continued, saying, Youngman saw Aaron giving him a stone-like thing, right, for helping her. So does Youngman also have something like that? Only if Youngman gives something to Ryu, then only he can help Youngman. Hearing this, Youngman, with mixed emotions, a little happy and excited and a little nervous, 
immediately opened his inventory, saying he indeed has a stone like that. Then he took out the black diamond, saying, This is not exactly the same, but he also got this while killing monsters, so will this work? And Ryu immediately took the black diamond, and the system notified Ryu that he acquired a black diamond, a material for crafting. Ryu, after checking the description of the black diamond stone, first asked Youngman if he has any more items to give. Youngman, grabbing his chest, said panically that nope, he doesn't have any other items. That is all he has to give to Ryu. He only has some gears, though. Youngman was acting like Ryu asked him to show his naked body or something. Ryu then, maintaining his cold attitude, said not to worry, as Ryu will not take Youngman's gears even if he gave them for free. Youngman replied that now that he gave Ryu the item he wanted, will Ryu help him now? Ryu turned back and, while walking forward with confidence, said sure, he will keep his promise, so Youngman should stop worrying. Just then, a wicked smile echoed throughout the entire area, and yes, it was the damn hot angel. She appeared in the air, saying, You filthy monkeys, you have all gathered on time as usual, hmm? Then... With a mischievous smile while floating in the air and counting the players, she commented that there seemed to be fewer players than before, meaning some of them died in real life. Well, it's none of her business. Ryu, on the other hand, just glared at the angel's face, thinking about his secret future plans. After that, the angel, with her sweet, polite smile, raised her delicate finger and said that now that everyone seems to be here, she will be announcing the quest of round four. With a flicker of her hand, a quest window appeared in front of everyone. In the quest, it was simply written, kill each other for three hours. The total participants were 1042, and only 521 would survive, meaning only half of them would make it. Seeing this, a dense and chaotic environment covered the entire area. The players started to panic, and the angel, looking excited, said, look at these people panicking. She tried to clear the confusion while spreading her hand with a warm and gentle smile. She politely explained that this quest is really simple. All they have to do is kill the next person next to them and voila, they will pass the round. So simple, right? The players just listened to her in silence. Then the angel continued her explanation, saying that she had to explain further. This round is meant to reduce the number of players by having them kill each other. And unlike the last rounds, there will be no monsters at all. Now the reality hit all the players, and they were confused, panicked, scared. Out of all the players, a black-haired guy raised his hand and asked, that means half of us can survive this round, meaning everyone has to kill only one player, right? The angel, still maintaining her smiling face and raising her finger in front of her lips, said, that is a secret. If I tell you this info, where will be the fun? So they have to find this themselves. Ryu, on the other hand, stood still, glaring at the angel. He thought, wouldn't it be fun? Well, the angel was just trying to show. She was all high and mighty, and that was the thing he hated the most about these damn bitches. Well, these angels couldn't change the rules on their own. They had to follow the god who gave them orders. In this damn survival game, the angels were simply guides, and those damn perverted gods just watched the players killing each other, laughing, crying, and even having sex. Ryu would make sure to kill those damn bastards. As Ryu was deep in thought about how to kill the god, the angel continued to explain that there would also be a ranking system. How the ranking system would work was also a secret. Then, while raising her hand toward her mouth and with a mischievous smile, she said she was feeling a little generous today and would give a little hint. She said that just by killing someone quickly wouldn't make someone number one. After that, the angel flicked both of her hands and said that was it for the explanation. Now, kindly kill each other. With these parting words, the angel disappeared and the timer of three hours started. Now, everyone was just standing in their place like statues, thinking about what the hell to do, whom to kill, or how to defend themselves. How could they kill someone even though they had nothing against them? This round was totally crazy. Youngman, on the other hand, was just standing with his hands crossed, smiling and thinking that this round was really a fun one. He already had someone he wanted to kill, and this round was perfect for it. Killing that person and passing the round was like killing two birds with one arrow. As Youngman was lost in his daydream, Ryu, using his inner thoughts, found out that Youngman was planning to kill his previous friends, just like in his previous life. And in each and every life, Youngman turned out to be the king of trash. Then Youngman suddenly remembered something, and he started to laugh with a big, fat smile. Thinking just a moment ago, he gave Ryu some trash black stone, and in return, Ryu promised to protect him for this round. Youngman, grinding his teeth, started to curse his friends, 
saying he doesn't know where they are, but he will make sure to find them and kill them with his own hands. But before he could finish his thought, footsteps approaching from behind scared the living daylights out of Youngman. He turned back screaming, and upon seeing Ryu, he waved and said, Ah, you scared me. Ryu just glared at Youngman with a silent face. Youngman, a little confused, asked Ryu if he wanted to say anything to him or needed anything from him. Ryu, walking toward Youngman with a serious face, said he told Youngman that he would help Youngman from being targeted by other players, right? So he's here to do his job. As Ryu was walking, he summoned his Black Scythe, and slowly, the Black Scythe started to spread in Ryu's hand. Seeing this, Youngman was too shocked to say something, and suddenly, Ryu raised his Black Scythe backward, leaving Youngman utterly shocked. With a single swift slash, Ryu chopped Youngmin's head. Youngmin didn't even realize or feel any pain. It was so fast. The next moment, Youngman's head flew backward, blood splatter everywhere, and Ryu just stared at it with a cold look. Then, the system notified Ryu that he completed the hidden quest of round three, successfully eliminating the zone leader within the limited time. And for that, he got a low-rank mana stone token as a reward. Using this low-level mana stone token, one can get from one to five mana crystals. Now, Ryu, with a serious face, was thinking that he got the reward he wanted. He killed Youngman specifically to complete this hidden quest and get this reward. But this was not the only reason. As Ryu was in his deep thinking, players were shocked and in terror, shouting that a person is dead. They saw Black Scythe murder someone, and Black Scythe is a murderer. Ryu, on the other hand, maintaining his serious face, thought that not long ago, they were the ones who were targeting Youngman to kill him and get the zone leader position. Now they are acting all kind. Wow, what hypocrites. Meanwhile, the players continued to badmouth Ryu, saying Ryu can't just go around and start killing other people. Doesn't Ryu have even a slightest bit of humanity within him? Is Ryu a demon in a human body? They continued to shout, Ryu is a damn murderer! Ryu just stood there silently, watching them, and thought that they are in no position to tell him anything. He indeed killed Yong Min, so technically, he is a murderer. But he is not going to stop killing people. Then, with a serious face, he said he will be going to kill countless people until the last round. But he will never kill anyone without any reason, especially in this round where he has no choice but to kill for the sake of clearing this round, whether he likes it or not. So he doesn't care what others are thinking. On the other hand, the other players were in confusion. They had mixed feelings. Gangnam Style was thinking if this goes well, he could influence people to kill Black Scythe. Huddy Guy was thinking he had to use this chance to bring down the image of Black Scythe. And Stone Face Guy was thinking if they all attack Black Scythe together, even he would not be able to do anything. Sissy Guy was thinking they can't let Black Scythe become the zone leader, so they have to stop him somehow. Ryu, using his inner thought skill, was hearing what everyone was thinking, and he let out a slight laugh, saying they think they've got their hands on him. What a joke. On the other hand, the players, seeing Ryu smiling, got furious. With annoyed and angry reactions, they started to shout at Ryu while pointing their fingers, saying, Does Ryu think this is some kind of joke? Is Ryu a psychopath? He's laughing after killing a person like a cold-blooded murderer. Just then, a loud notification startled everyone. The system notified everyone that Black Scythe had become the new zone leader. Seeing this, everyone got nervous and panicked, thinking it wasn't good news. It was like giving a gun to a guy who was already too deadly. Now what should they do? Ryu, on the other hand, stood with a confident smile and his arms crossed tauntingly. He said to all of them, What's wrong? Why aren't you shouting anymore, huh? Or did you suddenly get scared now that I've become the zone leader? Then Ryu turned toward the sissy guy, continuing his taunting tone. He said, Oh, come on, if you're scared, that means you didn't get a class till now. That's the only reason a guy can be scared of me after I became the zone leader. Hearing this, the sissy guy got even more nervous. And with a shaky voice and fumbling words, he replied, What bullshit Ryu is sprouting. He already has a class and he's not scared at all. Just then, the stone-faced guy shouted from behind, saying everyone to look at the name tag of Black Scythe. The name tag of Ryu changed color. Seeing this, the already scared and panicked players got even more scared and nervous, thinking, why the hell did Ryu's name tag change? Did he get yet another powerful skill? 
Ryu realized his name tag must have changed from white to red. Well, this was because in rounds like this, players' nicknames turned red once they killed someone. The more one killed, the darker the color of the name tag would become. The change in the color of the nickname was meant to distinguish those who had murdered and those who had not. In his previous lives, people ended up choosing to kill players with red name tag, as killing a person who had already murdered someone was more comfortable for players than killing an innocent person but this is a very deadly cycle, as if one killed a red name tag player, their own name tag would become red, and they would become the next target. As a result, players ended up killing and slaughtering each other. Ryu, watching all the players, explained that they may be hesitating to kill each other right now, but this would be the reason for the death of many in just a few minutes. Then, with his cold and serious look, Ryu said to the players, What are you doing? If you want to kill me, come fast. I don't have the whole day here. And if you're not coming, I'll be coming toward you. Hearing this, once again, the hoodie guy and his nervous companion continued to say to Ryu to just stand there, addressing him as a murderer. Then Ryu, now a little annoyed, replied to all the revolting players that they were making him look like he was the only one who wanted to kill young men from the start, and they were the heroes trying to save young men. He mentioned, did they already forgot what kind of person young men? Did everyone had forgotten about the people who ran into the muscle head, the previous round's zone leader, where he was slaughtering players, and young men was one of them? He questioned where their kindness was at that point. Hearing this, they fell silent, not knowing what to say, and they started to back off a bit. Ryu spoke with a deep and serious voice, stating that it's a kill-or-be-killed world now, and they should have figured out the kind of world they were living in. He continued, telling them to stop their hypocrisy and face reality. Ryu emphasized that if someone is trying to kill him, there's no way he will let that person succeed. This is the new reality of their existence, and they must accept it. Then Ryu suggested that now was not the time to be idle. If they didn't want him to be the zone leader, they could either try to kill him, or they could all vote and decide on a new zone leader. He reminded them that this was not the time for such conflicts. They should focus on completing their quest, or they would die. With that, Ryu turned back and started moving forward, thinking that even if he didn't tell them all this, they would eventually start killing each other, but it would be too late by then. But if he didn't say this much, they would have continued to waste time. And if that happens, it is a possibility that almost 90% of people will die, just like in his previous lives. Even if he has to encourage people to kill each other, he will not hesitate to do it, as it is the only way to keep more people alive. Then Ryu, thinking this, slowly turned back, Seeing that people had already started to argue, this Indian-looking girl said she didn't think they should just be doing nothing like Black Scythe said. She questioned why they shouldn't do something. The black-shirted guy then asked, so what is she suggesting? Should they talk? Hearing this, she got annoyed and furious, shouting that he didn't have to be so sarcastic about it. She was just discussing what they should do. The black-shirted guy suggested a fair and square one-on-one -on -one showdown. The guy beside him remarked that they didn't have time for this and that it wasn't a game. Amidst their arguments about what to do and whom to kill, Arena and the bodyguard watched from afar. Arena, a little nervous, asked the bodyguard what he thought. Did they really have to kill someone like Black Scythe said? The bodyguard replied that of course they had to. If they didn't, they would get killed by that angel who cared about the lives of some strangers they didn't even know. The bodyguard continued his harsh lecture, and Arena listened with a panicked and nervous face. Then the bodyguard, while moving forward, turned toward Arena and said he completely agreed with what Black Scythe said. He told Arena to prepare herself mentally to kill someone because the experience of murder is not a pleasant one, and she had to brace herself. Arena, still extremely panicked, asked the bodyguard if the way he was saying it meant that he had killed someone before. The bodyguard casually replied, If I had, I'm just speculating here. After that, Arin asked the bodyguard, So who should they kill? The bodyguard replied, It will depend on the situation. If someone comes to kill them first, well, they will kill them. If they have to find someone who deserves to die, like young men. Meanwhile, panic and chaos were everywhere, and a group of players were arguing. They decided that they should first focus on killing criminals and murderers. Then this guy with a ponytail, looking a little scared, said, So that means they have to kill Black Scythe. Is that what they are suggesting? A cool-looking dude replied, all sweetness on his face, Black Scythe? Only an insane person would even try to get close to that beast. How can someone kill a guy who is level 30, almost three times more than them, and God knows how many skills he even has? Another guy jokingly said, I'm sure if all of them attack him together, they will definitely be able to kill Black Scythe. 
His friend put a finger on his lips and asked him to quiet down, saying, What if Black Scythe hears you? On the other hand, he was just standing with his arms crossed, observing and listening to everything. The player who noticed Ryu was listening to him all along got scared out of his wits. Now, once again, all the players started to argue. This kind-hearted guy, very angry, shouted, What the hell are all of them saying? Life is precious and they should not kill anyone, even if they are criminals and murderers, and become murderers themselves. This hoodie guy agreed, saying, Indeed, even if they kill a murderer, they will themselves become murderers and will end up getting targeted by others who are not murderers. Then, this short-haired guy asked, Then what should they do? Play Ludo until the time is over and wait for the angel to come so she can kill all of them, huh? This criminal-looking guy said to stop the argument and agree on only killing the criminals. Then, this green-haired girl tauntingly asked, And how are they even going to identify who is the criminal? Are they going to ask those who are criminals to raise their hands? Are they dumb? The other players started to laugh upon hearing this, and the criminal-looking guy, grinding his teeth, got really angry, saying, Who the hell is she to insult him? If she's so smart, how about she tells them about a good solution, you damn bitch? Hearing the criminal guy calling her a bitch, she got furious and started to curse the criminal guy, saying she should just kill him as he indeed looked like a criminal. And just like that, the two of them prepared their weapons, ready to kill each other. Ryu, on the other hand, was standing with his arms crossed in the same spot, looking like a college professor disappointed and shaking his head. He thought the entire thing was an utter disaster. Everyone kept talking about killing each other, but not a single one of them had the courage to even lay a finger on anyone. Then Ryu's face turned serious, and he said there was nothing to worry about, as he had already made the proper arrangements at the start, so they would have to fight no matter what. In just a moment, they would start killing each other. Just then, something unexpected happened. While trying to manage the whole mess and trying to discourage fighting among themselves, Ryu stopped midway as he saw something. Seeing this, he got bewildered and shocked, and he started to shout. Hearing him, everyone's attention turned toward him. In front of them, young Min was sitting, yawning, all healthy, without a single scratch on his body, fully alive. Everyone just watched young Min in utter silence. Ryu then explained that there was a hidden rule of this round that after 10 minutes of death, players would respawn with all their injuries healed, like nothing happened. Young Min, on the other hand, slowly stood up, confused about why people were staring at him. Then he realized they weren't just staring at him. It was like they had seen a zombie in front of them. After that, young Min turned back, and while looking at Ryu and scratching his head, thought he was really confused. He was definitely talking to Black Scythe a while ago, and after that, he didn't remember what happened. The next moment, he was just sitting on the ground. What the hell is going on? Meanwhile, the other players, after noticing that young Min was alive, started to shout in confusion, asking how the hell young Min was alive and how he had resurrected like a god. Then they realized, did young Min get respawned like in a game after dying? Then they started to come to the conclusion that if people who die in this round will get resurrected and come back to life, then it should be okay if they kill each other, right? After that realization, everyone took their weapons out, saying that if young men really came back to life, then so will others. So this will not be called murder, and they should start the quest. With this, they started walking toward a big melon lady who was really weak, with no class or any weapon, an easy target. She was really scared, saying everyone to calm down as they were not even sure if they would get resurrected like young men. This might only be a one-time thing, but even before she could finish her sentence, someone with great force slashed her back, giving her intense pain and blood splattered everywhere. So with this, the episode ends here. What do you think will happen next? Write in the comments with Part 17 Incher. Goodbye.